Section 1 of Irish Idols. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Carson. Irish Idols by Jane Barlow. Section 1. Preface. In Lysconnel, and other such places we have a saying that there are plenty of things besides turf to be found in a bog this little book attempts to record some of these things including i hope a proportion of that human nature which a certain humorist has declared to exist in considerable quantities among our species i hope too that the phases of it pictured here may have some special interest for american readers to whose shores the wild boglands of connaught send so many a forlorn voyager over oceans of say they will perhaps care to glance at his old home and learn the reasons why he leaves it which seem to lie very obviously on the surface and the reasons less immediately apparent why his neighbors bide behind it is indeed the fact of these emigrants that chiefly encourages me to believe that there may be room and a welcome across the atlantic for this one emigrant more jane barlow raheny county dublin may eighteen ninety three o land our lady how bounteous whose wealth-giving gladdeth man's heart. To some in sooth of thy children thou yieldest how rich a part, yet to other some in thine anger how barren and rugged thou art. Chapter 1. Lice Connell. There is a great deal of room all round and about Lice Connell. That is perhaps what strikes one most upon arriving in sight of its half-score cabins, though the impression may have been growing all along the seven Irish miles from Duffclane. They could not well be measured on a lonelier road through a wilder bogland. The broad level spreads away and away to the horizon, before and behind, and on either hand of you, very sombrely hued, yet less black avised than more frequented bogs for the turf has been cut only in a few insignificant patches so that its darkness lies hidden under an ancient coverlid sad coloured indeed but not sharply incongruous with sunshine heath rushes firs ling and the like have woven it thickly their various tints merging for the most part into one uniform brown with a few rusty streaks in it as if the weather-beaten fell of some huge primeval beast were stretched smoothly over the flat plain here and there however the monochrome will be broken a white gleam comes from a tract where the breeze is deftly unfurling the silky bog cotton turfs on a thousand elfin distaffs or a rich glow crimson and dusky purple dashed with gold betokens the profuse mingling of firs and heather blooms or a sunbeam glinting across some little grassy esker strikes out a strangely jewel-like flash of transparent green such as may be seen in young moss but these are very rare unusually rare in the bogland between Duffclane and Lysconnel. The picture you bring away with you on most days of the year is of this wide brown floor sweeping on to meet the distant skyline. Whenever your eyes follow it to the southward, you become aware of faint, finely limed shapes that haunt it, looming up on its borders, much less substantial apparently in fabric than so many spirals of blue turf smoke they are big bends the remotest of them numbered it may be among those twelve towering conomerasi peaks 
which in Saxon speech have dwindled into pins, any country body met on the way would point out which dim wrath is Ben Braun or Ben Neffen. But I hardly care to identify them. They seem to be looking in out of another world to remind us how far off it is. As for the road, it has determined that the wayfarer shall never lose his sense of the great solitudes through which it is leading him. In all its length it has scarcely half a dozen yards of any kind of fence, wall, bushes, or even the humblest ledge of bank. It runs quite flush with the bog on either side, sometimes edged by a narrow strip of the short fine sward, where if the district were inhabited, geese would waddle and graze, but there is nothing to shut out the limitless expanses of earth and sky. Travelling on it, a man may learn that a broad hat-brim is not an altogether despicable screen between his imagination and the insistence of an importunate infinity. One autumn season a hapless Neapolitan organ-grinder strayed somehow into these regions with his monkey clinging round his neck. It is a long time ago, but a generation afterwards people remembered the lost, scared look in the eyes of man and beast. They both fell ill and died in the town down beyond, as if, poor souls, they had not the heart to keep alive in the vast, murky, sunless world that had been revealed to them. And to this day you are pointed out the Frenchman's grave, for a foreigner here is always a Frenchman, in the churchyard beside the loch. The road, one of Scotch Nemo's making, is generally drawn straight enough, though now and again it swerves considerably to avoid a wet piece of bog, and straight or winding, its course may be traced for miles ahead, a streak across the landscape not strongly marked, except in very dry weather, where there is white dust on it, yet distinct as a crease in the palm of your hand. One peculiarity of such a road is that you never come upon anybody sitting close beside it, for since in damp climates people habitually avoid seating themselves on the unsophisticated surface of the earth, and since neither stone dyke nor hedgerow bank offers a handy perch, it follows that any one who happens to be keeping an eye on geese or goats, or setting down a heavy creel, or waiting for the loan of a lift, must find a resting place on some boulder or boss more or less off the beaten track. Hence the passerby is occasionally given the time of day or the top of the morning in a startling shout, which proceeds from some figure whose presence he had not surmised. As the bog, like a converse chameleon, often has the property of subduing superimposed objects on its own vague tints. This, however, makes little difference on the Lisconnel road, so few people pass along it. At the Dufclane end a donkey may now and then be met, carrying a tall pyramid of chocolate-brown turf sods, based on two pendant panniers, between which his large head bobs patiently, while beneath the load his slender, tottering legs take quick staccato steps, each scarcely the length of one of his own ears. Or an old woman comes by with a creel projecting quaintly under her dark blue cloak, or a girl saunters barefooted after a single file of gabbling geese, knitting a long grey stocking as she goes, and never seeming to lift her eyes from the twinkle of her needles. But after you have gone a short way, the chances are that you will meet nothing more civilized and conversable than wild birds and very large gnats until you come in sight of Lisconnel. Just before that the road starts abruptly as if it had suddenly taken fright at its own loneliness and dips down a steepish 
slope, but quickly pulls itself up, finding that escape is impossible. The hill, whose spur it has thus crossed, is very insignificant, only a knoll like Nacon, prolonged on the left hand as a low ridge, soon dwindling into a mere bank, and imperceptibly ceasing from the face of the resurgent bog. Yet it probably fixed the sight of Lisconnel, because it offered some protection from the full sweep of the west wind, and because its boulder-strewn slopes and a narrow strip at their foot have a covering of poor light soil in which potatoes can be set. Such advantages seldom recur within a radius of several miles. For when I spoke of the spaciousness of Lysconnel, I did not mean that there is much room in it for you or me, or anybody who must needs have a bit of land to live on. The craggy ridge is surmounted by a few weather-worn thorn bushes, and one ash tree so strongly warped to the eastward that a glance at it on the stillest day creates an impression of blasts blowing roughly. Also, after the manner of trees thus situated, it seems to draw down and diffuse the very spirit of the desolate surrounding solitudes. The cabins themselves look somehow as if they felt its spell and were huddling together for company. Three in a row on one side of the road, a couple fast by on the other, not exactly facing them because of a swampy patch, two more a few paces further on with Oddie Rafferty's and the Widow McGurk's, which stand a trifle back of the road, up the hill slopes, climbing down to join the group. That is all this connell, unless we count in the O'Driscoll's old dwelling, whose roof has long since top-dressed a neighbouring field, and whose walls are in some places peered over by the nettles. Cabin walls in Lisconnel are built of rough stones with no mortar, and not mud enough to preclude a great deal of unscientific ventilation which, maybe, has its advantages dearly paid for through many a shivering night. All its roofs are thatched, but none of them with straw, which is too scarce for such a use. Rushes serve instead, not quite satisfactorily, being neither so warm nor so durable, nor even so picturesque, for their pale grey-green looks crude and cold, and the weather only bleaches it into a more colourless drab, when straw would be mellowly golden and russet. A thick fringe of stones must hang along the eaves or roof, and rafters would part company the first time the wind got a fair under grip of the thatch. Stones, as any one can see, are superabundant in Lisconnel, but ropes are not so easily come by, and therefore a block is sometimes just dumped down on the roof. When that is done, the rainwater gathers round it, and the thatch begins to rot. The largest window in Lisconnel measures not less than nine inches square, and is glazed with a whole pane of real glass through which strangely distorted glimpses of the outer world may be had. But opaquer substitutes are not at all exceptional, and in every case the door practically shuts out the daylight, unless the wall chinks gape abnormally wide. These habitations have been, when possible, purposely built on pieces of ground where the rock lies bare in flat ledges or hidden by a mere film of soil. For the supply of by any means tillable land is so strictly limited that not a yard of it may be diverted from the accommodation of the crops, poor little things. Moreover, the living stock underfoot forms a convenient ready-made flooring, barring a slight unevenness here and there. In the Sheridan's cabin, for instance, a well-defined central elevation divides their room into a northern and a southern slope, and acts 
as a watershed during wet weather. The immediate surroundings of a Lisconnel cabin are not generally much more untidy than any other part of the bog, but this is perhaps due less to the neatness of its occupants than to the scantiness of their materials for making a litter. Similarly, if little waste as a rule goes on in Lisconnel, it may be not from thrift but of necessity. It is right to mention these facts, yet I hope it will appear that not all the virtues practised there are thus to be explained away. A turf stack looms darkly somewhere close by each door, and when newly saved, and therefore at its largest, looks like a solidified shadow of the little house. A big black pot sits so customarily over the threshold, pried into hopefully by disappointed fowls, that when it goes indoors the landscape seems unfinished. Against one end wall huddles a small stone shed which can be thatched promiscuously with a few armfuls of withered potato stalks if there are any creatures to keep in it oftenest it is empty the livestock of lisconnel never exceeds half a dozen goats as many pigs and a few chickens and in bad seasons these vanish as speedily as swallows after an october frost once the place owned a donkey but that came to grief as i may explain further on therefore the hopes and cares of the inhabitants centre mainly in the little grey diked fields which make a plaid pattern on the hillside and along a meagre belt beneath and this renders it the most regrettable that their most prolific and certain crop should be such an unremunerative one. Stones upon stones, scattered broadcast by some malignant hundred-handed and perennially working up through this thin soil, in mockery of ten-fingered attempts to collect and keep them under. Those loosely built boundary walls, which intersect so frequently that the bit of land looks as if a coarsely meshed net had been flung over it fail utterly to exhaust the supply in each diminutive field a great cairn of them is painfully piled up as big sometimes as the cabin to which it belongs and still the husbandman comes on them at every turn they trip him up as he stumps between his struggling potato drills and grin maliciously at him through the sparse stunted tangle of his storm-tossed oats everywhere he can read written large an answer to his demand for bread the people of lisconnel have it is true a few other minor resources by which to supplement deficiencies and tide over periods of stress rent days for example and blights and buryings when harvest begins some of the men tramp off with their sickles round their necks and get jobs in districts where farms are on a larger scale they do not go to any great distance for lack of means and enterprise and the women knit stockings of the harsh feeling dark yarn hanks of which are hung in festoons over the counter of coors shop in the town away beyond Duffclane. This might become the source of quite a handsome revenue, swelling to whole shillings a week, since a moderate knitter can finish a long stocking from knee to toe in a day, only that the demand for the article is sluggish, and Mr. Corr can give but small and intermittent orders. Och, no, Mrs. Quigley, I've no call for any such a thing these times at all sure i've a couple of pair of the last i took from you hangin up yet and by the same token it's much if them little silverines of moths haven't eaten them into thread lace on me again now at which hearing mrs quigley trails away with her old market basket and one new disappointment the more there is yet another method by which 
pennies are sometimes turned at Lisconnel, but it might seem hardly fair to mention that in a general review of the inhabitants' pursuits. Most of them take no more active part in it than that of not letting on, which is, after all, a neighborly attitude often expedient for us to adopt, whatever our position in society. So, by hook or by crook, Lisconnel holds together from year to year, with no particular prospect of changes, though it would be safe enough to prophesy that, should any occur, they will tend towards the falling in of derelict roofs and the growth of weeds round deserted hearthstones and crumbling walls. You may see the ground plan of more considerable places than Lisconnel sketched in this forlorn fashion on many a townland thereabouts. It would not be easy to judge from their aspect to-day how long it is since these cabins were newly built, for they look as if they might have grown up contemporaneously with the weather-fending Nakon itself, which is clearly impossible. As a matter of fact, seventy years ago none of them existed. However, soon after that they were run up rather hurriedly and tenanted by some people who, it is said, came thither reluctantly from a more southerly district, where there are now flourishing grass farms. Whatever their private views on the matter may have been, the destiny of these persons was evidently appropriate enough, for Lisconnel is poor and insignificant, and we are told that the gods ever bring like to like so the newcomers settled down where some of their descendants remain to this day indeed until within a few months since one of the original colonists was still living there a very old body much given to reminiscences of the home she had left so long ago that she should have remembered it well but hardly creditable were the statements she made about that countryside with its meadows where the grass stood higher than the tallest rushes out on the bog yonder, and its potato and barley fields you could scarce see from one end to the other of, they were that sizable. Where there were cows and calves and firkins of butter, let alone lations and lavens of skim milk and whey, and where a big potful of oatmeal stir about was set down for the breakfast every morning and as often as not there would be a bit of bacon frying for the dinner on a sunday she expected it to be believed that she had lived in a house containing three rooms one of them with a boarded floor and as corroborative evidence would point to a battered pewter pint mug which used to hang on a dresser in that apartment most of her hearers accepted this as perfectly conclusive testimony and i mind a little black hin i had of me own wit a top knot on her many's the handful of dirty oats i'd thrown the creature sure it's not to the hins we'd be throwing them childer these times if we had them whatever but now that she is gone these traditions will share the fate of all such legendary lore growing stranger and wilder and more obviously unhistorical with the lapse of time until they add just a tinge of wistfulness to conjectures about the receded past for cows be dad and a bit of cart drivin in to the market well to be sure but it's the queer old romancin she had out of her whereas Lisconnel stands here in the light of common day a hard fact, with no fantastic myths to embellish or disprove it. CHAPTER Two, A WINDFALL The widow McGurk has managed her own farm of more than half an acre ever since her husband's death, which took place one spring several years ago, just when he was about to get in his seed potatoes. They weighed very much on his mind during his last hours, for he gravely doubted the success of his wife's unsupervised operations, and how was she going to live at all if the crop failed on her? 
she tried to pacify him by assuring him that the ground was frozen as hard as bullets and all the men in connaught couldn't work a stroke if they were outside in the field but he was not deceived and would have got up if he had been able to stand on his feet Potatoes were all that day the burden of so much discourse as is possible to any one with double pneumonia, which his neighbors diagnosed as a queer wakeness on his chest. But about sunsetting, Father Rooney, summoned by Mad Bell, rode up on his old cream-colored pony, and he gave the sick man some consolation. Well, well, McGurk, he said, she'll have good neighbors to assist her anyway and she'll do grandly with the blessing of god and when i was coming along just now i think i noticed one of the boys getting across the dyke into your bit of field there with a grape over his shoulder like as if he was going to do a job for you mcgurk sought to verify this cheery news by looking through the span of window which was near his head but as it happened to be glazed with the lid of a tin biscuit canister he could not do so and had to take the statement on trust however he said glory be and thenceforward seemed easier like until the small hours next morning when he grew easier still mrs mcgurk's subsequent career though not exactly grand even for lisconnel has in a measure at least justified father rooney's prognostications the people have been ready enough to do good turns for a neighbor who takes high social rank as a lone widdy without chick or child belonging to her in this world the creature but her own peculiarities sometimes ran counter to their kind intentions she was not a native of that country side and had travelled to it along a path declining from better days most grievous for her to tread as she had the proud and independent spirit through which the steps of those coming down in the world are vexed with a thousand thorns after more than half a lifetime her heart still turned to the place where she had spent her long young years of comparative prosperity before her father got drinking she could not bring herself to accept the lower level as a permanent one or to abandon an absurdly palpable fiction according to which she was recognized as well-to-do and in want of nobody's help hence whenever she was known to be in straits the neighbors had to consider not only their own ways and means generally a puzzling question but also susceptibilities on the widow's part which often proved no less embarrassing and restrictive a little too much outspokenness a little over precipitancy in taking the hint which she was sometimes lullfully constrained to let fall would convert any attempted relief into grounds of dire offence it would not do for example to come bouncing in as judy ryan did one evening bringing a pail full of potatoes culled cautiously though in no grudging mood from a slender store if judy threw back a handful at the last moment it was not her will consented and saying oh sure mrs mcgurk i've heard you've run out of potatoes why it's starved you must be woman alive clever and clean here's an odd few i've brought you in the old bucket and they'd be more only we're getting shortish ourselves judy was immediately informed with a lamentable disregard of truth that mrs mcgurk had more potatoes than she could use in a month of sundays and was at the same time given to understand with an impolite absence of circumlocution that the sooner she removed herself and her old bucket the better it would be after which the pat ryans and the widow mcgurk were not on speaking terms for many a long day then on another occasion she gloomily dug her steep potato patch all over again from top to bottom and in consequence had her potatoes a good fortnight late 
whereby half of them rotted in a spell of very wet weather, which occurred before they were fit to lift, simply because Hugh Quigley had finished trenching the ground for them without consulting her, thinking that since she seemed whiles troubled with the rheumatics, for by not being altogether so supple as she was, she would deem it a pleasant surprise to find the task unbeknownst taken off her hands. Incidents such as these led Lisconnel to opine that the widow McGurk was as contrary as the two winds of a reaping hook, and their tendency was not unnaturally to diminish her friend's zeal upon her behalf. Yet she never so far alienated their sympathies, but that she found some of them ready to stand by her at a pinch, and, as they said, humour her the best way they could. Perhaps Mrs. Kilfoyle, the old woman who remembered impossible things, was most successful in this respect, which need not be wondered at, since people regarded her as a person who possessed more gifts than a turn for romancing. These were at times summed up in a statement that she had a way with her, the way which she commonly used in her delicate transactions with the widow McGurk was to borrow the loan from her of a jug or a mug. What she would want with one it would have been difficult to conjecture plausibly, for she had an assortment of them, much more numerous than any imaginable emergencies could demand, ranged upon her own smoke-blackened shelves. Such articles of coarse crockery would seem to be the one thing in which Lysconnel is sometimes superfluous. However, the fact is that Mrs. Kilfoyle ever and anon toiled up the rush-tussocked slope to Mrs. McGurk's abode on the hillside, which she certainly would not have done for nothing, being old, and though a light weight less nimble of foot than of wit, with no ostensible purpose other than to negotiate such a loan. It is true that on these occasions she was apt to be struck by a sudden thought just as she took leave. Well, I must be shaken off with oneself, Mrs. McGurk, and thank you kindly, ma'am. Sure it's troubling you I am too often. Not at all, not at all, from Mrs. McGurk, whose gaunt head rose two inches higher with the consciousness of conferring a favour. Don't think to mention it, Mrs. Kilfoyle. You're as welcome as the light of day to any sticks of these I've got. I suppose now, ma'am, you couldn't be taking a couple of stone of potatoes off of us. Ours to be keeping that badly we can't use them quick enough, and you could be paying us back when the new ones come in according as was convenient. If you would, I'd send one of the children up with them as soon as I get home. Sorry the trouble in it at all, and thank you kindly, Mrs. McGurk, and good evening to you, ma'am. Then, trotting down the hill, I'll bid the lads to be stirring themselves, never a bit the creatures, after getting this day. Or it might be good evening, Mrs. McGurk, and I'll be careful with your jug. I was thinking, by the way, you maybe wouldn't object to the lads leaving you up a few creels of turf. Now our stack's finished building just to keep them quite, for it's beyond themselves they get entirely, if they're not at some job. They do have their mother distracted with their devilments, the little spillines. I believe the widow was never known to take offence at any of these afterthoughts, though I am not sure that she did not now and then dimly surmise a stratagem, which she would have resented fiercely, had the contriver been anybody else than this little old woman with her white hair like carded bog cotton, and a sweet high piping voice like a small chicken's. But even the other neighbors sometimes managed things adroitly, for Lysconnel is not deficient in tact when it takes time to consider. Still that tug of war between pride and penury could not fail to produce harassing incidents, and the widow McGurk swallowed many an ungrudgingly bestowed morsel with bitter feelings of reluctance, which rather more or less magnanimity 
would have spared her. But one day she found herself elevated above these mortifications by a little wave of affluence which swelled up suddenly under her feet. It was a still November morning with a smooth leaden sky and wisps of paler mist hardly moving on the sombre face of the bog in the distance. Not a morning that seemed to promise anything out of the common, yet it brought a letter to the widow McGurk. A letter is almost as infrequent an occurrence in Lysconnel as a burglary in the village of average liveliness, and it usually gets there by circuitous and dilatory modes of conveyance for which the postal regulations are not responsible. But the contents of Mrs. McGurk's blue envelope were fully as astonishing as its appearance had been. They consisted of a money order accompanied by a document which explained that this was the share accruing to her from the divided estate of some unknown kinsman who had died possessed as was apparent of property in Connecticut, USA, and the muddy order was for the amount of fifteen shillings. Do not suppose that Mrs. McGurk ascertained these things at a glance, as we might read a paragraph in a newspaper. The deciphering of them proved a stiff task for a more knowledgeable person than herself, though, mind you, it was a queer piece of print would bother her, or handwriting either, if it was wrote anyways reasonable. Her first impression, in truth, was that she had received some ominous notice or warning about her rent, which would imply that she stood in imminent danger of being put out of it, an apprehension prone to haunt the mind of the dweller in Lysconnel, and winged with this murk-feathered fear, she sped down to consult her nearest neighbors, the Kilfoyles. So great was her hurry that Mrs. Brian Kilfoyle, rinsing a pot outside their door, remarked to her mother-in-law within, "'Here's the witty McGurk leapin' down the hill with an old spancelled goat. Be the power she was nearly on her head that time over a wisp of bent grass. It's much if she's not after scald in her hand with the kettle, for she seems to have got a bit of white rag on it. As neither of them could enlighten or reassure her, Brian was shouted for from his adjacent digging, and even he had to sit for a considerable time on the dyke with the paper spread down in front of him between two broad thumbs and with a little breeze blowing through his red beard before he solved the problem. A small crowd had assembled to hear the result and was properly impressed by the magnitude of the riches which had flowed into Lysconnel. People are generally loath to be in any way balked of a strong sensation, and so when Mrs. Sheridan said, after prolonged calculatory mutterings, fifteen shillings, sure that's something short of a pound, isn't it now? There was a disposition to resent the remark, albeit she really spoke with no wish to belittle, but merely from a habit of estimating things negatively. It's more than her half-year's rent, so it is anyhow, whatever it may be short of, said Pat Ryan sententiously. May the devil dance upon the rent, rejoined his brother Tim, and I'm wishing you good luck along with your distributed fortune, Mrs. McGurk. Public sentiment was on the whole with Tim. Of course, if this phenomenal influx of wealth had confined itself less exclusively to a single channel, satisfaction would have been livelier. Pennies jingling in your own pocket ring more silverly than shillings in that of your neighbor, and will do so until coins may bear the date of the millennium. Still, the widow's legacy was a popular measure in Lysconnel, and for the time being created among its inhabitants a strong feeling in favor of fortune's administration of affairs. Their motives, however, were not purely disinterested, because some of them, more especially the women and girls, would for several ensuing weeks retain an irrational conviction that the probabilities of such a letter coming to their own address had been materially heightened. 
only by degrees would these illogical persons cease to experience a faint twinge of disappointment when some casual pat or mick returning from the town appeared as might have been expected empty-handed it was so easy now to imagine some one again bawling along the road where's mrs so-and-so sure there's a letter for her they gave me down beyant there were a few exceptions to this prevalence of generous sympathy i fear that mrs quigley cannot be acquitted of an attempt to dull an envious pang by rubbing the edge off mrs mcgurk's joy when she said after a critical survey of the flimsy paper scrap in which it was at present enfolded well now i'd liefer had had money down straight or at all events one of them blue and white patron with the plain black figures i've heard tell there does be every manner of botheration sometimes afore you can get that sort ped if you ever get it at all mrs mcgurk's face fell as rapidly as a barometer in a hurricane but before it had time to lengthen more than an inch or so devil the botheration brian said herself below at the office will just sling the amount at you out of her little windy box same as if it was a pennyworth of brown sugar over the counter at cores they might be axin you to put your name to something but sure any old scrawn'll do and they'll settle it up themselves inside that's all the troubles in it och well they'll be takin something off of it for startin persisted mrs quigley reduced to a but paltry and meagre solace they're never for payin one the full amount of anything pennies they'll be takin off but brian said with confidence i question will they and at all events a penny or so but a trifle here or there it's yourself would be countin the spillins when they're all pourin you out a sup o drink so mrs quigley returned out of humour to her morning's occupation which happened to be minding a small baby patching an old red woollen petticoat with bits of an older blay calico shirt wishing that the rheumatiz hadn't got such a hold on her right elbow and wondering by what manner of means they could contrive to use only the full of the big pot of potatoes daily when every other potato was bad in the middle while mrs mcgurk her faith in her windfall not appreciably shaken resumed possession of her postal order now imprinted blackly with many unofficial stamps when the east Kalean hermes said that a prometheus would not be tolerable if he were prosperous he voiced a sentiment which most of us have felt at times though we may never have expressed it so frankly and which appears rather melancholy and rather grotesque if one considers it deeply enough not that this remark has any special application to the widow mcgurk whatever may have been the case with regard to the pioneer philanthropist two or three of her neighbors it is true did suspect her of seeming sot up like by her accession of wealth but this was merely their imagination she really was not unduly uplifted being indeed one of the people in whom a sudden shock of good luck awakens a keen and compunctious sense of their neighbors less happy circumstances when this half remorseful feeling is retrospective in its action linking itself with memories of those who can be no longer touched by any freak of fortune it serves as a very effectual safeguard against over elation and that is not at all an uncommon experience among the dwellers in places like lisconnel the widow mcgurk then bore her fifteen shillings meekly and even listened with patience to the conflicting advice which her neighbors liberally gave her on the urgent question of their investment four shillings must go body and bones to pay off a long-standing account at cores that was one fixed point but with respect to laying out the remainder of the sum there were as many minds as there were women in lisconnel and rather more on the whole she seemed more inclined to adopt the suggestion offered by old mrs kilfoyle 
"'If I was in your coat, Mrs. McGurk,' she said, "'I've a great notion I'd be getting myself three or four stone, "'or maybe half a barrel of meal. "'Oatmeal, I mean, ma'am, not the yellow engine trash "'that's fitter for pigs than human creatures. "'God forgive me for saying so. "'That it come expensive on you, ma'am, I know, "'but then twould put you over the worst of the winter grand. "'Sure there's nothing more delightful of a perishing night than a sup of oatmeal gruel with a taste of sour milk through it, nothing so elegant, unless it might be a hot cup of tea. Nobody believed Peter Sheridan when he alleged that if the money were his, he'd just slip it away somewhere safe, and have it ready to hand towards the Lady Day rent. Such unnatural prudence could be supposed in no one when actually brought to the test. It was easy talkin and he himself never before the world wid a threepenny bit be that as it may mrs mcgurk had long before sunset planned a shopping expedition to the town for the very next day and it was arranged that the widow doyne's stacy should accompany her and help her with her load which people understood would consist mainly of heavy meal bag an early start was necessary, for daylight had shrunk nearly to its shortest measure, and the town lies a good step beyond even far off Duff Plain, which scarcely surpassing Lisconnel in size, and making no better attempt at a shop than a cabin with two loaves filling one window and half a dozen shriveled oranges and a glass of sugar sticks enriching the other, gives little scope for the operations of the capitalist. If you live at Lisconnel, it is convenient to understand that down below means Duffclain, and down beyant Ballybrosna, preeminently the town. There were still thin, fiery lines quivering low down on the rim of the ashen grey eastern sky, and to the westward the shadow of a great dark wing still seemed to brood over the bog when Mrs. McGurk, wearing a hooded cloak borrowed from Mrs. Sheridan and bearing a battered osier basket with a cord handle loaned by Big Ann, stood ready equipped for her journey. Before she could start, however, she had to make a round of calls upon her acquaintances to inquire whether she could do ever a thing for them down beyant. This is a long-established social observance, which to omit would have been a grave breach of etiquette. Yet, like other social observances, it sometimes became rather trying. On the present occasion, one might almost have fancied a touch of irony in the polite question. There were so many things she could have done for them if, but there was much virtue in that if, more just than than usual for the harvest had been indifferent and an early spell of cold weather had brought keenly home to the inhabitants of lisconnel the fact that they stood upon the verge of the long winter and the people were afraid of it in the face of those white starving days and black perishing nights they durst not break into their queer little hordes of pence corners of the handkerchiefs or high-hung jugs, or even chinks in the wall, any more than they would have opened their door with an unmetaphorical wolf howling expectantly somewhere fast by. So the widow McGurk received only few and trivial commissions, a pennyworth of housewife thread, a couple of farthing match-boxes, and the like. Mrs. Quigley was on the point of bespeaking half a stone of meal, but drew back at the last moment and resolved to do with potatoes, though her husband, who had begun to scent stir about for breakfast, looked cast down as he tramped off with his grip. And Mrs. Pat Ryan knew that her children were expecting a penny among them to send for sugar sticks, so she told them angrily to quit out of that from under her feet and be minding the goat for at such times the heart of the head of affairs has to be hardened and the process often incidentally gives a rough edge to the temper the last p 
people mrs mcgurk called upon were the mick ryans old mick who had long been past his work and indeed past himself entirely as his neighbours put it was seated on the dyke near the door waiting till they were a bit redded up inside and thinking vaguely that the wind felt cold his smoke-dried furrowed face had hardly more expression in it than the little potato patch that sloped up behind him but all at once a gleam came into his eye and he said very alertly and is it to the town you're goin ma'am ah well now father what did you be after at all said mrs mick his daughter-in-law uneasily for old ryan was fumbling in his pockets where in bygone days there used sometimes to be pennies but where there never were any now to backy he said after a pause and fumbled on whither now goodness grant me patience what talk have you about to backy these times man alive said mrs mick with slightly threadbare good humour where'd you be gettin a notion of tobacco sure mrs mcgurk here signalling with a gutta percha grimace to her visitor for corroboration won't be settin foot within miles of a tobacco shop she's just goin after a bag of mail and himself might be gettin you a bit comin on the new year didn't he bring you a grand twist only last lady day the old man partly discouraged by the fruitlessness of his researches in his pocket and partly by the haziness of the prospect held out to him seemed to let the idea drop and his face became nearly as vacant a track as before with perhaps a shadow on the furrows and his unmarried daughter who had been groping in her pocket but had found nothing to the purpose there said under her breath the creature two words which in lisconnel so often sum up one's judgment upon a neighbor's character and condition the widow mcgurk and stacy doyne could not be expected home much before dark and nobody began to look out for them until quite one o'clock the ridge of the knockhorn behind the widow's cabin commands an ample stretch of the road in both directions and from that point of vantage there is generally some one on the lookout most likely for a mere pastime the watchers there have been sorely in earnest but the probable proceedings of the two travellers the various stages of their journey and all the circumstances connected therewith furnished unusually abundant material for discussion about the doors and beneath the thatch of lisconnel all through this quiet november day not otherwise rich in incident as nothing more noteworthy occurred than a slight difference of opinion between mrs quigley and judy ryan respecting some hens and an acute yet transitory excitement roused when mrs sheridan's two-year-old joe was almost swept over the black edge of a bog hole by the trailing tether rope of an unruly goat neighbors meeting were at no loss for a remark when they could say they'll be better than half ways there by now or i wonder what a coral be chargin her the stone for the meal or i'm after axin her to try was there a chance of anybody wantin me couple of specaletti pullets they've given over layin on me and i've scarce a bit of feedin for them up here at all when they smell our potatoes boiled they're in after them like eagles fit to swallow them out of the pot as time wore on these speculations began to take a gloomy tone for mrs mcgurk was much later returning than had been anticipated which naturally suggested some mishap they might have lost the money order that was the favourite hypothesis or maybe the people at the post office mrs quigley reverted but now without malign intent to her original theory would have nothing to say to it good or bad about five o'clock when it was quite dark a gossoon at the mick ryan's supposed with a grin that they might ha met something queer comin from clayson's boreen whereupon mrs mick sitting in the dusky background might have been seen to bless herself hurriedly while sally sheridan 
who stood near the open door edged several steps further into the room for the place mentioned is an ill-reputed bit of road and the next time the rising wind came round the hill with a hoot and a keen all the women started and said och the laws bless us what was that at last just as mrs doyne was pointing out how easily one of them might have happened to put her foot in a hole in the dark and break the leg of her the same way that o'hanlon's son did a twelfth month since bringing back a heifer from the fair and he lying out on the roadside all night and the beast traipsed off home with herself as contented as you please hailing shouts which softened into a gabbling hum at a closer range put an end to all such surmises mrs mcgurk's shopping had been done on liberal lines to judge by the bulging of the basket which she set down on the first sufficiently flat-topped dyke of lisconnel while she took a temporary rest and her friends skimmed the cream of the day's adventures the ill-fitting lid covered an interesting miscellany which the uncertain moonlight made it difficult to inspect and price satisfactorily in lisconnel no newly imported article can be contemplated with equanimity until everybody who is qualified to form an opinion has guessed how much it cost the first parcel that came out was the cause of the expedition's late return having been accidentally laid down on a counter and only remembered when mrs mcgurk and her companion were a long mile and a half on their homeward way but the widow felt that she would have tramped back wearily twice as far rather than have left it behind when biddy old mick ryan's daughter whispered to her sure he was lookin out for somethin in a manner the whole day i knew by the face of him whenever they would be afoot goin past the door though what got such an idea into his head bangs me this livin minute the creature has a couple of matches slipped under the sleeve of his old coat that he axed the loan of from larry sheridan this mornin be like he arra now look at the size of the lump that is interposed his daughter-in-law i'm real ashamed bedad he'd no call to be talkin of such things faith ma'am twill ha stood you in wish then wished you to con protested mrs mcgurk and don't go for to be puttin him out o consait wid his little bit of enjoyment size or no size meanwhile old mick sat with the expression of one wrapped away in a soothing reverie and slowly fingered his dark twist of tobacco lingering gloatingly over the moist newly cut end when biddy offered to fetch him down his little black pipe he said no begob i'll just be keepin the feel of it in me hand for this night which he did there were other delights in the basket a bundle of portly brown and white sugar sticks made some full-grown people secretly wish that they were children too and left the children themselves for the time being without an unsatisfied wish in the peppermint scented world it was on this occasion that a reconciliation between mrs mcgurk and judy ryan who it may be remembered had offensively obtruded an offering of potatoes was cemented durably to draw omens from intense adhesiveness by the number and length of the sticks bestowed upon the youthful pat ryan's then there was a large blue bottle with a red and yellow label which contained a liniment warranted to cure the very worst of rheumatics this was to be divided between mrs quigley and peter sheridan sufferers of many twinges who would now command at any rate the not despised consolation diffused by strong odours of turpentine and camphorated oil the only pity was that such powerful smelling stuff should be marked poison so very plainly as to scare any one from trying it innards and in one parcel was a coarse warm woollen shirt for stacy instead of the thin rag which she had shivered along many a mile that day 
while another swelled with the knitting yarn that peg sheridan who was lame-footed and lost without a bit of work in her hand had been fretting for time out of mind but the purchases whence mrs mcgurk herself derived the keenest pleasure were the two dark purple papered packets which she left at the kilfoyle's cabin on her way up to her own no meagre funnel-shaped wisps screwed up to receive skimpy ounces and quarters but capacious bags that would stand squarely on end when filled and quartered and that you would not err in describing as one pound of two and tuppenny tea and four of tuppenny halfpenny soft sugar this was of course magnificent still one might have thought that old mrs kilfoyle's recollections of earlier days remote though they were would have prevented her from being so taken aback as to sit with the packages in her lap remarking nothing more appropriate than musha than well to goodness sure woman dear och now begorra why what at all treble noted incoherencies which were borne down by the gruffer tones of mrs mcgurk who at the same time was saying over earnestly for a mere conventional disclaimer ah now mrs kilfoyle honey don't let there be a word out of your head sure it was just to gratify meself i done it and i'm real annoyed divil a lie i'm tellin you it's downright annoyed i do be to see the little teapot sittin cocked up there on the shelf and niver a drop to go in it for you this great while back ay that's so said mrs brian nary a grain o tea she's had since poor thady went that would bring in her an odd quarter pound when he was after gettin a job o work anywheres but these times what with this thing and the other however it's a grand tease she'll be taken now entirely continued mrs brian who was inwardly calling herself a big stupid gomoc for alluding to thady and the goats milkin finely yet a while so as there'll be a sup of milk for her you'll be havin great tea drinkins now mother won't you wid what all mrs mcgurk's after bringin you end of section one Section two of Irish Idols. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two. But the peace of heaven be his soul's rest, Mrs. Kilfoyle said, as if to herself, with an irrelevancy which showed that her daughter-in-law had failed to turn back the current of her thoughts. I'm sure it was uncommon friendly of you, ma'am, Mrs. Bryan said to Mrs. McGurk with a semi-reproachful emphasis which was addressed to someone else indeed that it was the little old woman responded remembering her manners which she very seldom forgot and hastening back from who knows where there's nothing i fancy like me cup of tay and you to be thinking of that why i'll get nora here to wet us a drop this mortal instant but mrs mcgurk why musha mrs mcgurk an exciting possibility had just occurred to one of the neighbors who were seeing her home what's gone wid your bag of meal all this while where have you it at all glory be to goodness woman alive it's not after lavin it behind you anywhere as you are set it down out of her hand belike or stacy it was maybe it's twenty-seven chances if ever she sees a sight or light of it again well 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 begorra to think of that happenin the crature meal is it said the widow with calm sure was it breaking me own back of the girls i'd be carrying a load of meal that far i could get one of the lads to bring me up a stone handy the next time he's down beyant that's to say if i'd make me mind up to be spendin money on it at all mrs mcgurk hastened to add being well aware that thruppence farthing was at present the amount of her capital i've no great opinion of mash meself it's a brash 
a good hot potato's a deal tastier any day when mrs mcgurk finally completed her unpacking in the seclusion of her own cabin it appeared that she had brought nothing home with her except a pennyworth of salt the small brown paper bag did not present an imposing appearance set solitary on the bare deal table and she stood looking at it with a somewhat regretful expression for a few moments she was saying to herself if they'd axed an anyways reasonable price for them red woolly wads she meant knitted comforters hanging up at cores i might a got one for mrs sheridan's joe it's starved with the cold the imp of a creature does be and she's hard set to keep a stitch to its back but seven pence halfpenny beyond me altogether however perfect satisfaction is unattainable and few women have felt more contented on the whole with the result of a day's shopping than did mrs mcgurk as she tumbled into the rushes and rags of her curiously constructed lair where she began to dream of tobacco and yarn and alluring baker's windows in the middle of her first strangely worded hail mary chapter three one too many it may have been partly the widow mcgurk's american windfall that turned people's thoughts thitherward by making them realize vividly the advantages of receiving remittances from abroad at any rate it is certain that throughout the following winter the idea of emigration to the states was unwontedly in the air at lisconnel not that it throve or spread there to any considerable extent this cabin cluster being one of those forlorn makeshift casual-looking little settlements wherein the inhabitant seems always to strike a terribly deep and tenacious root primarily it may be from a self-preserving instinct for his shaggy roof and stony scrap of potato plot form his stronghold his first and last outpost against the ever beleaguering wilderness and solitary places and he clings to them with a desperation hardly conceivable by people who interpose more elaborate barriers between their lives and the sheer brute forces of nature outside that screed of rough shelter he knows what ills forthwith await him what stepmotherliness of barren earth what pitilessness of capricious skies but there is nothing in his experience to apprise him of any counterbalancing good all his auguries drawn from thence are of privation solitude silence or uncomforting strange faces and voices homelessness hunger these things promise to be his portion when once he passes beyond the reach of his fragrant blue turf smoke and his big black pot and from such like evils the old place at home has hitherto shielded him more or less effectually but furthermore it provides him with a daily ration of business and desire a clue to guide his wanderings through the mazes of a destiny that at best seems to him sufficiently perplexing and inscrutable for he has as a rule too much imagination and too little of more material things to keep his mind clear of fateful riddles therefore he puts habit and familiarity in the stead of understanding and thinks he sees some sense and reason in his own townland and neighbours because he has all his life been used to the look of them and to their ways but the very aspect of a strange place makes him feel as lost and helpless as a leaf blown from its bough and herein his plight has some resemblance thus do extremes meet to that of the great german philosopher whose working powers were gravely imperiled by the threatening felling of a tree which had stood in sight of his study window his bitter land then is dear to the dweller in lisconnel not mainly as a bit of land but rather as the fragment of a solid tangible fact 
contact with which keeps his whole existence from becoming the sport of meaningless mysteries in somewhat the same fashion that we have seen one of his superfluous boulders keep the wind from whirling his thatch dispersedly about the bog nor is this a stone picked up and flung on at random it is bound down securely with strong ties of memories and associations twined through long years and to be broken by no storm gusts of circumstance a meagre field fleck and a ramshackle shanty on the hill's wan grey slope or the lip of the black oozing morass is scarcely an ideal earthly paradise yet it may be at least the site of the only one that can appear possible for him there are invisible fixtures in his cavernous interior cabin which a law not included probably in the code enforced by landlords and sub-sheriffs forbids him to remove this inconvenient non-transferability of affections would prove an obstacle in the way of compensation for disturbance or any similar grievance which a relenting fate might seek to redress should a sequence of calamity such as job's overtake him sweeping away his flocks and herds and children no eventual doubling of his livestock could console him as it did the more philosophic sheik his last days would still be made darker than his first by many a regret for the old white heifer or the little red cow or the bit of skibald pony the creature and as for the ten new sons and daughters molly and biddy and katy they would be a failure indeed persons with this turn of mind are obviously not likely to favor any emigration project and as i have said the idea never became popular in lisconnel where to be sure its merits were seldom considered at all dispassionately to the older people emigration simply seemed much the same thing as death with the aggravating circumstance that it chiefly menaced the children and the boys they discussed it in the same tone that they would have adopted in talking about the outbreak of some dangerous epidemic even the young men and lads who did not now and then glance at the possibility to summarily dismiss it kept their meditations for the most part to themselves it was too tragical a subject to be utilized upon trivial occasions of discontent or ruffled vanity as their brethren sometimes recall disaffected mothers and sisters to their allegiance by dark hints dropped about the feasibility of enlisting in only one household at lisconnel was the idea entertained at this time with any degree of approbation and even there from what may be called a vicarious point of view i refer to the sheridans who live in the cabin nearest the kilfoyles and mick ryans they were in those days a large straggling family ranging from andy who was one and twenty and stood six foot three in his stockings when he wore any to a half-brother who had but lately begun to crawl away when set down on the ground which newly acquired habit disarranged the calculations of any person responsible for the whereabouts of his tattered red flannel frock for peter sheridan had married twice and his first wife's family of four were now supplemented by a flock of seven or eight second marriages were not well thought of in lisconnel and peter a gloomy tempered man who had few social gifts did not raise himself in the public esteem by taking up with matty dugan the neighbors were of the opinion that poor molly mahoney's children would be apt to find the differ but matty did not turn out a typical stepmother in fact she was rather good to her youngest stepdaughter peg who was lame and she was decidedly proud of the well-grown andy while she never displayed an unfriendly spirit to order the other two sally and larry if she helped in getting up the domestic agitation of which i am going to speak she took no more active part in it 
than did Larry's own kith and kin. And it may be said for all of them that circumstances were urgent and coercive. It was a hard winter for everybody, but especially for the Sheridans, who have the name of being an unlucky family. This time their potatoes were much worse than most other people's. It was quite impossible to imagine that their stock could hold out till July, and as they had also lost a fat pig and had a clutch of eggs addled in an August thunderstorm, it seemed hard to say how they should come by yellow meal wherewith to fill up the hiatus. Himself, that is, Peter, the head of the household, had during the last two or three years been growing more and more crippled with rheumatism, and was now quite past his work, which diminished the amount of harvest earnings, and increased an embarrassing deficit on rent days. So that altogether the state of affairs was one that makes long families feel keenly how numerous they are at meal times, and from this sense there is a natural transition to reflections upon the desirability of larger supplies or a smaller party. The evident impracticability of the former alternative was what at the outset led the Sheridans to take the latter into consideration, very vaguely indeed, and with no definite purpose but as they dwelt upon it, the notion gradually developed an outline. Stray reports came up from the town about a fortnightly steamer which had lately begun to ply between Kentport and Queenstown, the starting point of that awful voyage over oceans of say. Now Kentport lies within a few days' tramp, not so hopelessly remote but that it was just possible to imagine a man's making his way thither, and once arrived there, persons, so rumour ran, were to be found who would hold themselves responsible for his disembarkation somewhere on the other side, an arrangement which seemed to render further imaginings unnecessary. And when the Sheridans mentally pictured some one they knew trudging off along the familiar road, till it grew strange, and at last, going on board the steamboat, stranger still, the figure they saw was Larry, the second boy. Everything pointed him out as the appropriate immigrant. His younger brothers were not old enough, and Andy was out of the question, growing yearly more important to his family circle, as his father's infirmities increased. Sure, we'd be lost entirely without Andy, Larry, on the contrary, appeared in no wise indispensable. He was twenty years old, almost as tall as his brother, and still growing, but lank and weedy, never to be nearly so fine a figure of a man. Neither had he Andy's practical abilities and energy, being in truth scatterbrained and innately lazy. He loved to sit, dangling his long legs on the top of a dyke, or to lie basking on a sun-warmed bank, and especially in winter time, when the uncomfortable outer world became a fact to ignore as much as possible, he was very fond of getting into a few tattered sheets of an old song-book and a loose-leaved volume of Ivanhoe, picked up goodness knows where, and presented to him by the widow McGurk, who had also taught him his letters. It is true that his long legs would run miles ungrudgingly on an errand if anybody was took bad or in trouble, and that his most foolish actions were often done with the kindest intentions. It was true, too, that ever and anon, upon some emergency, he would make some shrewd suggestion which caused his neighbors to remark that Larry Sheridan was no fool when he chose to leave the wool-gathering and give his mind to what he was about whereupon some person present would probably add that he was a decent poor lad anyway, and a real gob of good nature. But all this did not alter the stubborn fact that his services were not, and could not be, worth his keep, since at the busiest times the Sheridan's tiny holding scarcely gave full employment to Andy and Tim, not to mention Sally and the smaller fry. 
while at slack seasons hercules himself could merely have kicked his heels there rather more vigorously than ordinary mortals in short when once his relations had familiarized themselves with the idea the main obstacle to larry's departure from lisconnel lay in his own sentiments on the subject it would be difficult to overstate their strength his shrinking from new paths and devotion to old ones exaggerated well-nigh caricatured those propensities as commonly exhibited by his neighbors i do not believe that with his own good will he would ever have gone out of sight of the little knockhorn with its lowly crest of grey gleaming crag business now and then called him down to duffclane or even as far as the town but on these occasions reluctant went his departing steps and his rising spirits always jumped up several degrees in one bound at the moment when his thatch with its dark-rimmed smoke-hole came into view again from the brow of the hill to live on where and as he had lived ever since his memories began was a prospect in which had it been assured to him he would have more than acquiesced changes of every kind were hateful to him those wrought slowly by mere lapse of time even now at twenty years old filled him with despondency whenever he thought of them but he had a faculty of holding aloof from painful reflections unless they were thrust unavoidably upon his attention of course with the rest of lisconnel he had his share of bad seasons when sheer want like a freshet in an ever-brimming stream comes down upon the household by its brink and swamps everybody impartially from his normal circumstances however that is when he had not overmuch to do and pretty nearly enough to eat he drew whole days full of content lounging away his leisure amid a happy mingling of accustomed sights and sounds with fantastic dreams partly inspired by the confused glimpses of medieval romance which he spelled out for himself these glimpses were made all the more confused by the necessity he was under of sorting as best he could the pages of his dishevelled volume which carefully though he stowed them away got mixed up as a rule between each reading and probably were never replaced just in the order sir walter had intended once larry had given little pat his brother a clout on the head for mischievously jumbling them all together again and this act of violence was one of his life's two most remorseful memories the other was the recollection of how at about five years old he had one day furtively finished a potato which his mother who died soon afterward had been eating for her dinner when a neighbor called her to the door with some message and how he had seen her look disappointed on her return as she missed the remnant of her stinted meal both these incidents were apt to haunt him during his rare absences from home and by some curious train of thought they made him feel somehow that it would be a judgment on him if anything went again the others while he was away whence we may infer that if larry sheridan's count of crimes were a heavy one his conscience must have been gravely deficient in the faculty of selection it was a long time ere larry began to have the faintest inkling of the plans which his family were forming on his behalf his habit of mind was somewhat inobservant and the enormity of the idea as it appeared to him made him the slower to take it up but when it did dawn upon him he was nearly as much shocked as he would have been had he detected the rest in a conspiracy for drowning him in the bog hole at the back of their house thenceforward he became feverishly alive to every word or look that could conceivably bear on the matter 
for it must not be supposed that larry's people told him explicitly how expedient they considered his departure to the states such plainness of speech is not our custom in lisconnel where we are on the one hand innately averse from stating in cold blood facts likely to displease our hearers and on the other are quick-witted enough to take hints with a readiness which allows things of the kind to be conveyed under a muffle of innuendo thus avoiding some disagreeable friction at the cost of a little candour and an occasional risk of misapprehension to my mind the bargain is on the whole not a bad one for us who want all the amenities of life that come by any means within our reach if larry had charged anybody point-blank with wishing him to emigrate he would have elicited a vehement disclaimer och now the saints in glory be among us the goodness grant me patience wid him is it raven the lad is sure what talk as ever a one of any such a thing we were just past the remark that out there appears to be a fine place where a young chap will get his livin easy and to spare instead of scrapin an old pot where there's maybe plenty without him to be scrapin it however it's long sorry i'd be to bid anybody to go make his fortin against his will but his mind fairly sensitized received to his sorrow the import of insinuations far more delicately wrapped up than this hypothetical one sometimes he caused himself needless pangs by imagining hints where none were meant he never escaped any through lack of perception of course he did not let on to have overtly recognized the existence of the project would have seemed to bring it a stage nearer execution but though he said nothing he took action upon it for he reasoned with himself that he must have been a great little good for and a blamed old handless bastoon or else the rest of them would never have took up with a notion of getting shut of him and the conclusion which he deduced was to the effect that if he showed himself in a more favourable light they might be led to dismiss the idea he remembered now regretfully how often he had lain perdu behind his favourite big boulder while his stepmother was audible in the distance screeching for some one to fetch her a bucket of water and he resolved to turn over a new leaf indeed he seemed so to speak to turn over several at once for he fell to bringing in so many bucketfuls that his sister sally asked him with sarcasm whether he thought they were about making themselves a young loch in the middle of the fleur it was not easy to find channels for all his new industrial zeal once he nearly broke his back by hauling a heavy snaggy black mass half root half tree trunk up to their door from a distant turf cutting because he had heard mrs sheridan say that it would make a grand stool like for beside the hearth corner but having left it thus overnight with the intention of just rolling it in handy the first thing next morning behold the earlier andy accomplished this while larry still slept and entered lightly into all the kudos of the toilsome achievement the children naturally quarrelled all day for the glory of occupying the new seat and in the course of their contention patty tumbled little rosanne head foremost into the hearth and was within an aims ace of setting the innocent child in a blaze of fire whereupon their mother remarked that she wished to goodness that big gomorrah larry would let alone littering up the place with his old sticks and encouraging the children to destroy themselves sure if he could find nothing better to be after at home there were places where there was plenty besides mischief to be doing to which sally rejoined i be jabbers are there with a flash of the recurrent thought that if young dan o'byrne knew she had a brother doin well in the states 
and send in home pounds and pounds he might not think such a wonderful heap of stacy doyne a girl whose people were as poor as they could stick together so inapparent may be the links between cause and effect many another little scheme of larry's proved equally unsuccessful yet he did not relax his efforts some of his attempts to propitiate seem rather melancholy he was more careful than ever to avoid making his presence felt obtrusively around the steaming pot sometimes keeping away altogether and sometimes saying imaginatively bedad tim you must have this with me anyways she's after giving me enough to feed a regiment of horse and foot he even exerted himself to secure the suffrages of the small children who were already well affected toward him by unusual alacrity in acceding to their requests for performances of a farcical song and dance known in the family as larry's antics his grotesque capers often were cut to a tragic accompaniment of very unmirthful meditations such edupean choruses will attend our comic operas however this took nothing from the pleasure of his unsuspecting audience it appeared a graver drawback that the entertainment was liable to be prohibited summarily by a growl from peter who through those slow-gated winter days formed a centre of domestic gloom where he sat beside the fire fearing that he would never be good for a stroke of work again and ever and anon diversifying his discomfortable private cogitations by a cautious excursion into the affairs going forward around him on evenings when his mood was more disconsolate than usual the first flourish of larry's arms and legs would produce a peremptory injunction to quit carrying on like a demented scarecrow in a storm of wind and larry would have to desist from that artful method of ingratiation about this time if any explorers of lisconnel had come across a long ragged youth seated on a grey lichened boulder ruffling up a halo of black hair with both hands and staring before him over the bog with a whole horizontal of melancholy in his wide dark eyes and narrow peaked face they would probably have seen larry sheridan engaged in earnestly pondering and planning how he could induce his family to let him live out his bit of life among them unmolested by nightmare visions of being driven off into the great strange miserable world away from lisconnel in all these aims and devices larry enjoyed the encouragement and comfort of one sympathizing coadjutrix his sister peg a close friendship had existed between them from her earliest days when larry used to carry her about to a surprising extent considering that he was the elder by only three years and as she grew older without ever learning to walk rightly it was larry who did most to make her amends for this privation he spent hours in amusing her and at one time even wished to teach her to read that she might be able to entertain herself with his priceless library but peg who was practical-minded showed no enthusiasm for literature in fact when he tried to begin her second lesson she immediately kicked him saying with a howl get along with your ugly old eye by sigh and tore one of his precious pages nearly in half thereby abruptly finishing her education however despite their dissimilarity of taste and her occasional shortness of temper their friendship continued to thrive and peg now manifested it by vigorously siding with larry in the queer undeclared struggle which was going on beneath their roof it is true that peg was no very powerful auxiliary still she had zeal and some intelligence which enabled her to act not inefficiently as trumpeter of all larry's worthy deeds and forager for facts 
wherewith to rebut those advanced in support of their views by the opposite party. Thus, if Larry cleared a path through the snowdrift, or brought home the hen that had foosted off with herself down the bog, or mended the worst hole in the thatch beneath which the drip had begun to form a deep pool, Peg made it her business to see that all influential members of the household were duly apprised of these services, but she drew a discreet veil over the less quotable incidents of his first attempt at roof-patching on a plan of his own, namely the insertion into the aperture of an old meal-bag stuffed with stones, and her hair-breadth escape of being brained by a shower of them, which the speedy collapse of the rotten sacking let tumble into the room. Or again, her stepmother might observe regretfully, as she threw the uneatably bad potatoes into a heap for the benefit of the widow McGurk's pig, sure it's a poor case to be making waste for the feeding of other people's fat beasts. Judy Ryan was saying she'd heard tell the dun's son below that's way off somewheres abroad this two year was after sending them home the price of a grand young pig they'll be gettin oodles of money on at the fair afore lent but ah sure where there's anybody to do us a hand's turn as i says to her but their peg would be ready primed to countermine this anecdote with mrs quigley's cousin who had never had a day's health ever since he gone off to live away at Shanasheen, and a man Brian Kilfoyle knew who went up to the north ten year ago and had never been heard of from that good day to this. Brian thought like enough something might a happened to him. Considered as arguments, Peg's little narratives may not appear particularly cogent, yet much further-fetched ones were resorted to by both factions even mad bells and crazy christie's contributions on the question were not disregarded indeed mrs sheridan laid no small stress upon bell's report of a conversation which during one of her rambles she had had with a man lately returned from new york it varied in details from time to time but was substantially to the effect that in them parts if there's anything you're a wantin all you got to do is to turn a handle round and round a few odd times and there you are with no more trouble about it so maybe mrs sheridan would comment finding herself unable to accept this scheme of things in quite all its beautiful simplicity the creature hasn't exactly comprehended the rights of it but if there's any sense in it at all at all that must be an uncommon convenient country to get one's livin in the experience of the o'driscoll family were of course made to do yeoman's service on larry's side but that is a mournful history which must have a chapter to itself so this winter dragged on heavily towards lengthening days, and Larry at times thought, hopefully, that when the open spring weather came, and the potato setting and turf cutting began, he would be the better able to demonstrate his raison d'etre at Lisconnel. While in moments of despondency he felt as if his will were being sapped by the continued assaults of public opinion, till he must needs surrender himself to the conviction that it was his duty to go away and burden his family no more. But it was well on towards the end of March when there occurred what seemed to him a grand opportunity of proving himself capable and useful, a member of the establishment whom the rest of them would think twice of wishing to transport. One afternoon Biddy and Patty and Johnny and Katie and Rosanne and Joe, the last named, waddled a long way behind the others and could not as yet roar articulately, came bawling home with the news that Andy was just after taking his hand off of him with his old clasp-knife down below 
front of Huey Quigley's turf stack. This was happily an exaggerated version of the disaster, but Andy really had given his right wrist an ugly gash, which obliged him to seek surgical aid from Dan O'Byrne, the blacksmith at Duffclane, and which threatened to cripple him for some little time to come. It was a vexatious accident, for the slowly relaxing frosts had at last allowed people to think of getting in their potatoes already belated enough. Lisconnel always breathes more freely when once its potatoes are down, and the earlier the better for every reason. The likelihood of a good crop is increased, and the people have a soothing subconsciousness that something is all the while being done on their behalf out of sight among the trenches and lazy beds. Their stock of seed, too, is thus insured against the possibility of being desperately eaten in any crisis of short commons. So much, however, depended on the crop that the Sheridans thought it prudent to await Andy's convalescence, rather than proceed with their sowing while he was incapacitated, and works, therefore, came to a standstill in the plot behind their cabin. It chanced one morning a few days later that Larry, returning from an early ramble, found most of his family absent. Andy, accompanied by several of his brethren, had gone to O'Byrne the blacksmith, and the others were somewhere out on the bog, leaving only the stiff-jointed Peter and limping Peg at home. Peter was never cheerful company, and Peg today would do nothing but cower over the fire with her knitting, for she was suffering from a bad fit of neuralgia, or as she put it, was destroyed entirely with the face ache. Larry accordingly went out of doors again in quest of entertainment. It was a grim, rayless morning, the horizon veiled round and round with a dusky powdery haze of the peculiar hue and texture seen only on a day possessed by the devil of an east wind. That wind, too, showed all its distinctively vicious qualities in an exalted degree. Its piercing fangs seemed to have been wetted on a myriad icebergs, and its bitter blasts to breathe from over continents of shrouding snow. It was a wind that simultaneously stung and benumbed, that felt dankly chill as the touch of a drowned hand, and yet parched aridly as if its mission were to bake the veins of the earth with frost. The very grass blades it passed over seemed to lose color and to shiver stiffly as if their sap were congealed but larry did not trouble himself about the cold for he had scarcely crossed the swampy patch that brought him to their little field when he was seized by a great idea there lay the half-dug trenches which had been begun on the day before andy's accident with tools strewn around, ready to hand whenever work should be resumed, and Larry suddenly resolved that he would undertake it now. It would be a grand thing, he said to himself, if he could get down, at any rate, a good few of those potatoes, over which his father was at the present minute helplessly fuming and fretting in his gloomy corner. He would set about it at once, before anybody knew what he was doing. No one had ever suggested his attempting such a thing, because, indeed, no one would have dreamed of entrusting so critical a task to a queer, blundering gabby like Larry. Therefore he had not any prohibitions or scoffs to give him pause, and he felt strongly that the accomplishment of the feat single-handed would prove a splendid feather in his cap thus inspired he fell to forthwith and toiled hugely until when he broke off and leaned panting on his spade to review his labors a considerable portion of the narrow plot lay ready for the seed to give him his due the spade work which he contemplated with 
all your jack o' dreams peculiar pride and satisfaction in any casual bit of practical achievement had been thoroughly and properly done and so far things were well enough but larry had determined to make a job of it and not to desist until his drills were safely planted so he fetched a bag of the seed potatoes from their nook behind the turf heap indoors unbeknownst to his father and peg musha he said with guile to account for his rustling i'm just drivin the old hen off a roostin on sally's old shawl and he presently was seated on the low wall scientifically slicing away with the worn stump of knife blade two inches long which had cut out the sheridan family's eyes for many a season's crop the last pale whitey brown section had been earthed over and larry was dealing a few superfluous final pats with the flat of his broad griffon congratulating himself the while that he had got through undisturbed and could now display his doings as a triumphant surprise when peg came halting out of the doors and up to the field dyke her eye was at once caught by the dangling potato sack and in a moment she had surmised the whole calamity mercy on us all alive larry she said you've never been meddlin with the potatoes this day bedad have i quoth larry with a cheerfulness half bravado for peg's tone awakened a horrible foreboding which he dared not face look at the rows i've got set and good luck to them sure it's great weather i've made of it this morning entirely then it's lost we are the blight's in the wind and sorra the thrace of one of them will ever be seen above the ground larry all at once knew that it was very cold his own hands were benumbed and an icy grasp suddenly clutched at his heart peg had spoken truly the east wind had brought with it like a lurking assassin the murderous black frost which stabs and slays all life and growth in its frail first beginnings and in the teeth of that he had cut up and planted nearly a bagful of their hoarded seed potatoes he stared blankly round the hard hot and grey sky and then at the neighbors little brown fields where never a soul was working and then at the rush fringed puddle on peg's side of the dyke and he saw that its edges had gathered a flaky ice film true true for you he faltered and stood looking helplessly from the flaccid sack to the smooth swelling ridges a haggard and tatterdemalion despair ye great stupid mischief-making gomeral said peg ye meddlin good for nothing jackass that can't keep your hands off interferin with what you've no call to be touchin look at what you've after doin on us the best part of a sackful is good as slung down a bog hole sure little patty had known better than to be cuttin and sewin on one day let alone when the air's teemin with the black frost och but it's a heart skull to have a likes of such a shtacorn stravadin about lookin for harum to be doin and trouble to make it's no more than the truth they be speakin when they do be sayin you'd be right to take yourself out of this to some place where you might ruinate and destroy all before you and no matter to us that's all you're fit for so it is just wait till father and andy here tell of it just wait you big amadon standin there stargazin like a stuck pig the tomfoolery of you would annoy an old crow och we're a, such a thing to go do i'm fairly sickened with you that's a fact of all the boost horns peg expressed herself as forcibly as she should have done if confronted at equally close quarters with a prospect of more than a semi-starvation she was further exasperated by a sense that her ally had irretrievably disgraced and discredited her partisanship altogether her feelings were so much perturbed that she did not remark how silent larry was neither attempting any defence nor as would have been more characteristic 
breaking out into vehement self-abuse he only said as he gazed down the length of a freshly drawn furrow and all the while i might as well have been digging me grave on the following morning larry was not indoors at breakfast time which did not surprise his angered family as he often roamed off early and on this occasion had no reason to anticipate an enjoyable meal but peg was soon afterwards rather astonished at finding his two old flithers of books stuffed into the niche in the wall where she kept her knitting and yarn for he always stowed them away carefully in a receptacle of their own at about sunset andy returning from the blacksmith's brought the news how larry had passed by there in the grey of the morning going towards the town and had left word with dan o'byrne that he was off to kenport where he would get passage in the american steamer then peg knew that larry's library was a farewell gift everybody else thought that the whole thing was just a bit of blathers like and that they would have him streeling home again in a couple of days but peg from the first said never a foot the weeks which converted all the others to her opinion passed heavily for her desertion of your comrade at a pinch is an ill-favoured spectre to look back upon under any circumstances and when the chances seem to be all against your ever more having an opportunity of making amends for your defection it often grows so fascinatingly hideous that you cannot easily look the other way peg in those days met it at every turn looming lividly against a cloud of reminiscence which was rapidly becoming charged with remorse nor under its oppressive lowering could she find any clearer gleam of consolation than the chance that larry might some day be writing home perhaps from the unknown regions of queenstown or at any rate from wherever he came to in the states and then peg thought to herself she would get brian kilfoyle to scrawl a letter for her she had pennies enough to buy the stamp and bid him to come back to them out of that by the next boat and never to be minding about the old potatoes they didn't matter a threnine or maybe by some manner of means she could even send him through the post a pair of socks she had just finished knitting to sell at cores she felt that if she could do that the throbbing pang might go out of her life and leave only an endurable ache but it grew worse and worse while she waited for larry's letter she told her family how lovely it was up on the ridge since the weather had grown so soft disingenuously leading them to infer that she sat there all day to enjoy the beauties of nature whereas in truth the gentle april breezes and mild daisy and forget-me-not sky merely enabled her to concentrate her whole attention undiverted upon her watch along the ribbon of road another thing they did was to bring on very fast the potatoes now all planted even larry's unchancy rose had not missed at all for they showed little green shoots at the sight of which his half-sister biddy a good-natured child nearly cried her eyes out but peg could do nothing better than call herself a black hearted beast which was cold comfort and say passionately to little johnny who shouted to her jubilant at the discovery oh wisht and bad manners to you you moiderin brat you're all the one thing which was no comfort worth speaking of at all however by this time the tidings she awaited for so impatiently were already on their road people who do not dwell too many leagues beyond a man's life can count upon the advantage if advantage it be of receiving their bad news in a flash within an hour or so after date although their hopes may have gone to rack on the hot sands under an eastern sun-blaze while they were groping business through a london fog 
but such things come to Lisconnel by much more circuitous routes. During those April days, Peg's messenger, by slow stages of stone-diked countryside, between even smaller and lonelier hamlets, was making his way thither in the person of a little feeble-gated sprisson of a man who looked as if he had escaped from a vampire cave but who in reality had been lately discharged from the workhouse infirmary at kenport he appeared in lisconnel one amber wested evening under the delusion that he had arrived at salenbeg for he had strayed many miles out of his weary way and he was so tired and took aback that he had not spirits to launch into speech at any length until after the supper to which hugh quigley made him welcome and which mrs pat ryan enriched with a sup of thick milk she had saved from the morning's breakfast then in the course of the conversation which had drawn several of the neighbors to quigley's the stranger remarked in his plaintive southern sing-song now that i remember there was a chap from these parts i met wit and i laid up down away there lisconnel i bedad it was there he said he come from but the name of him's out of me head this instant a young slip of a lad with legs to him the length of a three-month foals och begorra i've got him after all sheridan that's what it was sure enough larry sheridan peg was the only one of her family who happened to be present crouched unobtrusively round an angle of the dresser if she had been a wild creature in a forest you would now have thought she had heard a twig snap deed then that will have been peter sheridan's larry him that's took off to the states well now to think of your fallen in with him the states sure enough he had great talk of the states out of him but be the time he come into the infirmary he wasn't fit to be travelling the length of the ward that indifferent he was let alone skytin over the ocean seas to the infirmary was you sayin sakes alive sure what at all ailed the misfortunate bein goodness pity him to be took bad and he in a strange place but never a hapworth had the creature amiss with him when he quit out of this twas an awful cold he got on the chest i'm told they put a grand title to it in the paper faith i took as serious a one meself every inch of it but the doctor said he was perished and starved with trampin about in the severe weather howsomever his mind was dead set on the immigration he lay next bed to mine, and I would be hearin' him axin' continual if the Queenstown boat did be about startin' yet. So the sisters knew well enough he was distressin' himself for fear she'd be off without him, and just to pacify him they'd declare be this and be that she was lyin' there alongside the quay with ne'er a thought a stirrin' in her head and she mind you half ways to wherever she might be goin all the while och now the sisters do be real charitable ladies there was one of them used to bring me the half of her own bit of dinner of a day i didn't fancy what i had for myself well one evenin he took a bad turn a sort of weakness like and they thought it might be goin he was and they sent after the doctor in a hurry but be that time he was somethin better again and the doctor seemed a trifle put out at being called unnecessary it's another false alarm you've given me sister teresa says he anyway when the young feller began axin about the steamboat the doctor told him shortish that she was away with herself three days since and he might as well be puttin the notion out of his mind sure when he said that i heard sister teresa goin thuck thuck to herself thinkin the creature'd be annoyed but he seemed all as well content och then glory be to god says he if the old beast off at last i can be steppin home be dad but i've been away from them all one while maybe they'll not think so bad be this time of them 
woeful old pitaties, I think he said, and anyway, says he, Peg, I'll make it up with me for startin' sure. He kept saying, talkin' of a peg he had, that we settled he'd fell out with his sweetheart about somethin', and ran off in a fantigue, that after that he was easier than common for a good bit, and never a word out of him, but later on in the night, when we were left to mind ourselves, I heard him discoursin' away to himself at a great rate about gettin' up early, and trampin' home, and comin' over the hill, and I don't know what all besides. So says I to him, for some whiles, if you'd slip a word in, he'd answer you back reasonable, and other whiles he couldn't take hold of it, but just plustered along without hearin', says I to him. That's a fine journey you're regulatin' there, says I. Div you think you'll ever be able for it to-morrow? Sure, says he, I'm thinkin' there took me away me old brogues on me, but if the sister's not for givin' them back again, I could easy make a shift to do without them. For hail, rain, or snow, says he, I'll be off to-morrow. Aye, be the powers, will you? says I, humourin' him in a manner. Sure it's not an old pair of brogues, boyo, that'll hinder you a gettin' home. Truth, no, says he, sure I'll go barefoot, and me hands and knees to be there again. You're a great opinion, whatever of that place, says I to him. The stranger glanced towards the door-frame span of faint green twilight sky, with an expression which might have signified that though now in a position to form an opinion for himself he had resolved upon a polite reticence and says he to me och man alive if i could be seein a sight of it and the whole of them again sure twould just put the life in me he so it would for all they might be a uh, had been a bit cross wid me the time i was leavin whether it's meself it'd be the lucky bassoon if ever i got the chance to be sittin there under the old bank in the warmth of the sun along with the bits of books i borrow the loan of them now says he from peg they're trash says she but there was nothing else i had to be leavin her sure says he i'll get back one way or the other but it's a long tramp and there's a queer sort of heaviness in the old legs of me and the wind does be cold and it's cruel lonesome would you think now says he peering round the head of his bed hopeful like there'd be ever a chance you'd come along with me that far if the road lies that away twould be great company for me he says och murther says i and is it in any state i am to be trampin tramps and me tore in two with the awfulest cough at all no me fine lad if you're for quittin out of this to-morrow twill be along wid yourself and the young chap seemed real discouraged at that fit to cry he looked fay i remember the face of him leanin up there under the old night lamp with his hair standin on end and his eyes shinin out of his head howsomediver he says presently like as if he'd been makin his mind up to it i must be startin fine and early he says and that's a fact do ye see ever a glimmer light yet comin at the window says he and it scarce struck twelve o'clock sure then if it's a long tramp you're goin says i humourin him in a manner you perceive you better be takin a long sleep to strengthen yourself up and no fear but there's plenty of time afore you'll see daylight i will so says he sleepy like only i wish i'd bid good night to peg well the next time i woke up just about day glimmerin i thought to notice him breathin a bit queer and i was considerin maybe i'd a right to be callin some one but then i knew there'd be trouble if i took to raisin false alarums and after a minute he was quiet enough so i just lay still there i was and nary another stir i heard but when the sister come in at six may the saints have me soul if the young chap wasn't lying there stone dead i and turning cold and stiff in the general excitement caused by the catastrophe of the strange little man's story nobody took note of peg's proceedings or demeanour and it was not she who brought home the news later on however her conduct at this crisis of her history 
became the subject of some unfavourable criticism at Lisconnel. End of section 2section three of irish idols this librivox recording is in the public domain section three i'll give you me word ma'am mrs quigley said to a knot of neighbours next day i met her this morning front of me house and when i stopped passin by and was sayin i was concerned to hear tell of her trouble about poor larry and this way and that she just let a yell at me to wisht talkin and took off with her two hands to her ears like as if i was after reavin them out of her head and me merely passin a friendly remark that peg's a queer tempered fairy of a thing said mrs brian and does be mostly as cross as a weasel well at all events said judy ryan it's no credit to her not to have more feelin in her for that poor lad and he uncommon good-natured to her when the two of them was but slips of childer together but it's too good-natured larry always was heaven be his bed even old mrs kilfoyle who was not prone to censorious judgments said that it did seem so to speak unnatural of her but though peg may not have expressed her feelings conventionally i believe they were strong and durable likely perhaps to be henceforward as permanent a fact in her life as her lame foot and that was a long look out at seventeen as for her possible consolations they had been whirled away like blossoms caught in a march gale she had only one of them left larry had been certain sure that she would have made it up with him so she might be worse off after all chapter four a wet day when we met a stranger or a slight acquaintance on the roads about lisconnel we always say it's a fine day unless it happens to be actually pouring and then we say it's a fine day for the country i do not know exactly what meaning is attached to the qualifying clause for the rain may all the time be trampling down the tangled oats and rotting the potatoes facts which neighbours and friends point out to one another in unambiguous terms but it appears to be a mode of speech adopted as a seemly cloak for our uppermost thoughts on somewhat the same principle that we avoid choosing our own engrossing domestic troubles as a topic of conversation in mixed society fine days of this peculiar kind often come to lisconnel in a long dripping series and this was the case with one of which i am sometimes reminded when i hear a ballad singer setting up a horse roulade on the other side of the window-sill flower-boxes it was towards the end of an extremely wet july during which the district had been drenched and soaked and steeped as thoroughly as a bundle of flax in a bog hole though with no similarly beneficial result and yet the wet blanket overhead showed as few traces of wear and tear as if it had been spread out for the first time only that morning from dawn till dusk the sun found not a single thin place to glimmer through like a bad shilling and the far distant peaks were not once conjecturable behind the carefully tucked round curtain of hot and grey mist lisconnel is pretty well case hardened to damp as it ought to be considering its average annual rainfall never yet gauged an ordinarily heavy downpour keeps nobody indoors except when it is accompanied by a high wind on a wet day a strong gust will send groups of leisurely conversational loiterers flying to their several black thresholds and set women screeching to their children 
to come in out of that out of the teams of rain under which they had been hitherto disporting themselves unmolested and then lisconnel puts on a deserted aspect still its inhabitants appear ever and anon at their doorways much as amphibia rise to the surface to breathe for the turf reek blown black and beaten down makes an interior atmosphere amidst which the best seasoned lungs imperatively crave a whiff of fresher air this particular morning was wild and blustery and when mrs kilfoyle and her daughter-in-law stood looking out nobody was in sight save tethered on the opposite grass and puddle strip their own black and white goat who had faced away from the wind and gave one the impression of being lost in thought that impression was heightened by the manner in which the creature from time to time nodded its head slowly and moodily as if dissatisfied with the tenor of its meditations but presently in a lull between the blasts a skirl of vocal music rose up suddenly close by a harsh voice cracked and quavering but still strong enough to be produced with startling effect upon the silence wished nora is that her again said mrs kilfoyle bedad and it is the colleen deelish she's at this time twill be after puttin her out they are very belike said mrs brian craning her neck to look as far as she could up the road och yes i just got a glimpse of the table tiltin through the door now i call that brutish and it pthugwin fit to drown a water rat sure it's little enough she'll trouble herself said mrs sheridan joining the conversation from her adjacent door she'd as lief as not be sittin in the middle of a pool of water the creature but i can see her from here and she's got grand shelter under the wall of the shed bedad she's cocked up the table on end behind her back and is crouchin below like an old hen in a coop now if there was hapworth a wit in her she might a got on one o her chairs but maybe the ground's not altogether dreeped yet where she is wid the way the wind's comin it's a fine trait o music she's given us this mornin anyhow said andy popping out his head over his stepmother's shoulder yappity lowly hullabalula ramaruri rory ruri och there was a grand one i couldn't equal that now not if i put stones in me stockings and howled all night meanwhile shrill and strident strains continue to proceed from one of the two cabins which stand at a few perches distance on the kilfoyle's side of the road on the left hand that is as you come over the knock horn into lisconnel it was screened from their view by an intervening turf stack or they could have seen outside the door a little pile of furniture stacked leg in air amongst which a white-clad figure crouched in bold relief against the dark ground and wet blackened wall this was mad bell and these were her household gods undergoing temporary ejectment i do not know what conjunction of circumstances brought it about but for many years that cabin with the low ridge dwindled away behind it and with its door opening on the wide brown bog was jointly tenanted by big anne mad bell and the dummy as queer a trio maybe as you could find under one roof in the province of connaught big anne ranked as responsible head of the establishment by virtue of characteristics much less markedly divergent from the normal type than those of her co-tenants both of whom belonged to the category of unaccountable persons in lisconnel's opinion as apt to be doing one thing as another she was indeed merely a very tall large-boned woman with a habit of walking upon the heels exclusively of enormous feet which enabled her neighbours to recognise her at great distances by her gait 
nobody would have thought to look at her that she was sensitive on the subject of her personal appearance yet she never did forget or forgive biddy sheridan's indiscreet remark that one foot of big anne's could cover two of the flags in the floor of the chapel porch down beyant the dummy a short squat woman with a pale broad face and shifty light eyes was a more exceptional personality and on the whole rather an unpopular one among us though big anne who had the best opportunities of judging always described her as a quite poor creature which under the circumstances might no doubt be deemed somewhat damnatorily faint praise to the present day it is a disputed point in lisconnel whether the dummy was really dumb or only malingering there is one fact which tells strongly in the favour of those who maintain the thesis that she could have spoken as plain as any mortal soul if she'd so pleased namely that she assumed total deafness but evidently was not deaf for she would start violently if you yelled suddenly into her ear or clattered a heavy stone against the dyke close beside her experiments which the children never wearied of trying hence it is not an unwarrantable conclusion that both infirmities may have been feigned or at least exaggerated for professional purposes the dumbing having in her earlier days led a vagrant life upon this hypothesis her persistence in sustaining the character was regarded as unneighborly they are obliged on the other hand to admit that her success in doing so seemed almost incredibly complete since no authentic instance has been recorded of her ever having uttered a syllable vague rumours are current to the effect that she said something on her deathbed but few people believe them it is however a well-established fact that the day before she died she laboriously extricated her savings to the amount of sixpence in silver and two pence in coppers from a pouch sewn up in her sleeve and made clear by pantomimic signs how she wished the woman who had befriended her in her last illness to expend the sum on sugar sticks for the children a testamentary disposition that gave great satisfaction as for mad bell her title to insanity rested perhaps on a less questionable foundation than the dummy's pretensions to deafness it may seem antecedently probable that in an unsophisticated little community like lisconnel much scope would be found for the development of individuality and that there if anywhere one might strike out unchallenged into unconventional paths the contrary rather is the case a very slight deviation from certain recognized lines of conduct suffices there to write you down roundly as mad or crazy with no euphemistic flourishes of eccentric or peculiar it is true that the adjectives are used in a considerably less disparaging and disabling sense than they have elsewhere and that once fairly appropriated they confer a license which often permits the holder to do what seems good unto him with more than other men's freedom from hampering criticism thus her neighbours said well mad bell how's yourself this long while just as respectfully as if they had addressed her as mrs or ma'am and nobody thought the worse of her because she now and again stravaded away with herself the dear knows where and might not reappear for weeks or months i must own that her aspect on this wet day was odd enough she had lately returned from a protracted excursion in the course of which somebody had bestowed upon her a huge old white felt gainsborough hat with blue velvet rosettes and streamers she must have gone a long long way from lisconnel ere she reached the region of such headgear this she wore surmounting the folds of a rough white woolen wrap such as have in these bad times begun to supersede the more expensive blue cloth cloaks of galway 
and her little wedge of yellow face peered out beneath with a goblinish effect if a wizened lemon could look up shrewdly at you it would be curiously like mad bell's visage altogether she was a figure you would have glanced at again even if you had not come across it sitting among upturned chair and table legs on the edge of a bogged track in a downpour of rain and singing the rising of the moon at the top of its voice her situation demands an explanatory note as a rule mad bell lived on fairly harmonious terms with her housemates but she had one idiosyncrasy with which they could not put up this was an occasional propensity for bursting forth into song loud long and drawn from an apparently inexhaustible repertoire which might have made the fortune of any average street musician perhaps big anne and the dummy had unusually sensitive musical ears or perhaps they had not been educated up to such elaborate performances for little singing is to be heard in lisconnel and that little is seldom more than the low croon to which a woman might put her child asleep or milk her goat be this as it may they could not by any means endure mad bell's lays accordingly whenever she settled herself for a screeching match big anne's inappreciative phrase they adopted summary and stringent measures part of the household furniture was understood to be her private property how acquired nobody clearly knew though it was commonly associated with the tradition that mad bell had come of very decent people mind you and now the first penetrating notes of one of her interminable ballads were always the signal of her fellow-lodgers to seize upon a couple of rush-bottomed chairs a small deal table and a little black-looking clothes horse all of which they deposited outside the door i cannot say whether these articles constituted precisely mad bell's possessions neither more nor less or whether the whole act being so to speak symbolical and ceremonial they were merely selected as conveniently portable but she never failed to take the graceful hint and either subsided into silence or if as oftener happened the lyrical impulse proved irresistible followed her furniture out of doors and there carolled to her heart's content it seemed to have come upon her in great force this morning for a full hour after her eviction she was still singing lustily with an impassioned fervour indeed which suggested that she must be inspired by some theme admitting of a poignant personal application yet the burden of her song was in reality nothing less remote than a string of rather disjointed reflections upon the character of queen bess by that time the wind had sunk away and the steady patter of drops which kept the puddles dancing round dances did not deter the children from standing about to listen they remained at a wary distance however and only those who were furthest off squeaked in mimicry of her most ornate trills and flourishes for mad bell sometimes lost her temper and was then an alarming person judy ryan once said that to hear her curse was enough to terrify all creation from the saints sleeping on their feather beds of glory to the little midge weevils hatching of themselves in the bottoms of the old bog holes but judy always had a gift for using impressive figures of speech in moments of agitation only the approach of noon with its prospects of dinner drew away mad bell's audience and when Liz connell had finished dining the concert too was over and she had retreated indoors chairs table and all at Liz connell in july dinner is often something of a failure you might walk past many of the open doors while it is in progress without coming upon the pleasant familiar smell of potatoes steaming in their brown jackets and when that is the case 
you may be pretty sure there is no better substitute in the big pot than a brash of gritty yellow indian meal which people must get through as well as they can thinking themselves lucky if a drop of goat's milk is forthcoming to improve matters for the children for what with potatoes going at the middle which causes terrible waste and with one's being prone to fill the pot very full so long as one's heap looks large not to mention the lending of loans to a neighbour or the occasional entertainment of some frankly ravenous guest it seldom or never happens that anybody's store holds out beyond the end of june while it seldom or never happens what with late frosts and nipping winds and cold wet summer weather that the new crop becomes fit for lifting until august is well under way hence it follows that july with its soon glimmering long lingering daylight when one wakens early and has a great many hours to put over before it will be dusk enough to think of sleep again is even proverbially a month of short commons and hunger a ramadan with no nightly feasting to make up for the day's abstinence a lent whose fast no church ordains and blesses its main alleviation has to be sought in the drawing on of harvest time which naturally comes uppermost as a topic of conversation you might have safely laid a wager that at eight out of nine dinner parties assembled in lisconnel on this wet day prospective potatoes were a theme of discussion to which a wistful tone was often given by their absence in any more substantial form at the pat ryan's for instance mrs pat remarked hopefully as she distributed little dabs of thick yellow porridge along the edge of a broken plate to cool for the two youngest children well i suppose we'll be diggin next week please goodness if the weather's anyways christianable at all and bedad we won't then after that again said her husband or maybe the next next week to the back of that sure the farthest of them's scarce in flower yet let alone a sign of witherin on them some people do say mrs pat said looking disconcerted that they're fit enough for liftin the first minute ye see the colour of a blossom some people says more than their prayers pat rejoined with despondent sarcasm and fit or no fit who's to get them dug with the rain washing them out of the ground you may say under one's feet take care that it's not rotted they'll be on us afore ever they'll have a chance to ripen it's much if there isn't a good slam or two of thunder again we get done with the wet weather and that it bring the blight along wid it as ready as anything bad scran to it and then there's the turf sure it had a right to be up dryin by now but you might as well go to cut the mud along the roadside och it's a great ould summer we're havin this time entirely it's a reason to be proud of itself pat dropped his chin dejectedly into his palms as he sat on his black log forum and drew patterns aimlessly on his plastic floor with the toe of a many creviced brogue lisconnel cabin interiors are all more or less examples of what may be termed the cavern style of domestic architecture as their darkness tempered by inartificial chinks together with their free exhibition of undisguised stone and earth in walls and flooring suggest a cave dwelling in almost its severe primeval rudeness the pat ryan's does so in a marked degree perhaps because its most prominent article of furniture are the two long rough tree trunks dug out of the bog in the progress of some season's turf cutting which serve the family for seats the master of the house sitting pensively on the end of one of them might now with accessories of a few flint axes celts 
and an uncanny-looking lizard or two have posed well enough as his own geological ancestor dating from some abysmal paleolithic or preglacial period presently pat raised his head and remarked in an injured tone Ara now denny i wish you'd leave jabbin one in the leg that away i declare i thought it was a horsefly was on me dennis ryan who was very fat and about three years old only grinned nearly all round his head and said triumphantly molly molly i'm after stickin fodder with the handle of me spoon and whereupon something smaller and still fatter began to crawl rapidly over the floor evidently with designs of participating in this detectable amusement och bad manners to you children can't you let the man sit his bit of food in peace said their mother in remonstrant appeal here's your own dinners just ready if you'd settle down to it comfortable and quit annoying other people as for that matter i'm finished said pat getting up i was only waitin till the flurry of the wind was gone by a bit to step down and fetch in the tools from where we was workin yesterday tom had a right to a brought them in but he went off at all hours along with oddy rafferty and that old ass he did so said mrs pat and i wonder be the same token what at all took them in the thrames of rain i hope to goodness he'll not be landed himself in the middle of some great old botheration before he's done how should i know said pat swallowing a rainy gust as he crossed the threshold begob hughie quigley's scalpeen of oats looks as if seven mad bullocks had been rolling themselves in it devil receive the straw of it'll ever stand up on its right end in the world should accept to be raising yourself ruination and destruct the rest of the sentence went over the bog on a keening blast about the same time the kilfoyles next door were talking over their dinner the kilfoyles cabin was at one period an object which caught the eye of everybody who came into lisconnel and though much toned down and subdued it even now presents a rather distinguished appearance for one day thady the lad who used to bring his mother little packets of tea and sugar until he unhappily had his skull fractured by a kicking cart horse down below on hilferthy's farm took it into his head to do a job of whitewashing and carried up a creel full of lumps of lime from clayson's kiln these he slaked in an old washing tub still ruefully referred to by mrs bryan as being fit for nothing else from that good hour to this and splashed away with a lavishness that atoned for want of skill or any handier brush than a besom or dried broom and heather in his thoroughgoingness he whitened the very turf stack and looked longingly at the moss rusted thatch in consequence for several months afterwards the snowy walls gleamed conspicuously on the black bogland far and wide and though that was years ago and smoke within and rain without have been busily effacing thaddy's handiwork traces of it still linger especially on the east end turned away from the weather and in sheltered angles under the eaves moreover incited by a consciousness of their remarkable exterior the kilfoyles sought to improve upon it by bounding themselves on two sides with an elaborate fence not a mere ordinary stone dyke this remains to the present day and is composed of materials which save for the charm of variety do not strike you as superior to those commonly in use worn out kettles and pots are among them and old boxes and fragments of wrecked carts mixed with battered tins and canisters and such other debris of civilization as we see tossed up on its remotest verge looking as incongruous and unaccountable there as the husks and shells of tropical fruits washed in 
with the slimy green ooze and brown trailing rack on a northern beach. Notwithstanding all this external elegance, however, the Kilfoyles fare no more sumptuously than the rest of Lisconnel, and were looking forward quite as eagerly to their new potatoes. In his speculations thereupon, Brian, who had gone further a harvesting than most of his neighbours and abounded in travellers' tales, was led to mention a wonderful machine which a man had told him another man had actually seen somewhere at work, a most surprising little fare of a yoke with twisted wheels to it that trud along easy and just whirled the potatoes up out of the ground before they knew where they were. Mrs. Bryan was of the opinion that she'd liefer not have any such a thing meddlin' or makin' with her potatoes. It might be a great contrivance, but somehow to roke them out that way wholesale seemed unnatural like to which her husband responded sure according to that gait a goin it's unnatural to turn them up wid a grip or a spade we'd a right to be leavin them sittin peaceable in their thrills or bedad they might ever happen to get planted at all at all unless it's natural to be sliverin them in slices and stickin them down in trinches i dunno how you're goin to manage it said brian who found like other controversialists that his argument was beginning to demonstrate cumbrously large facts so he shunted himself on to another line and continued twould have to be a clever divil of a machine what you might call real and genius before twould whirl a many potatoes out on some of these thrills of ours there's a terrible deal of them missed on us in odd places bad cess to it twas them blamed late frosts in april everybody looked grave at that hearing and saw inwardly a picture of the dark green rose marred by gaps uglier eyesores for lisconnel than for the bibliomaniac the blanks in his shelves which signify a broken set the saints send it may turn out a better crop than last year's said mrs bryan for a body does get fairly sickened with the long spell of this stuff we're after havin goodness forgive me for grumblin again it but it's heathenish it is and it comes hard on the childer poor creatures tim jewel stop where you are and don't be enticin the rest of them to follow you out under the pours of rain sure i'm heart scalded with billin it weary on it you might keep it on the fire till the latter day of doomsday and sorrow a taste of goodness there'd be in it when you'd done why sure nora me dear piped the little old mrs kilfoyle wishing to please this is a grand meal you got last time better than common i was thinking to get a sort of flavour of oaten meal off it look nora me mother's ready for another bit said brian gratified but misunderstanding her och to gracious no lad protested his mother while his wife began to run the big iron spoon vigorously round the pot is it choked yous ud be havin me all out and she took refuge in the doorway towards which the flaw-blown puddles outside seemed to make incessant short rushes invariably balked by some unseen impediment it's worse of the day's gittin she remarked there's young Pat Ryan goin' down the bog, and a blast's nearly riz him off his feet. Then she said, God save you, Mrs. McGurk, you're abroad in great old pothers. Stand in with yourself, ma'am, out of the wind. It's not too bad between the showers, said the widow McGurk, standing in, and I was after slippin' down to Mrs. Sheridan's with the pig's bucket. This was, strictly speaking, an old hot water can ah uh, brian man alive how's yourself it's queer weather we're gettin what do you say to it at all did you happen to notice hughie quigley's oats this morning they're just a livin wisp of destruction you might as well think to be puttin a reapin hook into the revels of an old rag mat 
and it's doin' so finely until the rain got lambasted in it. I be dad, and himself as sat up wid it as could be conceived, said Mrs. Kilfoyle. And small blame to him, poor man, for twas lookin' lovely, that smooth and greeny. It's the sort of colour one might fancy a linin' of to one's eyes, said Mrs. Bryan, rubbing her own, which the turf smoke made smart. "'Twas a dacentish little strip, said Bryan, but sure the man was a great fool to go plant the like. He might a known twould merely be destroyed on him. There's nothing to equal the wind and wet for devastating all before them when they get colloguin' together. I'm sure I dunno what pleasure anybody, said Mrs. McGurk, secretly attaching a definite idea to her indefinite pronoun, can take in ruinating a poor person's bit of property. If I was one now that had the mindin' of such things, and took notice of a little green field sittin' in the black of the bog, it's apter I'd be to let it have its chanced, at any rate, to ripen itself the best way it could, then go for to sluice the great dowsers of rain on top of it, and lave it all battered and bent into flither jigs like yon. Deed then, it's a pity to behold so it is, said Mrs. Kilfoyle, and as for pleasure, I see no signs of pleasure in it for anybody good or bad. It's like a sort of accident to my notion. Such a thing might happen ready enough if you come to consider the power of wet there does be streelin' about promiscuous over our heads sure them that has the controllin of it might easy slop down a sup too much of it on some little place without any harum intended the same as you might be after doin yourself when you're fillin a weeny jug out of a big can i wouldn't wonder now if that was the way of it, just an accident like, and no thoughts of ruinatin anything. It maybe might be, said Mrs. McGurk, staring ruefully through the thick quivering strands of rain, and apparently not much consoled by Mrs. Kilfoyle's teleology. But be dad, too, and make a great differ to the likes of us if there'd be a trifle more exact. I dunno, said Mrs. Kilfoyle. I'm none so sure it mightn't give one the idea that they had set their minds to managing such like concerns for us because it was the only thing for us they could be doing at all, and that it'd be a poor case. I'd a deal lifer think they were took up wit contrivin' us something better. Och, woman dear, if you had the grandest crops that ever grew, they wouldn't hinder you taking thought of them. You'll see it going about your fields no more while you're left in this world. Be dad no, said the widow McGurk. I'd chance it, said poor Mrs. Bryan, whose children were all alive, and if possible to be kept so. Do you see that there? Bryan said, crooking his thumb at a place where the rain had bored a new passage through the straw and scraws and was ticking down rhythmically in large, slow, sooty drops, like a self-constituted clepsydra. It's my belief the whole countryside's settled under a drip, the same as that bit of floor, so there's no sense in finding fault with any one for not keeping it dry. Brian looked cheered up by this little conceit, but the three women gazed rather blankly at the plashing drop as if they had been referred to, and were studying a difficult solution of the problem. They were interrupted by a summons from without, as peremptory sounding as a sudden clatter of hail on your window-pane. Mrs. Bryan! Mrs. Bryan! Mrs. Bryan, ma'am! Mrs. Quigley, who lived nearly opposite to the Kilfoyles, was calling from over the wet way, very audibly exasperated. I'll trouble you, ma'am, to speak to your Tim there. He's just after slapping a big sod of turf over the dyke into the middle of me chickens that went as near doing slaughter on half of them as ever I saw. The creatures were that terrified, I give you me word, they leapt up ten foot standing off 
of the ground. Chickens are in this carnal an occasionally convenient cause of war hostilities being sometimes commenced by an ostentatious sweeping out at your door of a neighbor's vagrant brood which when things were on a peace establishment would have pervaded the mud floor and pecked futilely for worms among the turf sods unforbidden the nine white fluff balls which represented mrs quigley's chickens had however recovered from their alarm and phenomenal acrobatic exertions and were bobbing about on the black mould under the feet of a high-stepping fatuously solemn fawn-covered hen tim quoth mrs bryan to a cluster of huddled together heads which were designing broken crottery works among the puddles at a short distance you'll sup sorrow with a spoon of grief if i hear of you doing anything again to mrs quigley's chickens and therewith the incident would have terminated amicably tim being happily indifferent to the prospect of that often threatened repast had not mrs quigley's still vibrating wrath moved her to say addressing nobody in particular begob it's a queer way some people has of bringing up their children to be mischievous little pests whatever they get to meddlin wit of course such a pointed thrust had to be parried so mrs bryant at once bawled with very distinct enunciation tim tim come in out of that there's a good boy and bring nora and biddy along wid you you've got decent rags of clothes on you to be spoiled with the wet not the scandalous old scarecrow dudeens that some i could name think good enough to be making shows of their children in i doubt myself but that an unbiased judge would have pronounced the respective wardrobes of the young quigleys and young kilfoyles to be much on a par however mrs quigley took the observation as it was meant and rejoined well then it's lucky for them if they've got anything decent about them at all for what else they would like to be gettin where they come from except ignorance and impudence is more than i can say the rising up of a quarrel in lisconnel is often as abrupt as the descent of a squall on a mountain lake so it was quite in the nature of such things that mrs bryan's next retort should be uncompromising in tone och and is it talkin you are of ignorance and imperience be the piper if it was that sort i was a-wantin i'd know right well where to go look for them so long as there was one of the quigleys anywheres around then mrs quigley said it's not troublin meself i am to be answerin the likes of yous and mrs mcgurk said maybe if you'd the sense you'd be pleased to get the chance of speakin to respectable people and mrs quigley said respectable how are you a phrase fraught in lisconnel with the most blighting sarcasm and added that it would be a thankful mercy if some old women could leave interfering in other people's concerns alone and then mrs mcgurk and mrs bryan simultaneously requested one another to listen to the fine gabbin she was having out of her that day as for old mrs kilfoyle who loved peace and whose frail thread of voice could not in any case have availed much in an engagement carried on at so long a range she only clacked softly to herself like a discomfited blackbird and ever and anon admonished her friends to come in with themselves and never mind argufying while her son brian sitting serenely aloof from the fray intimated to her by knowing winks and grimaces his masculine disdain for such a strife of tongues in which however he was agreeably aware that his wife could efficiently uphold the family cause the road at this place is of considerable width broad enough to accommodate across it a system of five or six puddles of apple size and the wind ruffling straight down it although like an honest umpire inclining to neither belligerent did whisk away the point of some scathingly hurled 
epigrams in a manner which helped to discourage both parties mrs quigley had on the whole the worst of it which was no disgrace to her seeing that she had been obliged to quit the shelter of her eaves in order to come within screeching distance and had moreover fought single-handed since himself although at home remained supinely indoors and only gave her the meagre moral support derivable from fitful muffled bellows which might have meant almost anything but the sharpness of the contention may be inferred from the fact that when routed ostensibly by a heavier downpour she scuttered off towards her dwelling the last utterance which she gave to the wet winds was may the devil sail away with the half of you's and that the next blast bore rather beyond its mark the antiphonal response and may he sail away with you too ma'am lisconnel soaked on undisturbed and unlivened for some time after this but it was destined to have two more sensations before the day finally closed in the sun had imperceptibly sunk and it was raining harder than ever most ungovernably huey quigley said when all at once something happened in the western sky it was as if some vast tent rope had suddenly been snapped for the dark riftless cloud canopy seemed not so much to abruptly rise as to actually recoil back with a swing up from the horizon's verge and ere one had well realized that it had begun to lift it was flying eastward scudding in festoons and trails and shreds or furled into rumpled bundles in the grip of the careering blasts it left behind its spaces of marvellously limpid loff blue and sea green just deep enough for the present to drown out the stars and low along the dusky purple earth rim the sun's fiery wake was still traced through a haze as of amber seething foam reflections of this were caught glimmeringly in shallow pools or on the wet faces of rocks superseding the twilight with a dim golden radiance which stole over the landscape like the fitting sequel to a gorgeous sundown five minutes after the first rent in the clouds lisconnel looked as if it had been basking all day under the beams of a stainless heaven and might count upon spending the morrow in the same fashion these rapid transformations are not of rare occurrence here among wide levels and open sky reaches where the wild west wind is a very deft scene shifter however so little else does happen and so much generally depends upon the weather that their repetition seldom falls flat now everybody looked out interestedly and said that the evening seemed holding up a bit and thus it chanced that several persons decried Ari rafferty ass and comrade returning sooner than had been expected and by an unusual route across the bog Ari rafferty is a man of whom his acquaintances say och bedad it's himself the old boy that's in it their tone when thus summing up his character is half self-congratulatory and half envious as if they felt that the ability to duly appreciate the extreme wiliness of him was in itself something as much perhaps as they could lawfully wish and yet did leave them something unattainable to desire i am not aware that he has ever performed any feat remarkable enough to justify their excessively high opinion of his shrewdness and i fancy that his reputation is one of those which are secure against overthrow because they rest upon nothing in particular he lived at this time in the cabin which stands back from the road near the o'driscoll's ruins and he had lately become the owner of a small turf-coloured ass rather to the disgust of some neighbours who found her energetic grazing trench upon the limited browsing grounds of their goats their dissatisfaction however was abated by the knowledge of the uses for which he kept the beast no secret in lisconnel though etiquette 
prescribed its treatment as such. That knowledge made everybody eager to learn why he had brought this load of turf round by the back of the ridge, instead of straight across the strip between it and the road. But Adi did not choose to satisfy the curiosity. He had in truth made the detour for reasons which he could have no possible object in concealing, but as if his redundant guile sought for supererogatory works, he enveloped the fact in a veil of mystery, which by satyr-like leers and grins he admonished his companions, Tom Ryan and young O'Byrne, not to lift. He himself set them the example of baffling inquiries with the evasive answers fashionable among us, such as, Och, that's the chat now, or, There's where the night fell on you, or, Begob, if you knew that and had your supper, you might go to bed. This reticent attitude he maintained inexorably all the way to the top of the hill, for they were only passing through Lisconnel, their destination being Dan O'Burns near Duffclane. And if I know Oddy, he thoroughly enjoyed his progress as he stumped along beside his meek Jinny, saying blandly, Get on, old woman, we must be steppin' it, whenever his escorting friends waxed particularly urgent and eager in their questioning. But when the knock on lay behind them, and the neighbors had dropped off discontentedly, he called his sons, Paddy and Luke, who were still following, and bade them run home, and bid their mother to be looking out for him about noon the next day. And you may tell her, lads, he added, that if you hadn't went round back of the rising ground, we'd a got bogged up to the neck with the swamps there do be all about where the streams after overflowing itself. And look a paddy, if you're the wit, you might be telling her that the reason we come home to-day instead of to-morrow was because themselves over beyond had took a notion they'd a chance of receiving company presently, and were wishful to get the place readied up and cleared out in a manner beforehand. Sure, one must humour the women a bit, he explained to Tom and young O'Byrne. The wife would be as uneasy as an old hen on a hot griddle all the while I was gone, if she didn't think she knew the rights of it. Me sister-in-law was real mad that I wouldn't be telling her, Tom Ryan said complacently. Leppin she was. Let her lep, said Oddy. Chapter 5 Got the Better Of It seems advisable to explain without further delay the nature of Oddy Rafferty's calling, lest some hints which have been dropped should mislead you into supposing Lisconnel implicated in transactions more nefarious than is really the case. Nor could I otherwise fulfil a half-promise to relate what became of his ass, Jinny. The truth, briefly stated, is that he employed her in conveying earthenware jars of poteen, from a certain wholly illicit still off away in the bog to O'Byrne, the blacksmith's forge near Duffclane, an establishment which I fear must be described as little better than a shebeen. Happily it is not necessary for me, in a plain narrative of facts, to pass judgment upon Oddie's actions, or to inquire whether it be an extenuating or an aggravating circumstance that he committed them more for the pleasure of the incidental excitement than for the sake of any pecuniary profits thence accruing which were indeed very small for although this still which i believe continues to prosper turns out many gallons of the real creature few of them flow towards duffclane most of them go in the first instance on board quaint little carras and pucons stationed in sundry creeks and inlets and thus arrive at various villages along the nook shutton coast as far as to kempport itself oddy's 
carrion trade was therefore done on a limited scale and sometimes hardly made good the expense of jinny's keep if he had regarded the matter from a purely business point of view but he valued it chiefly as a congenial pursuit giving scope to his acknowledged acuteness and a stirring spirit of enterprise which made more everyday avocations irksome to him his long family supplied much more labor than was needed for the cultivation of his bit of land and the cutting of his turf and albeit he entertained but a humble opinion of its members intelligence he willingly entrusted them with the execution of those humdrum tasks and gave himself to higher things he found all the details of the undertaking more or less enjoyable each successfully accomplished transit of the wild bog track was for him pervaded with a flattering sense of having got the better of somebody a thing he loved to do and each arrival mostly in the moth-coloured dusk at the black mouth of dan o'burn's scarlet-hearted forge was a triumphant moment to be anticipated from afar the way he went is long and monotonous enough to need some such inward enlivening i have never ascertained the sight of the still with any accuracy just knowing vaguely that to get there you strike out into the bog northward from lisconnel and proceed until its surface begins to heave and fall in undulations which forerun the mountainous coastline even much minuter directions would scarcely guide one to the intricately situated shelling which doubtless seems the innocent turf bank and only by a faint puff of blue smoke betrays the worm beneath but it must be a full day's journey distant when that journey is measured by the gingerly steps of a little ass and to spend a whole day in profitably breaking the law and defiantly defrauding the revenue was worth a great deal of trudging Oddie rafferty did not however run by any means so many risks as might have been expected on these journeys nor were his strategical abilities after all put into much requisition this is clear from the fact that for several years he habitually brought his poteen over the bog and along the duffclane road under the transparently inartificial pretence of convoying a load of turf now no rational person could seriously suppose dan o'beirne in the least likely to send a matter of twenty miles for the fuel which grew at his door and therefore it may be assumed that anybody who was taken in by the device was so with his own good will indeed except for the name of the thing as people whispered at lisconnel Oddie might almost as well have forborne to pile up the brown fibred sods over the paler drab jars whose contents any one who chose might have heard gurgling as they joggled along however the omission would have slightly diminished his own gratification and increased the embarrassments of sergeant boyd the truth is that duffclane at this time was constabularily speaking under the charge of a very portly and placid king log sergeant boyd and the four or five subordinates who shared with him the whitewashed iron police hut erected on the shore of the little rushy ended loch near the village were as unaggressive easy-going a set of men as you could wish to see patrolling in couples at the regulation rate or more commonly sitting in the face of all regulations with the solace of a pipe on some wayside bank or wall and as such they found in duffclane quarters greatly to their mind so much so that once when they were accidentally overlooked by the authorities at the season of periodical shiftings and left unremoved they entered no protest against the blunder but stayed on unrepiningly 
at the back of beyant to the satisfaction of all parties concerned easily though he went however the sergeant liked a little conviviality as well as other people and not seldom put in an appearance at the forge of an evening when dan o'beirne's club had gathered about his glowing flame bank often the most cheering feature in the landscape for many a murky mile round on these occasions nobody with a spark of honourable feeling beneath his invisible green tunic would have dreamed of making the remotest allusion to the antecedents of the fragrant amber-brown droop which was sure to be forthcoming in a thick-lipped glass and indeed nothing could have appeared further from sergeant boyd's wishes it is said that once when audie rafferty by an untoward mishap let a full gallon jar slip off jenny's back from among the deceptive sods and smash itself on a stone actually splashing the sergeant's boots with its criminating contents the sergeant instantly turned and fled away down the road at the double as if he heard high treason and blue murder and every sort of diversion you please yallahoolin for him round the corner but i cannot certify the truth of this anecdote of course this state of things could not continue indefinitely burly sergeant boyd departed to another station taking with him the character unofficial of a decent good-natured man and his successor was of a different type acting sergeant clark had an aspiring mind and was a thirst for distinction he dreamed sometimes of a district inspectorship and then always awoke with strong views as to the expediency of repressing crime now at remote little duffclane the one field which gives any promise of materials for a creditable monthly report is the shebeening by sergeant boyd so wilfully ignored alert and experienced the new officer was quick to grasp the fact and to perceive signs that the unlawful pursuit had long been followed in the district on a somewhat extensive scale and with an audacity fostered by his predecessor's remissness if not convivance accordingly he lost no time in casting about for the means of promptly effecting an important seizure which might prove a short cut to promotion thenceforth in imaginative meditations he continually saw himself upsetting tubs of seething wash confiscating plant and marching disconcerted prisoners over the bog to the nearest barracks tidings of this regrettable change made their way in due course to lisconnel but sergeant clark knew better than to display any overt activity and at first the rumours ran dimly to the effect that the new lot down below at the police hut were queer old ones and no ways to be depended upon the resultant danger had come as we shall see very close indeed before it took a clearer shape End of section three. Section four of Irish Idols by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section four. One mackerel skied September afternoon. Audie Rafferty halted at his own door on his way to O'Byrne's and annoyed his wife a good deal by letting Jinny the ass drink up a bucket full of water which she had just fetched from a neighbouring pool. Audie had by this time owned Jinny for nearly three years and had conceived an extraordinary high opinion of her. I declare to goodness, the figure and dying you have with that beast mrs rafferty protested bangs all couldn't you as well ha been givin her a drink out of the water goin by it instead of settin her to gulp up the sup i was after gettin to put the pitaties in 
it's disgusting to see you making a fool of her as if she was a human creature Ody indeed had a habit of disadvantageously contrasting his family faculties mental and moral with those of jenny which perhaps added a tang of bitterness to his wife's tone he now said be the hokey it's herself has more gumption and comprehension in her than half of yous all rolled together she's not the fool anyway to be drinking out of water pools thick would them black water asks let it lip down your throat as soon as look at you and that's what mary ann and jim and the rest of them's after this minute i noticed them coming along this as ody may have expected sent his wife speeding off to drag away the children from those reptilian perils and he continued molly there stir your stumps and run to be pullin her a few wisps of the long grass under the dyke afore we're jiggin on again but molly did not run for at this moment paddy a younger brother bolted in among them with awful tidings the new sergeant and a pair of strange constables was about a couple of miles down the duffclane lane hiding out of sight behind some furze bushes and clumps of broom to wait for some people and an ass coming by paddy had slipped near them unbeknownst and had gathered this much from their discourse whereupon being despite his father's disparagements not devoid of mother wit he had skited home at full speed to intercept and warn the destined victims of the ambuscade Adi was very loath to accept this sinister report partly because it augured so ill for the future prospects of his trade and partly because if it were true he had been saved from a snare by a person of metal gifts far inferior to his own which to some minds is ever a harrowing admission not to be smoothed over by any applications of the lion and the mouse an apologue with which Oddy, however was not probably acquainted he sought consequently to postpone the evil moment of conviction by pronouncing paddy's story not only incredible but incomprehensible and continued to asservate with heat that he'd divil a bit of a notion that the boostoon was blatherin' thereabout until his wife his daughter tom ryan and mrs mcgurk had each severally rehearsed the statement to him succinctly and clearly enough to preclude further persistence in that subterfuge och well then he said at last reluctantly and tacitly abandoning his sceptical attitude what did you say them chaps were exactly doin the time you come away a sittin in a hape under the hollow o the bank quoth paddy passin the remark that them lads might be comin along any time now the fat-faced one did be slippin two sixpenny bits and a shillin in and out of his pocket and him with the black whiskers had somethin eatin cheese it might be but just the last thing the sergeant he ups and cocks his chin agin the top edge o the bank and was squintin through the furze bush with the little eyes of him like an old ferret and says he we've a grand view down a stretch of the road from this so as we can step over convenient and stop them afore they know where they've got to and meanwhile says he with a great dirty grin on his face we're as agreeable here as need be and not cramped up the way we was that time at the bridge says he so i legged it off with myself and there i left them devil sweep them all i'd love to be throwin stones and clay at them said molly rafferty meditatively begorra then i'll be very apt to be givin them a clout on the head if they try interferin with me said tom ryan who was oddy rafferty's confederate on this day's expedition the sentiment was approved by all the gossoons of any size and some of extremely little who were within hearing many of them capered and said hurrah to our souls and others plucked
Tom's ragged sleeves, saying in hoarse whispers, Let's come along then, ha, do now. The cropped heads rapidly sorted themselves from the shawled ones, and converged as if something drew them towards a centre, while the women and girls began to stand round with open mouths and eyes. In short, Lisconnel got up the symptoms of a miniature rising with a creditable celerity, considering that nearly all its able-bodied men were away harvesting down below. A person who still wore petticoats and was not yet fully five years old might have been heard to remark with confidence, sure we'll drive the pack of them before us, but Ody Rafferty was of an age to recognize all this as wildness. Och, get along with you, Tom, he said, and wished talkin' foolish about clappin' the police. It's no thing to go do unless you put to it entirely. We'll get the better of them yet, one way or the other, but it won't be by walkin' straight down their treacherous throats, which is what they're intendin'. I'll just be unloadin' me sods and things off of the poor ass and let her get her bit of grazin' in place. She'll go no further this evenin' back in me hand to the lot of them the boys below will have to do without their drop to-night if they're dependent on me one of you's just run up the hill he commanded when jinny was nearly unladen and be keeping a lookout down the road for afraid them thieves of mischief might happen to come slingin in on top of us and then i'll take and slip me a couple of jars in among the growth of rushes under the edge Och, no, you great gomeral, not there to be startin' out, you may say, at every one go on the road. The edge of the hole over there alongside of the big stack, it's none too deep, and they'll lie there handy till we get another chance. Lave liftin' them, Biddy. Don't any of yous be meddlin' with them at all. Mush a long life to the old sergeant. I hope he'll get his health this night till he sees us comin' by. It was Stacy Doyne who hindered the carrying out of these prudent plans. While the whiskey jars were still lying at the Rafferty's door, she ran up in great dismay. Lisconnel had gone through a season of sickness, the early summer fasts having been followed by an outbreak of fever, from an attack of which Stacy's mother was recovering. But she remained very low and feeble, and this evening had been taking weaknesses in a manner which frightened her daughter out of her wits. "'I don't know what to be at with her,' said Stacy. "'She's that wake-like, and never a bit of a thing can I persuade her to touch. I've tried her with a sup of milk Mrs. McGurk gave me, and a drink of fresh water, and a wee taste of a maley potato, and that's all I have, but she won't do much as look at them.' I'm afeard she's real bad, and the lads away on us down below. So when I saw all of yous up here, I just took a run out to tell you the way she was. Stacy was so miserably anxious and scared that all the lines which would be fixed on her face a dozen years hence came out, as invisible writing does at a flame, and made its youth haggard. All her neighbors commiserated and said, Ah, the creature, but Oddy Rafferty had something more practical to offer. I tell you what it is, he said, taking up one of the jars. It's a sup of this your mother wants, and a sup of this she'll get. Nor a woman, run in and fetch the old corkscrew out of the press and bring a mug or something along. You'll just make her swally a good drop of that, Stacy, like it or no, and you'll soon see she'll be better for it. Och, bedad, it's not a right Irish woman she'd be if she a wouldn't. Look now at the colour of that. There's an eye of the sun gleaming through it. She'll feel herself able enough for her bit of hot potato once you've heartened her up that way, aitin all before her she'll be, and the next thing we'll hear tell of her she'll be dancing jigs like a three-year-old. Musha, sure the strongest person ever stepped will be taking a bad turn now and again. Just run away home wid it to her, Stacy Jewel, and don't be frettin' yourself, for there's no fear but she'll 
over it finally in next to no time praise the lord god reward you Audie rafferty said stacy with the fervent gratitude which we feel towards anyone who loosens the grip on us of a torturing fear for she was as much reassured by this flow of eloquence as by the possession of the purple speckled delft pint mug tucked away carefully under the corner of her shawl may the blessing of heaven above shine on you faith it's praying for you all i'll be to the last day of me life if it does her a benefit then stacy hurried home and as most of the neighbors went off with her to superintend the administration of Adi's remedy or to prescribe others of their own there was no visible reason why he should not have proceeded to fulfil his intentions respecting the jars of poteen reasons indeed were perhaps afloat on the air in the form of microscope baffling particles but whether or no what followed certainly tends to confirm the truth of a saying we have at lisconnel that it's a deal easier to draw the cork out of a full bottle of whisky than to put it in again tom said oddy as the patter of the bare feet died away and nothing was heard save the rhythmical munches of jinny browsing between the furze bushes we'd find something handier for taking a sup out of if we stepped inside when some three-quarters of an hour later mrs rafferty came home with a report that mrs doyne was finding herself a good trifle stronger she at once perceived what had taken place tom ryan a weak-headed youth was far past making any pretence of keeping up appearances he simply sat against the wall near the door and hardly woke up sufficiently to say between violent nods um wha when addressed sarcastically as an illigant specimen sittin there lookin about as sensible as an old blind cow caught in a shower of hail Adi, on the contrary, seemed even more wide awake and sententious than usual. Yet his wife, who knew his ways, viewed him with suspicions, which proved not unfounded. At first, however, only a few casual remarks passed between them. Then he rose, clapped down the cork of the open jar with the palm of his hand, and said, It's time for me to be steppin'. "'Is it putting them away you'd be?' inquired Mrs. Rafferty. "'Time it is for that, bedad. "'I don't know what you may call putting them away. "'I'm a-going to take of this one that has nary a sup out of it "'along down to the police hut at Dufclane, if that's what you mean. "'The great goodness deliver us, Oddy. "'What was that you were saying? "'Didn't I say it plain? "'Is it stupid the woman's grown? "'To the police hut, I said.' Wasn't that Gomeral Paddy up here a while ago with the order? Something he said about leaving it down at the turn of the road for themselves to be fetching it home, but likely that was just a botch he was making of the matter. That's no way to be delivering of goods. It's to their door I'll bring it decent, and more betoken paid for it I'll be afore I quit. A gallon of as grand stuff as ever was poured in a glass." it's something be jabbers to be the police these times givin their orders for what's a long sight too good for the likes of them however there's money no worse than respectable people's mrs rafferty stood aghast discerning full well what had befallen among the most mischievous and unmanageable effects of drink taken is the supervening in the patient of some fixed hallucination which leaves his general faculties unimpaired or rather furbished up and wetted to aid him ruinously in pursuing whatever demented line of conduct his delusion may dictate to this affection Oddie was upon occasion subject and it now appeared that his potations of the strong new whisky had already conjured up in his mind a grotesque figment which derived its substance from paddy's story of the police ambuscade distorted out of all shape into a phantom uncannily well adapted for inveigling him straight into the trap a will-o'-the-wisp luring him over the bog with its goblin glade 
could scarcely land him in a more critical position than his would be should he present himself at the barracks or the place where the police lay in wait with a gallon of poteen avowedly in his possession and such a fate he was evidently resolved to court experience had taught mrs rafferty that under these circumstances to argue or remonstrate was very bootless so she could not look blankly from one daughter's face to the other's and it neither found any more counsel or comfort than in the spectacle of tom's witlessly bobbing head her husband began with cheerful whistling to adjust and tighten the hay bands wound above the tops of his wrinkled brogues boys she said in a solemn whisper to a pair of small rafferty gossoons who were at the door run in hurusha the old ass a bit down the bog afore he comes out she's grazing there behind the stack twill delay him a while hootin and catchin her she continued transferring the whisper to her girls but they all felt it was only a desperate and temporary expedient look at that object now said Otty, pausing at the door to eye tom's collapse with calm disdain one might suppose he was after taking the full of loch inna you'd better just douse a pail of water over him and let him wake up and roll home and how are you going to manage along wit only yourself and the ass insinuated mrs rafferty catching at a last straw aisy you haven't the sense to comprehend that when you're doin jobs for the beastly police you've no need for anybody runnin on ahead to look round corners and the like wisht gabbin woman alive and don't be showin off your ignorance he left his wife crushed though not in the way he imagined Oddie had to spend a considerable time in catching Jinny, as the boys had done their harooshing with much enthusiasm. He returned from the pursuit in an ill humour, which he vented by accusing his family of having moved the whisky jars on the table, and he stowed away the partially empty one in a recess by the hearth, breathing out grim threats of vengeance, should he find that anybody had meddled with it during his absence perhaps too his racing and scrambling and shouting at jinny's coquettishly flourished heels had slightly confused his ideas at any rate the bystanders exchanged significant glances when they saw him carefully fasten a single small turf sod over the jar tied on the ass's back a proceeding absurd considered as a ruse and furthermore inconsistent with his own account of his errand little luke quigley a daring spirit whose mother was continually exhorting him in admiring accents not to be a bold boy ventured to inquire and did the police order that grand loden of turf from you too oddy rafferty but oddy held imperturbably on his way if anything less crab-gated than usual and with a preternaturally knowing expression you might as well have attempted to turn back the sun of the sky his wife said as she ruefully watched him over the hill by sunset that evening the air had grown misty and chilly and the police party down at the bend of the road had begun to weary of their long watch constable mckenna had left off jingling his loose coins and was listlessly shelling furze seeds constable flynn had finished his bread and cheese and sergeant clark found it harder and harder to keep his mind patiently fixed on the important disclosures which would probably result from the capture of this convoy they observed at ever shorter intervals they had a right to have been here by now but nothing appeared except the dusk and at last the sergeant said according to informations i made sure they'd be passin along this way to-night but they'd be no use stayin where we are after dark for they'd not be likely to leave themselves that late startin from the place above we'll just chance it flynn do you go cautious as far as the lump of rock yonder 
and see if there's a sign of anything comin' further up the road. If there's not, we may as well be clearin' out of this. Constable Flynn was soon in sight again, returning in a succession of ducks and dives, which indicated the proximity of some party whose observation was to be eluded. Yes, he's comin' along, he said. Leastwise, I'm sure it's himself, a low-sized, black-lookin' feller, with legs, a thought bandy, and a little brown ass. Ay, that's Oddy Rafferty, said the sergeant, and an old lad, I'm given to understand. But the queer part of it is, said Constable Flynn, what way do you suppose he's got it done up? The jar's just cocked on the beast's back, with a little dab of something about the size of your fist stuck atop of it, by way of coverin' belike. But bedad, it won't put us to much inconvenience searchin' the load, and he trampin' alongside, lookin' as satisfied with himself as if he was deceivin' the nations around. The man must be a half fool. He might be after takin' a drop of it, and not be altogether himself, suggested Constable McKenna. There's there a side of it on him, then. He's stompin' along as steady as a bench of judges. And he's got nobody else with him? Divil a side of a soul but himself. Would you like to know what the English of that is, then? said the sergeant, after brief reflection. It's just a plant. A dodge they're up to. You may bet your boots it is. They've set on the old chap by himself to humbug us with the notion that he's the whole set of them instead of which to my certain knowledge there was to be at the least a couple more of them in this affair and while we're took up discoursin him and arrestin him and at the heel of the hunt findin very belike that he's got nothin in his old jaw but a sup of sour buttermilk or some such trash to be risin the laugh on us the others are schamin to make off by some manner of route marchin on this side or that of us with the stuff we're looking for fixed up neat and tasty may be in pottles of rushes by way of salmon i've seen that stratagem employed down by loch carib or goodness can tell what description of devilment so as they'll be givin us the slip sure it stands to reason tisn't for the want of a better contrivance they'd ever come foolin down the road that fashion they wouldn't a played such a tom noddy trick except on a set purpose you may depend troth it's yourself as got the head on your shoulders sergeant said constable flynn then what are you thinking to do at all inquired constable mckenna well that must be partly accordin i'll step out and have a word with him as he comes by and then if to my judgment it seems to be the way i'm supposin faith i'll just let him go along with himself i'll not so far gratify him as to have him makin a fool o me and delayin us from attendin to the right boys we mayn't have much chance o nabbin them if they've took off at loose ends through the bog in this light like so many wire worms slitherin in the crevices of a clod of clay but we must scatter ourselves and do the best we can anyhow we'd get no satisfaction only annoyance at a dealin with this old concern that's comin here when therefore oddy rafferty and jinny reached that point of the road sergeant clark had to be passed by as he examined his boot fastenings with a preoccupied air and merely looked up to remark civilly it's a fine evening getting a trifle duskish for travellin by this time oddy can scarcely have been in his best form intellectually speaking as we may conclude from the fact that he pulled up and replied with a wink which even through the dim twilight appeared egregious ay it's not too great an illumination we're gettin whatever but the devil drink up the hapworth i've along wid me here that it interest you for to be inspectin sergeant not if you'd the height o noonday to be doin it by sure not at all said the sergeant with polite deprecation why would you but you're not distressin the little ass any way with the size of the load you're puttin on her be gob no it's long sorry i'd be to be givin her such treatment nor yet to be disedifying her character so to speak with lettin her carry anything that's contrary to regulations so you perceive sergeant 
I can't offer you as much as a drapeen to fill your flask, me, me hero of war, if you happen to have it about you. Ay, now's no time to be talking to drops, said the sergeant, to whom this overdone imbecility seemed exactly the snare into which he had set his face against falling. I've got to go about my business. We're distributing poor law notices, and so good evening to you. Adi jogged on again, feeling confusedly that the interview had somehow been a failure. He had omitted to do or to say something that he had intended, but what he could not at all determine. And the thought bothered him so much that when he had gone a mile or two further he sat down by the roadside to consider the point at leisure, while Jenny thriftily twitched herself up wispy mouthfuls of bent grass from among the broom clumps by the light of a drifting moon. The police, for their part, continued to patrol and look out and lie dispersedly in ambush, according to the most approved methods, in the hope of surprising his accomplices, who, of course, were nowhere to be found. At length they gave it up, began to return home, crestfallen, and rather disposed to regret that they had let their first and only take slip out of the meshes sergeant clark had perhaps overreached himself by his crafty manoeuvre so when they presently came in sight of jinny grazing beside her drowsy master it seemed to them like a not to be expected repetition of an omitted opportunity and even the sergeant felt that to again neglect it were now almost a tempting of providence adi himself confirmed this impression for roused by a centurion cough from constable mckenna which affrighted the stillness further than a rifle crack would have done at noon he started up and turned hurriedly to drive his beast off the road into the bog he was three parts asleep and did so from mere force of habit but sergeant clark read in the action a consciousness of guilt and at once gave the signal for pursuit they had to skirt round a patch of swamp, and Adi, urging Jinny on with strange oaths and endearments, had covered some perilous ground before they overtook him. Flight and chase were alike hasty and ill-considered, and had an end natural enough when people blunder hot-foot through a wet bit of bog by the uncertain glimpses of a moon, who flickers out and in and out fitfully like a defectively constructed revolving light Adi rafferty and jinny and sergeant clark all tumbled head foremost over the edge of a deepish bog hole if they had happened on one of those rarely occurring black crevasses with smooth ruthless looking walls and a flooring of murky glimmer which after a few widening rings have melted away will rest placid and unbetraying above whatever lies beneath the chances are that they would still be there testing the conservative properties of bog water the accident however was not so tragical the hole into which adi and his companions had fallen was a hollow of inartificial formation with low broken banks at one end where amid much splashing and bawling they were all brought to land a thorough drenching and a dazed recollection of some hideous struggling moments were the immediate consequences to the two men. But Jinny, having dislocated her neck, was quite dead. This twofold shock restored Adi to his sober senses, though under the circumstances he could hit upon nothing more effectual to do with them than sit gloomily glowering at the limp brown body. Jinny was killed on him, and he had ignominiously delivered himself into the power of the enemy. The situation shattered even his self-confidence. Sergeant Clark, on the other hand, was, for the time, being reduced to a state of anguish incapacity, so that the conduct of affairs devolved upon Constable McKenna. Be the powers of smoke, it seems to me you'd all be the better of a taste of spirits, supposing there was such a thing contiguous, he said, as he cut the strings which bound the whiskey jar then he uncorked it and took a mouthful intending to pass on the jar but instead of doing so he let it drop 
with a profane splutter and an agonized grimace both were in a measure excusable for on a chill breathing night a wet and muddy man could scarcely imbibe a more comfortless draught than one composed of soapy water flavoured with sour goat's milk what old dishwashing is it at all said constable flynn watching the bluish white stream gurgle out of the recumbent jar the sergeant was too shivery to point out the accuracy of his conjectures the wife it must a been said oddy in a tone of concentrated bitterness she'll ha been after doin that on me while i was catchin miss fortunate jinny there she got the better of me bedad and the poor ass that was the only soul among the lot of us here with a reasonable thought in her mind must go for to be breakin of her neck and drowndin of herself dead ach yes the wife got greatly the better of me this time these two circumstances long remained a theme of galling and regretful memories to oddy rafferty i believe he was but slightly consoled by his own narrow escape from getting into trouble or even by the fact that sergeant clark after being laid up for weeks with a bad rheumatic attack exchanged to another station and has not so far had an equally energetic successor at duffclane mrs rafferty was dutiful enough to make profession in public of regret at jinny's demise but she said in confidence to a friend it's a loss on us in course howsomever there's no denying that himself had one tormented wit the willabaloo he made over her while she was to the fore sure poor man he's simple like when he gets a foolish notion in his head i wish himself could have heard her chapter six herself it is a dozen years or more since anybody except some small wild bird or beast has occupied the o'driscoll's cabin whose ruins may be traced beside the bit of road between the Kilfoyles and Big Anne's, and it is much longer since one would have supposed it fit for even human habitation. But originally it was in some respects a better dwelling than any other in Lisconnel, being constructed of dense, chinkless mud instead of loosely cohering stones. For John O'Driscoll, who acted as his own architect and mason, could not abide the thoughts of any building material other than what he had been used to before he moved on compulsion northwards and he gave himself no small additional labour in order to carry his point rushes for thatch he was fain to put up with but he was certain that no people would ever get their health inside of them unnatural cold stone walls and the mud ones were undoubtedly warmer and more weather-tight his neighbours on the other hand always maintained that the want of the preliminary clearance effected by the necessary collection for building purposes was what caused his little bit of field to be so many degrees more infested with boulders than their own which look hopeless enough heaven knows but it is in reality a worse strip of ground a mere skin of soil over the bleached limestone skeleton underneath scarcely thicker than the sheet of paper on which the land agent wrote his rent receipt for the wistfully counted out shillings and small grimy note i do not wonder that this holding has never yet found another tenant and so wholly obliterated are all signs of the o'driscoll's long struggle against its sterile curse that at the present day you might as reasonably regarded as a site for a stone quarry as for a potato plot a potato plot it had to be however through many a toilsome season though it adapted itself to this inappropriate end with so bad a grace that people who are no strangers to phenomena of the kind used yet to marvel how the o'driscolls reared their children on it at all their own account of the matter was that they made a shift somehow what with one thing and another and i believe that both one thing and another 
would, if analyzed, have turned out to be chiefly herself, as everyone called Mrs. O'Driscoll, giving her the title which is commonly bestowed on the mistress of a household, but which is used with a special emphasis when she forms its mainspring and moving spirit. She was a fair, buxom woman of a physique not unusual in Lisconnel, whose inhabitants are indeed very seldom fat and well-liking. The small children, it is true, are agreeably round and plump, but they roll out quickly once they grow to be any size, and are soon recognizable only by the dark grey or violet blue eyes, which have become melancholy instead of impish. In fact, the young people of Lisconnel always make me think of Chaucer's poor scholar, who looked holwa and thereto soberly. The older people are not less lean, but as a rule somewhat cheerier of aspect, partly perhaps for just the reasons that make their juniors grave. So herself, with her gracious curves and soft apple and pear blossom colouring and rich golden threaded brown hair, came upon you among her neighbour's Spanish black tresses and slender, if not gaunt, forms as something of a surprise. She would have made an ideal farmer's wife on a farm of deep grassed green meadows and clover-scented pastures, where she might have queened it over curds and cream, but she never had the management of a larger dairy than was supplied by the milk of a solitary goat, and her other possessions were in proportion. Certainly no woman could have made more of whatever property accrued to her so perhaps it was only fair that she should be very poor, though as the aim of all her industry and contrivance was the welfare of other persons, it is on altruistic grounds justifiable to wish that she had been better off. I do not know at what time of her life she passed a self-renouncing ordinance, but whenever it may have been she was unaided by that apathetic placidity of temperament which makes it easy for some of us to renounce, if not ourselves, at any rate our nearest neighbours. She was full of energy and enterprise, and had the intuitive deftness of brain and hand, which belongs almost exclusively to such women, enabling them to evolve their ingenious designs with as little visible effort and preparation as a flower shows in unfolding. This quality, by the way, is what has put into the heads of men who can, as a rule, set about nothing without clumsy thinking processes, the delusion that they do all the world's inventing. The contrivances of herself were manifold and wonderful, considering the resources at her command. Some of them were imitated by her neighbors, and will I dare say survive among their descendants when her name and story have long been forgotten. For instance, she once fashioned for her little daughter, who had a cut foot, a pair of shoes of plaited rushes, lined with the silky flocked down of the bog cotton, and carefully assorted feathers collected from the haunts of the hens. These turned out a great success, and at the present day you may now and then see a Lisconnel child with such footgear, probably not quite so dexterously shaped and put together, or so patiently renewed as were little Molly O'Driscoll's. Of rushes, too, she wove the curious hanging screens, which for many a winter protected old Mrs. Kilfoyle from the worst of the draughts, sighing through her profusely cranied walls. But the art of weaving them so thickly as to be impervious to almost any shrewd breathing gust has died with herself it was she who taught the children an elaborate game still i believe peculiar to lisconnel preparations for which consisting of small alternately black and white piles of peats and stones set a row with mysterious lines traced between may be spied on smooth bits of ground along the road yet after all invention is not creation and nothing short of that could have made the o'driscoll's lot other than a hard one 
in such barren places had their lines fallen and at last herself undertook a task which proved beyond her powers and imagined a device which she was not able to perform when she first came to lisconnel she was quite a young woman and it is my belief that she would never have grown old if she could have kept her five children about her but to do this would have been in itself almost as great a marvel as the discovery of an elixir of life of course the family broke up michael the eldest son enlisted and only came home once just before his regiment sailed for the cape his blue and gold were beautiful to look upon and set the children marching to and fro for weeks after with a tin can drum when they came towards his mother's door she bribed them with hoarsely creaking whistles which she had a knack of making out of hollow hemlock stalks to go away with their martial music in the opposite direction and not long afterwards the elder of the two girls got married however she did not go to any formidable distance and there were still jack and terence and rose left at home then began a series of bad seasons in the course of which the married daughter emigrated with her husband and wrote home word as well as one could make out by means of conjectural emendations that the states was not too queer to live in and they all had their healths finely glory be to god after that letter the states and the possibility of resorting thither was much talked of under the o'driscoll's roof at first herself joined in the discussions with a sparkle in her eyes for she was not in years more than middle-aged and in heart and hope younger perhaps than any of them leaving the old country would no doubt be very sad crossing the ocean rather terrible but they would all be together and it was miserable work to see the children looking so starved and perished molly too would be there to meet them the states as mapped out in the o'driscoll's minds was about the size of the town down beyant where you could scarcely miss any one you were looking out for if you streeled around a bit and who could tell but that mick might be there or thereabouts it stood to reason that they could not be very far asunder when they were both in foreign parts herself began to weave plans as busily as a linnet weaves its nest in the spring and her thoughts went out into the future as undauntedly as a swallow starts on a migration but one day her husband spoke half a dozen words which suddenly stopped all her hoping and planning as a small bird's flight is stopped by the blow of a stone he said something which showed that he had no intention of leaving lisconnel and that he nevertheless assumed the children would go this sentence was the result of a sharp engagement between his conscience and his wishes doubtfully the battle stood complete victory for his conscience would have been agreement to go for his wishes a denunciation of the whole project in strong terms which he knew would ensure its abandonment so he only attained to a compromise and even that had been dearly won john o'driscoll was many years older than his wife and hard work and harder fare what there was of it had aged his tall gaunt frame before its time perhaps he knew instinctively that he could not bear transplantation but at any rate he knew without need of instinct what days of desolation he was refusing to avert from himself when he said and ye'd write to us here the words which so filled herself with dismay for a little while she could resolutely take it for granted that the plan would just be given up but as the talk went on and she perceived that this was not the case she froze into mute despair where she sat listening at the open doorway in the chill december breath which brought her light enough to mend jack's coat her husband conscious of his significant speech did not overlook its effect upon her and presently when the others had gone out he said in a half deprecatory way 
the lad's to be tired of starvin the creatures but she only nodded her head faintly looking straight before her and could make no other answer after a few days however few be all such evil days she began again to take part in the discussions and it now seemed that her interest had fully revived and she could plan and scheme as eagerly as ever though the sparkle had gone out of her eyes she said never a word to discourage or deter the lads on the contrary she actually incited and persuaded rose who at first declared vehemently that she could not possibly go and leave them all alone her mother knew that the girl was restless and wearying for a turn in the bleak road of her joyless days so she said that she would be easier in her mind if she knew that the lads had their sister along with them and that it would be a sin to throw away so good a chance for them all to go together happy and content and that she and the father would be fine company for one another and would be kept heartened by hearing from them now and again and maybe they'd come home to her one of those days the poor children protested that they would be writing home continual ay and sending over the money for the rent if it wasn't only for the sake of helping that away sorra the thing else would take them out of the old place but suppose now the pataties took and failed again this summer how would she and father get on at all now that they themselves could do a hand's turn if they stayed except to be eaten all before them there was the turf cutting to be sure could father contrive that left to himself ay maybe they'd be right to give up the notion and try gettin along the way they were herself felt in every fibre that this would be as the return of a golden age but she said sure not at all she had her goat and her hens and the young pig and no fear but they do right well and when once the fine weather had come she was looking out as she spoke over a frost-bound bog with powdery white drifts like ashes in its black creases and the keening wind smelt of the coming snow why the time would slip away pleasant enough no doubt it was the contemplation of those pleasant times that made such broad silvery streaks in her brown hair before the swift-footed day of parting arrived the children went on an afternoon in the early spring when the evenings are light and cold jack had made jokes about different things all the morning and his mother had laughed at them which was a more or less equal division of labour but for the last hour or so he could think of only two one was sure will be in the way of getting grand say fishin now entirely and the other bedad i think we'd a right to take old fanny the goat travellin wid us too this last jest occurred to him when he saw his mother milking the creature that rose might have a bottleful to take with her for a drink he was reduced to repeating them alternately however they served the purpose just as well as a greater variety would have done his father went out and gathered stones in the worst corner of the field he was not quite sure whether he was glad or sorry to find how heavy the middlin sized ones seemed to lift sometimes he said to himself i have been a burthen on them if i had a went and sometimes i shouldn't have maybe ha kept her back the others made no pretences in particular herself watched them out of sight over the brow of the low hill all the while she was thinking how one of them might at the last moment fling down his bundle and declare with forcible asseverations that he would not go afoot as the cullinane's son had done not so long before which would of course have been a great pity somehow she thought jack would be the most likely to do that he was a foolish poor lad but alas the three figures walked on and on till the ridge hid them they had not even forgotten anything that they could run back to fetch then she went back into the house and spoke cheerfully to her husband who sat huddled up by the fire while she put away the cold potatoes 
left over from dinner which nobody had eaten. He did not answer her for a long time, and then only said, Wished, and he wished. However, in the course of the evening they said, between the two of them, nine times, that the children had a fine day for the startin' anyway, and seven times that they might be hearin' from them next month early. They may have said nothing else, but that was in itself a fair allowance of conversation. After this black day had passed, it was several years before any very noticeable incident occurred in the history of herself and her husband. It may be epitomized in the statement that they got along pretty middlin'. Now and again a curious little scrawl came from overseas for them, with a muddy order in it sometimes, always where the young people had been able to scrape together anything worth sending. But dollars were scarce occasionally, even in the States, and as Terence wrote, the dareness of some things was intense. John O'Driscoll worked harder than before at his potatoes and turf now that he had no sons to help him, but herself grew sadly out of her industrious habits. She who was once rarely to be seen without a bit of knitting or plating or patching in progress, who would pick bunches of ox-eye daisies and poppies to fill the house's window-pane with, rather than remain idle or fashion quaint ornaments for her dresser of various flaggers and horse-tails and bulrushes and such other bog growths, would now often sit for half an hour at a time with her hands empty before her. All the purposes of her life seemed to be flapping aimlessly about her, as a sail does when the fair wind drops or veers. I fear she cannot have had the true artist's spirit, since, failing an audience to be pleased and applaud, she ceased to take any intrinsic pleasure in her productions. She hadn't the heart, she said herself, to be minding about such whim-whams, and now, of course, she had no longer anyone to criticize and admire except her husband, who had not, by nature, any appreciation for things of the kind, though to gratify her he would look mournfully at what she showed him, and say that it was a great little affair, or that she was a terrible woman for constructions. But she was to lose even this encouragement. One rainy autumn John O'Driscoll fell ill, and after moping about for a few days took to his bed, which was composed of mud and rushes, drier, it is true, than the same materials as they existed outside his door. Herself nursed him desperately, and dared not fear that it was anything serious, until one night he began saying, Woe, Sheila, and Hup Blossom to the horses he had ploughed with in his younger days, and twisted his arms as if he were turning the plough handle at a difficult corner, and then despair stabbed her with an icy thrust. Two or three evenings before that, old Mick Ryan, who in those days was still able-bodied and active, handed a little dark object to his daughter Biddy, and bade her run over with it to John O'Driscoll. It was a very small morsel of the tobacco which Mick treasured so fondly that he could not fill his pipe without some effort, whence we may calculate with how much he gave any away. I question is he able for smokin', said Biddy, looking doubtfully at the fragment. Marianne said he seemed uncommon bad when she was in there this morning, and herself told her he hadn't took bite or sup you might say these two days back a good pipe of baccy's better nor meat and drink to a man any day well or ill said mick run along and be bringing it to him biddy had run obediently some way when her father called her back again you might as well be taking that too he said giving her another little lump which he had in the meanwhile forced himself to cut off it represented, however, more than his whole day's allowance. On the morning after John O'Driscoll's mind had begun to wander, Biddy Ryan came to the O'Driscoll's door. Herself had seen her coming and met her 
on the threshold with a little wisp of something rolled up in paper. "'It's your father's bit of tobacco, Biddy,' she said, "'that was never touched, and I put it aside for him, thinking he might have a use for it, and thank him kindly all the same. "'Oh, dear, you do look tired and bad this day, Mrs. O'Driscoll,' said Biddy, "'and what weighs himself at all?' he's gone said his wife he's gone since for it was light this morning the fever he had on him went then and all the strength seemed to die out of him and he's gone biddy began to cry och mrs driscoll darlint she said may the saints above pity you this day oh cone but it's desolate your left woman dear real desolate ay i am so herself said assenting in an indifferent preoccupied way as if to an uninteresting proposition about some other person perhaps at no moment did she fully emerge from this half-stunned state the neighbors generally say that she was never the same woman again which is true enough never herself again even in name for they now spoke of her as the witty o'driscoll and old mrs kilfoyle said she thought the creature had in a manner given herself up but this was not exactly the case she had still a purpose in life to which she passionately clung when she had sold her pig and her goat and all her chickens in order that john's coffin might not be supplied from the house she set herself to the task of keeping the soul in her body and the roof over her head until the children returned but she now no longer seemed to anticipate that event as a keen personal joy for herself she was considering it in their interest and from their point of view they would be so cruelly disappointed if they came home and found nobody left we done wrong she said to let them go sure what's to become of them if they landed back into the middle of desolation and they thinkin to find me sittin by the bit of fire or maybe takin a look out of the door for who'd there be to send them word i was quit with a sure it's lost altogether and miserable they'd be heaven protect them but sure i'll do me endeavours to bide and keep goin till then please god in those days mrs o'driscoll would have looked a melancholy figure even to strangers who did not remember her in her earlier comeliness for when six months do the work of a dozen years they accomplish their task roughly and with no relenting touches she had shrunk and withered in form and face eh woman dear mrs sheridan once said to her i'm thinking that old gown of yours has in a manner outgrown you the soft bloom on her cheeks had dwindled into hard little streaks among many meshed fine lines and she walked with bent shoulders and the uncertain step of an old woman who has not any definite goal in view all this did not surprise her neighbors because though they were unaware how her dwelling still unchanged in outward aspect had become the lair of a fearful thing which needed to be approached with strange and piteous precautions lest it should leap forth and rend her they yet felt that the forlornness of her plight would well account for these sad outward signs of alteration but there was one thing about her which puzzled them they could not see any reason why she should have grown so fond of colloguing with mad bell that this was the case nobody could doubt for as often as she went past the door of big anne and her co-tenants to fill a bucket at the pool she invariably now stopped on her way home at the angle of the flat-topped dyke along by their field which used to be mad bell's favourite roosting place and if she were not visible would generally loiter about there until she appeared it is true that mad bell who was capricious in her attachments had in this instance 
gone with the multitude so far as to entertain a decided regard for mrs o'driscoll and would pause in the midst of the most impassioned song to nod and grin at her their intercourse however had not been wont to go much further since mad bell except when at fitful intervals the humour took her for talkin was a silent and unexpansive person but now mrs o'driscoll might be seen by the half hour together sitting on the dyke beside the little wizened yellow visaged figure and gabbin away as thick as thieves and that too mind you on a day when she'd as like as not pass a sensible body on the road and scarce seem to take notice the neighbour's perplexity had a tinge of grievance in it End of section four. Section five of Irish Idols by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section five. One day it chanced that the pair had an interview a bit out on the bog near the place where Brian Kilfoyle and his wife were cutting long-tufted grass under a bank for their pig. Mrs. Driscoll had espied the gleam of Mad Bell's red petticoat against the black peat, and had sped after it rather than return home unfortified by a word with its wearer. As the Kilfoyles moved along the bank, twitching up bunches of the tangled green blades, they gradually came closer to the two women who were sitting on the other side, and when Mrs. Bryan arrived within earshot of their discourse, Mrs. O'Driscoll was just saying, So as I said, Mad Bell, I ought to be stepping back to get the water on the fire in case by any odd chance himself happened home tonight. Not that it's anyways likely, for he's after getting a long job down below at Hillferthy's thinnin' mangolds and weedin' turnips they are. I wouldn't wonder meself if it wasn't home afoot before the end of the week. Yes, they will, och, they will, and they'll think him a gentleman born they will, Mad Bell murmured absently. It was the refrain of a favourite ditty, but did not throw much light upon the matter in hand and the lads are along with him mrs o'driscoll continued and i told you rose was gone to stay a couple of days wid her sister away at lisnadrum it makes the house seem lonesome like mad bell me dear howsomever it's just for a while you know it's not as if i hadn't there coming back to look to mad bell only nodded curtly and went on humming but it was precisely this passive acquiescence which made her a valuable confidant to Mrs. O'Driscoll, who continued not discouraged. I'm thinking, after all, twill be scarce worth me while to be putting down any more betaties this evening on the chance of their coming. The cold ones I have over from this morning will do grandly for me if I warm them up, and even so there might be a few left to crisp for the lads in case they were home again breakfast time to-morrow jack does have an uncommon fancy for a crisp potato he always had ever since his two hands were the size to be holding one so good night to you kindly mad bell i'll have a sup of water boiling and then if they do come at this moment mrs bryan accidentally pulled a clattering stone down along with her wisp of grass and Mrs. O'Driscoll, startled, saw that she had been speaking to more ears than Mad Bell's. She looked confused and disconcerted by the discovery, and said in an apologetic tone, Ah, Mrs. Bryan, sure, I was just in a manner romancing, if you happen to notice. Deed, it's foolish enough, very belike, but she doesn't mind, and the truth is, the bit of a house there does be that quite and lonesome on me these times, and I'm coming in that I'm afeard, truth it's afeard, I am going back to it, unless I've something made up in me mind to hold off the thought like. 
for goodness help me when i'm steppin up to the door if i was to be thinkin all the while twould be that same way wid never the sound of a voice or the stir of a foot inside for ever and ever more sure i'd be fit to go distracted outright so i would och but it's that i go in dread of and there's the reason why i keep lettin on they're only away temporary in course i know it's makin a fool of meself i am but it's a sort of comfort all the same and it seems more natural when i get tellin it and talkin about them to somebody else she never troubles herself the creature whatever you let on to her or minds to be contradictin sure now there's no sin in it is there ma'am when it's only yourself you're deceivin so i just plother away to her for me own contentment ah me dad i hadn't the heart mrs bryan said when relating the incident to her friends for to say anything agin it to her though it's a queer kind of consolment it seems to me but och she might be hard put to it these times to find any at all if she'd say an odd prayer for them now and again said the widow mcgurk with some sternness she'd be better employed and there might be some sense in it than contrivin old inventions she might too be sure mrs bryan said doubtfully but according to me own experience there's naught easier than to be sayin one's prayers and thinkin o different things at the same time and that's no distraction either to a body's mind you might as well be striven to keep the wind out wid a sieve full of holes i do suppose there's some things there's no use tryin to contend wid and that's a fact said old mrs kilfoyle if one could make one's mind up to believe it but maybe please god she won't be spared over long mrs o'driscoll however stuck persistently to her forlorn device even on days when mad bell was not forthcoming to act as interlocutor she would pause at the accustomed point on her way home and her lips might be seen moving as if she were romancing to herself once pat ryan who passed her by on an occasion when she had been bringing in a load of turf reported a new phase of self-delusion for said he i give you me word she'd her creel there set down on the dyke and first she'd take one little bit of a sod and lay it flat of the stone and that's rosine's she'd say and then she'd put another beside it and says she and that's what i got the lads and here's for molly says she and so on then she'd be puttin them back in the creel but she'd stop to take another look at them makin as if she was considerin and maybe says she this here ud do better for the boys and molly might liefer have the pink coloured one that's the way she kept talkin to herself and i couldn't think what she was at till the idea came into me head twas lettin on she was to be comin home from the town with trifles of presents in her basket for the childer and they grown and gone but all the while you could perceive she knew right well she was just persuadin herself again her reason only she couldn't abide to be thinkin so sure twas melancholious said pat to see her there on the roadside in the rain fiddlin about with them old scraps of turf sods all be herself when the neighbors heard it many of them shook their heads oracularly and said twouldn't be apt to go on that away for very long but how long it might have gone on in the natural course of things cannot now be known for it was brought to an end by the interposition of the law's strong arm it was not i am sure the children's fault that for some time before their father's death their scrawls and money orders had arrived but seldom at lisconnel the contents of the communications which did get there showed plainly that they were themselves struggling along painfully enough in the new world and likewise that several other scrawls had failed to reach their destination not a surprising result when one considers their quaintly enigmatical superscriptions and may at the present writing be stowed unavailingly away 
in blind or dead letter departments but this failing off of remittances conjoined with a series of bad seasons hastened the accumulation of the O'Driscoll's arrears and when john died the land agent wrote to his employer at the carlton that the widow's ever paying up appeared to be an utterly hopeless matter which was quite true her neighbours were indeed ready to lend her as far as possible a helping hand but it could not extend itself to the payment of her rent and to grub that out of her screed of stony ground was a task beyond her powers the land agent also wrote that the poor woman who seemed to be an uncivilized feeble-minded sort of creature would be much better in the union and that as she must at any rate be got rid of he had taken immediate steps for serving her with the necessary notices the woman's own view of the case was in sum sure what would become of the children if she would be put out of it an argument the futility of which it would have been hard to make her understand she was put out of it however one blustery autumn day when the sub-sheriff's party and the police had caused an unwanted stir and bustle all the morning on the Duffclane road along which so many feet seldom pass in a twelvemonth the district was reported disturbed and therefore a squadron of dragoons had been brought from the nearest garrison a tedious way off to protect and overawe their scarlet tunics and brass helmets enlivened the outward aspect of the proceedings vastly making such a gorgeous pageant as our black bogland has perhaps never witnessed before or since not a gossoon but worshipped the stately horses as they passed and thought their plumed and burnished riders almost as supernaturally superb but it must be owned that the latter were for the most part in very human bad tempers in fact when they ascertained the nature and scope of the duty on which they had come so far some of them said a choleric word with such emphasis that their superiors were obliged to choose between deafness and mutiny or at least insubordination and discreetly preferred the lesser evil when the invading force entered lisconnel which it did among afternoon beams just begun to mellow and slant dazzlingly it found an ally in old mrs kilfoyle inasmuch as she enticed mrs o'driscoll to pay her a visit at the critical moment of its arrival the old woman had recognized the widow o'driscoll's fate as one of those things with which there is no contending and had said to herself and her daughter-in-law where's the use of having them risin a row there wid draggin her out the creature god pity her that'll never quit for certain of her own free will i'll just step over to her and ax her to come give me a hand wid mendin the bottom that's fallen out of the old turf creel she did always be great at them jobs and always ready to do a body a good turn i'll say that for her deed yes said mrs Bryan so it came about that at the time when the forcible entrance of her cabin was being effected mrs o'driscoll was out of sight in the kilfoyles dark little room where the two mrs kilfoyles detained her as long as they could but in the end they were not able to prevent the evicted tenant from joining the group of angry and scared and woe-begone faces gathered as near the doomed dwelling as the authorities would permit and from saying wirra wirra in a half bewildered horror as she saw each one more of her few goods and chattels added to the little heap of chaos into which her domestic world had changed fast by her door it was decreed that her cabin should be not only unroofed but demolished because as an old bailiff dolefully remarked there never was any tellin' where you'd have those boyos as like as not they'd land the thatch on to it again the first minute your back was turned as easy as you'd clap your old corbeen on your head and there'd be the whole 
botheration over again as fresh as a daisy. Therefore, when the ancient smoke-steeped weather-worn covering had been plucked from off the skeleton rafters and lay strewn around in flocks and wisps like the wreck of an ogre's brown wig the picks and crowbars came into play for it was before the days of battering ram and maiden the mud walls were solid and thick yet had to yield and presently a broad bit of the back wall fell outward all of a piece as no other sort of masonry falls with a dull heavy thud like a dead body the lime-washed inner surface thus turned up skywards gleamed sharply despite all its smoke-grime against the drab clay and though the interior had been very thoroughly dismantled a few small pictures were still visible nailed on the white as the cordon of police and other officials fell back a pace or so to avoid the toppling wall the widow mcgurk seized the opportunity to make a sally and capture one of these derelict ornaments it was a holy family a crudely coloured print all crimson and blue with a deep gilt border such as you might purchase for a halfpenny any day i sure it's great men you are entirely to be evictin the likes of them she cried shrilly waving her loot aloft as she was hustled back to a respectful distance at lisconnel responded with a low and sullen murmur but mrs o'driscoll's attention was very opportunely taken up by the restoration of this piece of property och woman alive she said and it was himself brought me that one give it to me into me hand sure i remember the day yet as if the sun hadn't gone down on it the old higgler finney had come up with his basket and while some of the rest did be about getting a few trifles i was in an uncommon admiration of this howsomever i hadn't a penny to me name to be spendin on anything in the world so i let him go but sure himself met me below on the road and happened to have a haypenny about him and so he brought it home to me i mind i run out and borrowed a tack from poor mick ryan to put it up wid ay dear look now at the tear it's got at the top comin off this damage seemed for the time being to concern her more than any of her other troubles and she allowed herself to be drawn away on the pretext of depositing the picture safely in the kilfoyle's cabin where she remained until the invaders had departed from lisconnel everybody else watched them trooping off over the bogland with brass and scarlet flashing and glowing splendidly in windy gleams of the sunset they had gone a long way before the purple-shadowed gloaming had swallowed up the last far-espied glitter. With the Kilfoyles she found a lodging for some time, but she entered her days at the Widow McGurk's, where there was no less hospitality and more spare room. She was persuaded to make the move chiefly by the consideration that she would there be nearer the crest of the hill, for the dominant dread which now brooded over her life we so seldom fall too low for special fear was the home-coming of the children and they to be stepping along the creatures expecting no harm and then when they're up the hill and in sight of our bit of a house all of a sudden to see there was no trace of it only a desolate ruin they might better keep the breath of the ocean sea between them and that she seemed to be continually living through in imagination this terrible moment and grew more and more eager to avert it if i could get ever a chance to see them come on the road she said and give them warning afore they'd cross the knockhorn twouldn't come so cruel hard on them and with that end in view she spent many an hour of the bleak winter days which followed her eviction in looking out from the unsheltered hillside towards Duffclain. It was vain now for any neighbour to profess a firm belief that they would never return, 
just as confidently as he or she had formerly been used to predict their appearance one of these days mrs o'driscoll listened meekly while it was pointed out to her how probably they had settled themselves down over there for good and all and got married maybe or who could tell that one of them mightn't have been took bad and have gone beyond this world altogether the same as his poor father but then she went and looked out again the young doynes and sheridans who at that time were quite small children remember how she would stop them when she met them and bid them be sure if if ever by any chance they saw rose or one of the lads coming along to mind and tell them that their father was gone and she was put out of it but that mrs mcgurk was given her shelter and no fear they wouldn't find her and to bid them make haste all the haste they could it must have been when she was on the watch one perishing march day that she caught the cold which carried her off with very little resistance on her part she was herself too weak and still too much taken up with the children's affairs to fret about the fact that the expenses of her burying would certainly be defrayed by the house but it distressed lisconnel seriously and would never have been permitted to occur could the requisite sum have been by any means amassed the circumstance added some gloom to the sorrowful mood in which her neighbours saw another procession pass over the hill on a still wet morning when the rain rustled all along the road and the grey mist curtains were closely drawn none of the children have come back again and it may now be hoped that they never will chapter seven thunder in the air considering everything lisconnel musters as large a congregation as could be expected for mass down beyant on sundays and saints days but then so many things have to be considered including primarily those long lines of desolate road that its numbers are actually small for when from the population of the place you have deducted the people who are too young or too old or crippled like peter and peg sheridan or minding babies and invalids and from the residuum again abstract the men who prefer basking in the sun should it happen to spread that poor man's feast and the boys who under any meteorological conditions whatever would choose rather to rush and yell about the wild bog than sit still within four solemn walls you will find no very imposing contingent left of course there are many days of the year when wind and weather permit nobody to attempt the journey but a few people perform it with much regularity the widow mcgurk for instance a strong and quick walker and big anne who stumps on steadily and perseveringly and says musha good gracious glory be to god it's here i am when she arrives little old mrs kilfoyle too might for many years be met pattering along with a clean white flannel petticoat over her head and her face looking out quaintly through the pocket hole this is the fashionable substitute for a cloak in lisconnel and mrs kilfoyle's venerable blue cloth hooded garment soon after it came into her possession by inheritance had been stolen by a passing vagrant to the lasting impoverishment of her family in the female line she used to trot on with a briskness and staying power which did her son brian's heart good to see when the neighbours commented upon it and said sure be dad she was as young as any of them he was as much pleased as if some one had guaranteed him ten years good harvests for by that time she must have been verging upon eighty according to conjecture in lisconnel our ages are always more or less matters of guesswork once they begin to be reckoned by years but one sunday it was a mild mellow lighted september afternoon she grew so very tired on the way back that they had the work of the world getting her home and she never went to mass again though by 
one of those fictions which make life endurable it was always understood that she would resume the practice when the weather did be something drier or warmer or cooler perhaps goodness coming on easter or michaelmas and brian found this a sadly shrunken source of satisfaction during the late summer and early autumn lisconnel is most frequently and numerously represented in the little chapel near the town partly perhaps because its inhabitants are at this season better fed and have consequently more energies to spare for extra exertions and partly because in the pleasant breezy blue and white mornings mothers and wives and sisters find it easier to beat up recruits for their three hours trudge to first mass even on rare occasions when there is a station held at duffclane which cuts a couple of miles off their tramp the start has to be a timely one made while your long shadow eclipses many twinkling stars in the grass as it slides before you and while the air is still fresh with dew on such mornings as these quite a procession sometimes goes over the knockhorn the white cloaks and shirt-sleeves gleaming with a stainlessness and snowiness which always puzzles me when i look into the dark doors whence they issue i do not think that a lisconnel afflicts itself much about its remoteness from chapel and this equanimity is in a measure due to the attitude adopted by old father rooney who has for over forty years been its parish priest in his most active days he recognized how impossible it would be to establish any very close connections between himself and that furthest outlying shred of his widely scattered cure and a natural benevolence of disposition inclined him to console his parishioners for their inevitable stinting in the matter of his ministrations perhaps also the breadth of the spacious physical horizon which he had before his eyes as he rode about the bogs may have somehow influenced his mental vision me good woman he exhorted mrs mcgurk one day when she had been lamenting the probability that it might be her husband's fate to die without his clergy you should not be making your mind too uneasy on that score send for me of course and if by any means i can come up to you well and good but if i'm prevented you've no call to be supposing that you'll be left without every sort of assistance for that reason likely enough i will be all the while riding off salonmore ways or dromesque ways as fast as i can contrive but i'm not taking the blessed saints and the mother of mercy and the rest following along with me same as if i was so to speak showing them their road they know where they wanted as well as you or i you may depend and won't be asking either of our leaves to get there mrs mcgurk was slightly shocked and greatly relieved by this view of the matter i am not prepared to deny that if her circumstance had been less utterly poverty-stricken father rooney might have sincerely believed it his duty to point out a more expensive method of quieting her misgivings but extreme indigence has some immunities and these people of lisconnel are such empty-handed travellers between life and death that no one can be much tempted to demand this kind of toll from them on the way father carroll who sometimes assists father rooney takes a rather sterner view of things which however does not count for much here or there owing to his smaller popularity the people generally speak of him as the cross priest less because they really know anything to the disadvantage of his temper than because his harsh featured blue shaven face looks somewhat grim beside the other's kindly ruddy countenance and fringe of white hair to some persons father carroll's outward man would suggest a suspicion that he was habitually guarding dark secrets but i do not believe that this is the case 
he is on more substantial grounds considered to have a great eye entirely for a good horse one st peter's day he came up to lisconnel on an urgent sick call and when departing fell in with terence doyne a wildish lad to whom he put the question why he had not gone to mass that morning with his parents instead of fishing for pekins along by the river appending as a sort of corollary which we know is often more puzzling than the original proposition a request to be informed what effect on his final destinies terence anticipated from such a line of conduct terence replied whether in your reverence i'll be right enough i'm thinking mass or no mass would me mother down below there praying away for me like everything you could name sure you wouldn't say they'd go for to be making a fool of her lettin her waste her time axin for nothin she'll get if they would she might as well have been after them pinkeens that's as slivery to try catch as little old divils did your reverence ever hear tell there was trouts in the bit of stream along yonder terence was trying to slip away from the point but father carroll would not be evaded and said no terence to be certain your mother will experience the benefit of her prayers but suppose she's granted something else better instead of the saving of a young sliverine like yourself and such a thing is easy enough to imagine where'd you be then my fine lad this presentment of the case somewhat flabbergasted terence and his reverence would probably have had the last word if terence's brother matt a smaller and more reflective gossoon had not intervened saying confidently there's nary no such a thing to be had sorra another thing would pacify me mother if anything went agin him not if it was the illigentest could be conceived she's always had such a wish for him matt pointed to terence as never was musha but it's a fine time them saints would be havin it's plither 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 should go like the old hummin machine they had threshin oats down at hillferthy's below and divil a minute's peace at one of them git with her if anybody looked crooked at him father carroll had not an argument ready so he only said the poor woman seems likely to have her own work with the pair of you and the advantage may be considered to have rested with the brothers several years after this a most brilliant july sunday rose upon lisconnel and by seven o'clock the people bound for chapel were prepared to start it was a hot very still morning the invisible hand which is almost always combing the rushes and sedges about the marshy pools had for once left them to stand straight and there was not a breath stirring that could have carried the lightest cloud fleck across the deep speedwell blue of the sky where however no clouds were to be seen yet old mick ryan who was sunning himself at his door said that the weather looked none too fine and wouldn't hold up much longer it's too clear altogether over yonder he said pointing to the far-off horizon against which a sharp peak was delicately outlined in faint wild violet colour we'll be apt to have a crack of thunder presently it's in the air but the others said they saw no signs of it and it would be a queer thing to have a thunder so early in the month when the chapel bound party had gone a little way beyond the hill they met terence doyne coming from the opposite direction is it home you're going terence said his sister stacy i'm glad of that now for you'll be company to mother and matt's away off somewheres down the bog for mrs doyne was ailing and stacy had been divided between a particularly strong wish to attend mass this morning and a feeling that she ought to stay and keep her mother heartened up she now walked on with a salved conscience though judging by terence's appearance one might have thought him likely to prove rather a wearing companion his look being as of one who has a grievance and resents it and as a matter of fact his mother so far from being cheered up when some time afterwards he stooped in at her doorway felt her heart 
gripped again by a temporary staved-off dread. She had supposed him safely on his way to Mass. Since he had come back, however, she earnestly desired him to remain indoors, and she made conversation perseveringly under the discouragement of brief and grumpy replies. She hoped she was talking him into good humour, until he suddenly glanced round the shadow-hung walls and said, "'There's one of the loys took. Where's Matt? Och, away outside, maybe. Just traipsin' about,' said Mrs. Doyne with a start. "'And so I was tellin' you, Judy Ryan says to me, they were half through the chaps as solid as a gob of mud when he's took a notion in his fool's head.' Terence went on disregardfully. I know that he's after cuttin sods in the bank where I've told him times and again there isn't a spade load of good slain turf, let alone its bein twist as far to carry as from the place I was showin' him yesterday. He turned towards the door, but his mother, whose head and hands had begun to tremble, said piteously, Sure never mind about it this instant, Terence Abick. Where's the hurry? What were we sayin' about the Ryans? It was something divertin' enough, I know, only it's just passed out of me head, till I remember it in another minute. Wait now, Terence, honey, would you fancy a bit of the griddle cake Mrs. Kilfoyle brought me? There was a good bit over that I couldn't eat last night, and I put it away on purpose for you to be havin' it. Beautiful whole meal it is, she was sent a present of. Our mothers never quite believe that we have fully outgrown the lure of sugar, bread and butter, or the like, and perhaps they hold a not altogether ungrounded faith. Then, as Terence was striding on gracelessly past this offer, she said, Och, then, stay a bit wid me, Jewel. Sure it's lonesome I do be, and Stacy away all the morning, and never a soul for me to pass a word wid, and me head's bad. Sure you might stop in a while when I ax you. She so seldom made a point-blank appeal for anything on her own behalf that Terence was impressed and sat down, to her great relief, upon the ledge of the dresser, which jingled all its jugs and cups every time he swung his legs. Furthermore, he said, "'Your old toad,' which pleased her vastly, as she had reason to consider it an excellent sign for his temper. But after all, when she was breathing freely, and thinking of topics to talk about, he jumped up as if something had stabbed him, and went plunging through the door before she had time to put in another word of protest. His mother sat looking miserable for a short time, and then went out also, and a little way up the road to where a knot of neighbors were gathered, some seated in a dwindling shadow of the Sheridan's walls, and some in the broad sunshine on the top of the dyke. The sky was still clear and deeply ultramarine, but had lost its earlier glistening, as of suspended dews, and looked sultry. Low down on its southern rim, the jagged edge of a dense black cloud would just show itself here and there for a moment and shrink back out of ken. You might have fancied some huge, dark-hided shape lurking there in ambush, and as it prowled to and fro, ever and anon, inadvertently discovering a pricked-up ear or ridge of a spine. About the Sheridan's door, people were carrying on a conversation leisurely and intermittently. Perhaps one should say a series of conversations, so long were the frequent pauses. The flow of their discourse quickened into animation and continuity only in some eddy of anecdote, as, for example, when Audie Rafferty was recounting a fracas which had taken place lately somewhere between down below and down beyond. Pat Martin was telling me, he said, young Willie Malloy and another young fellow from Dromesk, be the name of Joyce, were after having the greatest set to at all on Tuesday night where they were working for Sullivan, ploughing for turnips, young Malloy was, and drove over a stone in the furrow, and smashed a backband all to flitter jigs, whereby Sullivan came along and gave him dog's abuse. So Malloy ups and says Joyce has a right to have seen the plough harness 
was sound afore they went out. And Joyce he ups and says the harness was right enough, and the other had no call to be forcing his plough over such a sizable lump of a stone. So from that they got to bullyraggin and bargain one another outrageous till the end of it was they fell to boxin on the road going home most terrific. A young Malloy got the other chap down, and Pat says he'd have had him choked as sure as there was breath in his body. Only old Molly Finney caught him by the hind leg till some of the rest of them pulled him off. Och, he said it was a great fight entirely. The only wonder is, said Mrs. Sheridan, that them young chaps don't do slaughter on each other oftener than happens. That puts me in mind of one of the further backest things I remember, said Joe Ryan, old Mick's youngest brother. "'Twas as long ago as when I wasn't the size of them spalines over there. Look at them now. Sure the divil's busy with them. They're dragging a couple of chickens up and down the street in their mother's saucepan. Just let her get home to them. Sure I don't know what old ages go it mayn't be, for it's generations since the McCrans quit out of this, and it was the time they had the Quigley's house. But I mind the son Luke one Sunday morning coming up here from wherever he'd been, powerful hot weather it was, and much about this season of the year, and when he come, his old father and sisters and some more of us were just streeling about the place promiscuous. So he streeled along too, and nobody noticed anything uncommon. Well, we were passing be the dyke there at the bottom of Mrs. McGurk's field of potatoes, and in one corner of it there was a great blaze like of red poppies, as there may be this present instinct for that matter. But when Luke McCran set eyes on them, he let the most surprising yell you ever witnessed, and grabbed hold of his father, as he might ha' done, and he scared at anything afore he was grown, Lord, in heaven, says he, pointing afore him. What's that there? Sure, but what else would it be? You gomeral, says one of the girls, except a clump of poppies. Troth, said he, I don't know what I thought it was at all, and began laughing, a great hoarse laugh, as if he was trying to pass it off. So he walked on a few perches, till we come where there was a line of poppies again, growing in the long grass under the dyke, and if we did, Luke McCran let another yell out of him, you might have heard in cork, and stood staring wild. Says he, the devil's done that on me, the devil's done that on me. It's on this road, and it's all along the other road. And where am I to get to at all, I say, says he, seeming to go altogether beyond himself. And with that he lipped the dyke, and twas just there at the road centre, away with him out over the bog, as if hell was let loose behind him. Faith he whirled through wet and dry, like an old rag caught in a strong wind. Folk thought he had drink taken, but maybe something better than half an hour after he'd gone, the police came up with word there was a man lying under a bank in a bit of bog, Sellyberg ways, on Hillforthy's land it was, and his head all battered to smithereens with the handle of an old grip, and he seen alive last in company with Luke McCran drinking together they were the night before. Och, that was an ugly business. Nothing would suit me but to skite off down there to see what I could. How whenever the misfortunate being never was took, I don't know what became of him at all and his family. Quite decent poor people they were. Only Luke did always be fire and hot in his temper. Sure, I dare say you might remember it, Judy. We are much the one age. Be dad, do I, said Judy. It had slipped hold of me recollection, but now you mention it, I remember it right well. But it's a misapprehension to say nobody noticed aught amiss with him. For the first instinct he came, you might easy see he was trembling head and foot like a horse that's after taking a fright, and his eyes were that wild, the look of him as clear before me yet as if he was standing as close to me as Mrs. Doyne is now. Isn't there ever a seat in it for you, ma'am? You don't look always fit to be standing about. Deed, it's mighty indifferent you're looking whatever. 
Pat set the old creepy stool for Mrs. Doyne. No, thank you, ma'am, said Mrs. Doyne. I'm just stepping in to speak to Mrs. Kilfoyle. Tis the heat of the sun discommodes me. It's blazing hot this day. Twon't trouble her much longer then, if that's what ails her, said Peter Sheridan, as she turned away. Twill be black out on us afore we're five minutes older. There'll be a little enough heat left in it once it gets behind that. That was an enormous blue-black cloud rampart with crenellated summit and buttressed base which had reared itself almost to the zenith in the north and still rose steadily livid white cloudlets scudded across its dark face and here and there a rift let in background of coppery glare thunder everybody said or thought and straightway anxious forebodings about potatoes and clutches of eggs mixed in many minds with a vaguer disquietude lisconnel is seriously alarmed at thunderstorms it might pass off yet judy ryan said hopefully that's not the way of the wind what trifle there is does be southerly as if peter sheridan rejoined ominously everybody didn't know that thunder comes up again the wind which is of a piece with the rest of its contrariness and bad cess to the same Still the sun held Mrs. Doyne in a scorching dazzle all the way to Kilfoyle's door, so that she had finished thanking Mrs. Kilfoyle kindly for the griddle bread before her blinking eyes had caught sight of the little old woman in her obscure corner. Mrs. Doyne, a down-hearted person, whose experience of life had not been calculated to encourage her, was always very capable of fears which she sometimes kept to herself for private brooding over but generally sooner or later communicated to a sympathizing neighbor therefore mrs kilfoyle was not at all surprised when her visitor now sat down and said lamentably me heart's broke this is our customary formula for announcing that we are in any sort of tribulation and may mean nothing serious are you finding yourself took worse again me dear said mrs kilfoyle commiseratingly ah no said mrs doyne it's the lads terence and matt they have me distracted i don't know what's come over them this while back for they always lived together as friendly as a pair of old brogues but now there's something gone again them they're that cross with one another twould dishearten you to see never a thing matt can do but terence will find fault with it and they'll bicker and alligate about every hand's turn i believe they'd raise an argument about the stars and the sky if they could find nothing else handier and i don't know where it'd end sure most people do be contrary that way now and again said mrs kilfoyle consolingly and nobody can expect young lads like them to have a scrumption of sense that's where it is for how can you tell what demented thing they'll be apt to go do why sure if one of them lost control of himself for an instant of time he might be hittin the other a crack he'd never get the better of before he knew what he was at och the dread of that's never out of me mind when they're away together i do be hearin somebody comin down the road wid the news every foot that stirs and i can't sleep at night for thinkin of it often i'm wishin the day would never come round again to be givin them a chance to destroy one another let it keep dark says i for there's little to see be daylight but that one's afraid to look at now that's the talk of a fool said mrs kilfoyle with candour but my opinion is nobody's rightly sensible in the nights the notions they'll take in their heads when they're lyin awake are mostly as unreasonable as when they're dreamin outright if i were you mrs doyne ma'am I'd not mind a thraneen that I thought in the night, unless it was a patroon for thinkin' something different by other wiles. Fay, if some one was kilt every time a couple of people were unpleasant in their tempers, how many of us would be left alive? It's not every time, it's just the one time I go in dread of, said Mrs. Doyne, and I know Matt's out on the bog cuttin' turf this morning. Before I come in to you, Terence went off there with himself too as like as not they'll get disputin about something 
and the wild bog's a terrible dangerous place for any persons to be quarrelling in among all them hideous deep bottomless holes sure a slip or a shove might send one of them over the edge and them tussling about convenient and then there do be the loys and grips lying around suppose neither of them got caught up in such a thing into his hand in a rage och the saint shield em and it's as black and as bitter as soot terence poor creature was looking when i last set eyes on em talkin o black said mrs kilfoyle with intentional inconsequence it seems to be growin unnatural dark the thickest shadows indeed had stolen forth from all the room corners emboldened by the abrupt withdrawal of the long rays which had thrust a wedge of glowing gold in at the open door and turned mrs kilfoyle's favourite metallic burnished jug into a refulgent star where it hung on its remote recess the two women rose and stood looking out on a great gloom people who had never seen a wide sweep of bogland beneath the scowl of a thundercloud hardly know what blackness the face of the earth can gather at noontide nowhere else one imagines does murk swooping from overhead so mingle with murk striking up from underfoot for the ground seems not merely to passively accept the shadows flung down upon it but to reflect them back as water reflects sunshine the grim bog broadens and flattens itself under the luring cloud masses as if some monstrous weight were actually drawn across it and their blackness is drawn into relief by lurid gleams of smoky yellow to-day the sullen lustreless glare as from the low of some far distant furnace seemed to beat against the dense vapour screen and struggle through its interstices with an evil-looking glimmer weera said mrs kilfoyle woman alive did you ever behold the like of such a sky as that it might be a lochful of coal tar boiling up over on an old brass pan the lord be good to us this day but there's going to be something beyond the beyonts entirely if it was the end of all the ages it couldn't look more unnatural mrs doyne was ordinarily much more afraid of thunderstorms than mrs kilfoyle who had a reassuring theory that if you just stayed quiet in whatever place you happened to be the lightning would know where you were and be apt to keep out of your way like her oddie rafferty objected a mad dog that won't turn out of the road he's started runnin in to bite you but mrs kilfoyle said it was all one lisconnel is decidedly eclectic in its philosophical explanations of natural phenomena on this occasion however mrs doyne's mind had been preoccupied by an anxiety that crowded out her usual panic and when she strained her gaze over the expanse of gloom before her it was not to note the march of the menaced storm katie she said to little kilfoyle who stood near you that have the good sight look and tell me can you see aught moving yonder on the bog katie's grey eyes were as keen as any young hawk's and she at once replied matt doyne's cuttin turf away down there and his brother's crossin over to where he is he's just after leapin a bit of a pool as she spoke a faint waft of wind came panting towards them out of the breathless hush and made all the taller grass tufts tremble here it is said mrs kilfoyle solemnly but nothing followed except a slight puff of dust mrs doyne said with a groan och them two lads sure they'll run home in next to no time nary a harm they'll git why gossoons like them just put down their heads and off with them skitin across all before them eh but it doesn't seem so long said the little old woman since i'd be doin the same myself they're not like you and me they must be liftin our feet over each separate stick or stone in our road same as a couple of old hens mercy be among us woman dear you're never goin after them in the face of that for mrs doyne was gathering the folds of her ragged shawl under her chin with a left hand which if you wear a shawl habitually means that you are setting out somewhere 
it's not a right thing for you to be doing at all getting yourself drownded dead for nothing in the palthers of rain we're safe to have presently if there's naught worse than palthers coming terence was mad i know about matt cuttin at that turf bank murmured mrs doyne glancing nervously at the darkest cloud get out said mrs kilfoyle it is raven frantic you suppose them to be that they'd stop there rise in rows with turf cuttin with the noonday turned as black as the inside of an old soot bag before their eyes they'd have more woo goodness save and deliver us all a vibrant steely glare sawed the gloom before their faces for a terrible moment and the thunder peal almost overtaking it prolonged their affright through a sharp rattle and bellowing boom dying away in lumbering rumbles and thuds run in katie run in both of yous cried mrs kilfoyle vanishing into her doorway but mrs doyne darted straight across the road and out upon the scowling bog she went in mortal fear weak as she was the mere solitary traversing of so much rough unsheltered ground would have seemed formidable to her but now if the swaying cloud bastions had been a fort sweeping her path with shot and shell until the torn air round her shrieked death she could not have found it harder to face every foot she set before the other had in a mental debate been turned to flee ere the step was taken forwards as she walked over the yielding ling stalks and slippery short grass she dared not lift her eyes from the ground lest they should meet that fearsome flickering blaze it came again and again making her heart stand still with terror but a dread within dread still drove her on muttering broken appeals to all the powers of heaven then the air hissed and she felt hailstones pelting on her forehead and hands and presently saw them gathering in white drifts under black roots and banks and sprinkling dark spaces of bare turf cold blasts came with the hail flapping her shawl into her eyes they seemed to be suffocating her yet when they had blustered by she felt as if they had taken her breath with them she could hardly tell the real thunderclaps from the sounds that surged and hummed in her ears and her knees began to give at each heavily stumbling step like a stalk of meadow grass when its joint knot is snapped worse still a sense grew upon her that all these things had happened to her before an uncanny feeling which brings desperation with it this sense strengthened suddenly when at last coming as she thought near the place where her boys had been seen she forced herself to look up and at once descried them through the hurtle of the pelting shower only a few yards distant and fighting terence was trying to wrest a spade out of matt's hand for one nightmare moment she stood spell-stopped the next she was endeavouring wildly to call to them but she believed that no sound passed her lips only from somewhere far off in the dimness a strange hoarse voice seemed to shriek meaninglessly and before she could struggle on again floods of seething darkness rushed in upon her from all sides and swept her out of consciousness mrs doyne was mistaken her cry came distinctly to her sons and stopped their scuffle as effectually as if they had been separated by an explosion was that mother callin they said simultaneously standing with dropped arms and in the same instant they saw her fall oh my god oh my god she struck matt shouted terence was speechless and put all his energies into a great spring foiled by a twisted heather root which tripped him up so that he had to crawl dragging a useless foot after him to the place where his brother had forestalled him in white-lipped distraction neither of them could doubt that she was dead but terence yelled to matt run home for his life and get help and matt fled away through a blinding blue glare with the thunder roll trampling after him overhead then terence sat down on a low grassy ledge and said to his mother och 
you bad old one what made you go for to be stravin about the bog this sort of weather sure twas no thing to go do but i dare say you're better now to be lyin as quiet as you can till some of them comes to lend you a hand home for you see i'm after wrenchin me fool of a foot did you say anything mother what was you sayin musha now but you're the great old villain to be let on there thinkin to terrify me sure i'm always tellin you you're no better than a real downright rogue wid the inventions of you howsomever maybe all the same i won't let the hailstones be hoppin in your face the devil tear me that i wouldn't stop in the house wid her this mornin what's gone at all wid matt and the lads that there's ne'er a sign of them comin along did you hear that clap mother didn't you then it was a fine one entirely if you'd been listenin but you needn't be mindin for we'll just help you home out of it in next to no time the old villain if the lads ever come they did come as fast as they could and carried her home through the storm to her black little doorway which seemed as much to her present purpose as a palace of marble and ivory several people set out in quest of the priest and the doctor and dan o'byrne whom it was feared they would not find he being supposed absent from home and others devoted themselves to the discussion of the case in all its bearings little else remained for them to do but they decided that mrs doyne whatever might have took her had not been struck by lightning for oddy rafferty had been told by a farmer who had a heifer destroyed in that way that the creature was all blackened on one side like the stem of a burnt fuse bush and there was no signs of anything on mrs doyne it was like her paralysis everybody speculated too about what she could have been doin out there on the bog and she scarce fit to go the length of her own shadow everybody except mrs kilfoyle who was merciful and said sure maybe the creature heaven help her had been lookin for one of the lads to run on an errand for her End of section five. Section six of Irish Idols by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section six. Terence, unhappily for himself, could run on no errand and he had sat for a very long time on the dyke near his door perforce overhearing the neighbours determine what his mother had died of when peg sheridan limped up to him with a poor scrap of comfort peg has as it may be remembered a serious trouble of her own which makes her neighbours affairs rather insipid to her under ordinary circumstances so that she is not generally popular since sensitive people will condone many deliberate sins more easily than the unintentional affront of a simple friendly indifference but they allow that if anything off the common ails them there is no one readier than peg to do them any good turn she can the presence of a great grief in fact filling her with sympathy as a forgotten rock pool is filled when a wave from the wide sea flaps over its brim she came towards terence more jerkily than usual for the frequent flashes scared her as much as anybody and complicated her chronic hobble with queer swerves and startings aside and she said terence i don't believe she's that bad i saw her something the same way one day last harvest when she had stacy like one demented but never a die on her that time or maybe this either if she could get dan o'byrne to her soon enough peg said terence looking up into her face where freckles and sunburn had not found much beauty to spoil you're the jewel of the world so you are to be saying it but she's gone and she was axin me to stay with her that day's storm raged long and ranged widely it met a detachment of the lisconnel congregation on their way back from mass and so daunted them that they took shelter under the wall 
of Dan O'Byrne's forge. They could not get inside because the place was all shut up, and he had gone somewhere, probably on shabining business. Stacy Doyne was among them, somewhat out of spirits. Her expedition had been on the whole a disappointment. It is true that she had attended Mass, which was what she thought had been her object, and yet, however, it certainly was no affair of hers, nor did she care a threnine who spoke to the Ferrelli girls as they went into the porch, or who was not there to give her good morning when she came out. She dare said, besides, that she looked a queer ugly old show in her patched petticoat and torn shawl, and considered that she would probably stay at home next Sunday. As the rain long continued to come down in gleaming sheets, which the other women would call the clearing shower, and just wait a bit to see the end of it, she grew uneasy about her mother, who she knew would be fretting herself into fiddle-strings, and perhaps would run out in the wet to fill the pot and get her death of cold on them, unless she was too badly frighted of the thunder. But they were starting at last, when a Duffclane lad ran against them as they came round the angle of a forge wall. "'Is himself in it?' he shouted. "'Och, no. I was certain sure he wasn't. He's wanted up above. I met young Mick Ryan legging it over the bog about Shanasheen to look for him. And Stacy Doyne's with you. Och, Stacy, it's bad news I'm bringing you. Och, your poor mother's destroyed girl alive, burnt black, in the fire not at all, with the awful lightning struck down at her door, and burnt to a cinder in an instant. One of the young chaps was struck too, blinded, but there's life in him yet, and I'm going to try, can I get Father Rooney to him? I must be steppin. Stacy thought at first that when she had run all those miles home without stopping, and had found her mother sitting in the corner by the hearth, saying, Child of grace, what's kept you till this time? She would stay there content all the rest of her life, and never again put herself in the way of hearing people bawl such things at her. But by the time she had run herself out of breath, she had run into the heart of a blank despair. She walked slower then and slower amid the unmeaning murmur of the eager voices and splashing rain and distant thunder, and towards the end of their journey she lagged so that the other girls pulled her along between them. When they were coming in sight of their Nelkhan, somebody exclaimed, Why, look, you, isn't that Dan O'Byrne himself, a young Dan on the top of the hill? And with that they all made a rush for the latest news. Stacy slipped behind, and sat down under a trickling, lichened boulder, with her hands over her eyes and ears, to crush out sights and sounds. She sat down in a condemned cell of misery, and she rose to her feet, if one must not say in the courts of paradise, at any rate somewhere in its purlieus, because young Dan, who had pulled away her hands from her face, was still holding her wrist, and cheerfully saying, "'Sure, she's doing fine now, Stacy dear. You've no need to be distressing yourself about her. She wasn't too bad at all. Twas just a weakness she took, and me father gave her some of his stuff, done her a powerful good, Stacy Jewel. The very skies had cleared swiftly, and sent a sheaf of long, westering rays to kindle the rainbow fire in a myriad shimmering drops. I corroborated the elder Dan. She'll be as lively as a grig to-morrow, please God. Terence'll be longer laid up with the bit of a wrench he's after given his ankle. Thank you kindly, Dan. Sure they had me annoyed, was all Stacy said. Where'd the world of us be only for Dan, said the widow McGurk. Dan O'Byrne, the blacksmith, and Shebener, is so well liked by his neighbors that they all are perfectly certain that his grandfather also a blacksmith, used to forge pike heads in the troubles of ninety-eight. His own peculiar source of pride is that his family belongs to the O'Burns of Wicklow, who, as everybody knows, have been notorious rebels time out of mind. But that his popularity does not rest upon these historical 
bases will be clear to any of us who are aware how many miles he will tramp on feed to visit someone took sick with whom if bad enough he thinks it a small matter to sit up all night his broad benevolent forehead has glimmered like a lamp of hope between mud floor and thatch roof through many a dark hour and if as not seldom happens all the light flickers out when the day is dawning everybody knows that dan left something undone that lay within the compass of his kindliness and skill bedad if dan o'byrne couldn't keep the breath in her body the devil himself couldn't not if one was her soul and the other was purgatory pat ryan said on an occasion of this sort using a figure of speech which perhaps had more appositeness than he suspected dan's merits scientific and moral are indeed highly rated not only absolutely but relatively as contrasted with those of dr ward at the dispensary down beyant whose services lisconnel seeks rarely and generally in vain his district being a world too wide for any licensed practitioner to administer single-handed however swift his rattletrap car and however brief his visits when he proves thus unattainable people remark ah well i question could he ha done a hapworth a good he is a well meanin poor man they say and mightn't make such a bad offer at it if he wasn't always in a hurry and would take time to what he was about but it stands to reason that he can't know rightly what he's doin when he won't so much as be at the trouble of attending to half the particulars his patient give him about their symptoms and interrupts them in the middle as if he could possibly find out how they were feeling without being told as for his medicines they have no strength in them at all lisconnel utterly despises any physic that is in the least endurable either in taste or odour or if he does send an odd bottle that smells as if it might have some good in it he calls it a liniment and is careful to stick on it a yellow poison label for fear you should try a drop on the other hand there is plenty of strength in his language if by chance he attends a summons and finds the invalid in a normal state of health his frame of mind when such a contretemps takes place is afterwards variously described as raging mad as cross as the dogs fit to be tied on his hind legs begob and so forth as if brian kilfoyle remarked he'd liefer have found the unlucky bastoon lying on the broad of his back waitin' death or as if it weren't as simple and easy as anything else to say the devil take yous and roll off home again wid no trouble prescribin or aught and be ped for it too mind you handsome appended a neighbour this is in striking contrast to dan o'byrne who when called in by mistake will say quite pleasant should i never be wishful to see you worser anyways or declare it would take an m d with more letters than he had in his name to perceive much amiss which gives an agreeably humorous complexion to affairs and dan's medicines are undeniably strong a certain cordial of his own compounding enjoys a very wide local reputation and has brought round dozens and scores of people if questioned about its ingredients he will but grin blandly and say something of the nature of och now that it be tellin however anybody can tell that it smells aromatically of herbs my own opinion is that the rest of it consists mainly of faith and poteen though in what proportions they are combined i am not chemist enough to discover at all events there can be no doubt that on this thundery sunday afternoon a sup of it out of her thick pink and white delft cup with embossed coral sprays on the sides materially helped to restore poor mrs doyne who began to feebly struggle back from her long swoon or trance just as dan and his son by some neatly joined pieces of good luck arrived at her door so rapidly did she revive that he was soon able to pronounce her elegant and grand 
and to diagnose her case as just some queer turn the ugly weather'd been after givin her but glory be to goodness she'd find herself completely the better of it by to-morrow or next day outside her door however he said with emphasis ay she'll do rightly but she's weak these times the poor woman feeble i might say and if she's tormented with anything or gave frights to or botherations with folks risin argufiments about blathers and nonsense there's no sayin' but she might be slippin' away with herself sudden on you is one of these fine days she just might and so i tell you plainly which makes me think that mrs kilfoyle may have dropped him a hint then when dan had prescribed a stup of marshmallows for terence's sprain his professional duties were discharged and he was at liberty to indulge himself and his neighbours with more lively conversation it really seemed as if the electrical condition of the atmosphere must have given a fillip to the march of events in and around lisconnel so much more than usual happened thereabouts on that day who do you think are after making a match of it dan said towards the end of his budget of news it was only settled this morning the young chap was tellin' me and we comin' along why maggie farrelly no less and a farmer's son from off one of inish's a young man of the name of and a decent lad i'm told if they're the people i'm supposin they own cows maybe he's got no great prize with her not but what she's well lookin enough i'd not go for to sayin anything too bad agin the girl but in my opinion she's a bit of a rogue over fond of keepin the lads fandanglin after her to be makin fools of them accordin as she may fancy och very belike she might settle down now that she's sorted out one for herself only i'd lief as not she's no dalins wid any belongings o' mine do you know a while ago i had a notion she was thinkin where's dan got to sure is that him above there lookin out over the road i'd a notion she was thinkin of gettin round him for i noticed him goin about wid her followin a couple of times or so but he swears be this and be that that there was ne'er a talk of any such a thing on his part twas a friend of his was about courtin her and axed him to keep around and be slippin in a word now and again might give her mind a sort of slant to begin wit that was foolish enough too in all conscience to be for slinkin in on another lad's tongue instead of speakin up and biddin the girl to take him or leave him on his own recommendations anyway the end of the matter is that she's sacked her old sweethearts every man jack of them and took up with this one she hadn't set eyes on they say a couple of weeks since musha then old horny himself might take mag farrelly and welcome for me said terence doyne who was so exhilarated by the reaction of his escape from despair to security that it was all his lamed foot could do to keep him from dancing oh for me said his brother matt who also felt at peace with the world and the whole lot of them into the bargain they're mostly more bother than they're worth a dale i'll go and be gettin some of the mallow for his foot and stacy can give it a boil when she comes home she'll be here directly within maggin farrelly indeed said judy ryan who had as she said herself no opinion by which she meant a bad one of the bride elect cock her up wid a fine young man like your son dan he's got more wit than to look the side of road she is i'll go bail there's not one of those farrelly's i'd give the black me eye for a slutherin deceptionable set soon after that the elder dan joined his son upon the hill and they fared homewards presently falling in as we have seen with a party of friends it would indeed have been rather inhuman to keep stacy doyne so long upon the road as i have done were it not that she was all the while in paradise where people overlook such trivialities as being wet through and tired out with a many miles tramp 
and having had nothing to eat for nearly a round of the clock. "'And how at all did you hear tell of it, Dan?' inquired Mrs. McGurk, "'when nobody had an idea where to be looking for you, "'and one's liker to lose oneself than to find any one else round on the bog "'if one goes chancing it.' "'Twas the young chap,' said Dan, pointing to his son. "'He met with a couple of spalpeens, inquiring for me not far from our place, "'so he legged it after me there, but I'd quit out of there before he came, "'and then he followed me to Brasnakil where he got me. "'So he's had great running over the country this day, the young rapscallion.' "'Truth,' said young Dan, "'I'd run twist that far for Stacy Doyne any day of the year,' or oh, for any one belonging to her, and she knows it. No declaration could, according to Liz Connell Cannons, have been more explicitly worded. It startled them all severely, young Dan himself not excepted. If Stacy had shown herself by any means equal to the occasion, she would at least have responded. "'Know it,' says he, bedad, and indeed it's himself has the wonderful notions about what I may happen to know. Sure he's just talkin' foolish. But she was taken somewhat at a disadvantage, and in fact said nothing at all. Tearin' ages, said Dan's father, and is that the way the wind with you? Well, to be sure, but there's no bein' up to the likes of you. Be gorra, I might a known he'd something in his head when he was runnin' me off of me misfortunate old legs all the way over from yonder to here this mornin'. I'd as lief have been in leadin' strings to an unruly bullock. Not that I'm denyin' he might easier took up wid some one worser. There's no decenter people on this countryside than the Doines and little Stacy. However, Mrs. McGurk, we that have the wit are to be pitied now, aren't we? With them young gummerals, the crutches. Old Dan Chagrin was about half earnest. His inordinate pride in his handsome son compelling him to think but poorly of anybody considered as a possible daughter-in-law, while his general philanthropy disposed him to make the best of everybody that came in his way, none the less when appearing in the shape of a pretty, pleasant-spoken slip of a colleen, with whom he had been acquainted ever since she was big enough to crawl out of her door at him as he passed. The result of these conflicting tendencies here was a vacillation between censoriousness and indulgence, which made it difficult for him to preserve a consistent demeanour. "'I'll tell you one thing, and that's not two, he said with a sudden access of resolution caused by a glance around him. "'We'd better all of us be stepping home if we had enough of drowning to satisfy us for this day. The sky's clouding over again, like as if the store might be planning to give us another bout. Begob now, Dan, there's no call for you to be seeing Stacy over the hill. The child's in a hurry to run home to her mother, and you'd just delay her, for be don't I know as well as if I was inside you that you'll be taken off with yourself over here the first thing tomorrow. For where's the sense of biding for a wettin' tonight? There's a sun-dog over yonder again, that black cloud, and look at them creatures crawlin', you may say, on their wings. There's nary a sure sign of rain. The swallows, praying towards storms, were indeed flying very low, sweeping in such immense circles that their return seemed as problematical as the reappearance of a periodic comet, darkly piled up cloud masses still hovered and drifted spreading deep purple shadows over the bog gloom folded on gloom ready to league with the gathering twilight but just as stacy returned to run home the sun now dropped very far down in the west found a little round hole in a grim black wall and through it flashed up obliquely a jet of golden amber fire broadening fanwise sheer across the sky it set all the raindrops twinkling where every leaf and blade had its drop and it glistened and shimmered in many a brimming pool speeding down the hill stacy felt as if she were flying into an enchanted dazzling sort of world on new and wonderful wings 
a neighbour of hers however who was sedately going the same way observed it looks bad for the weather when the sun makes a chimney like yon we'll be apt to have a wet night and another replied i doubt we're not done with the thunder yet chapter eight between two lady days the lady day in harvest which fell six weeks or so after the electrical july sunday was splendidly fine in lisconnel steeped through and through with ripe august sunshine and unruffled by any restless breeze its serene beauty jarred upon stacy doyne's mood and though she did not guess helped to make the lag-foot hours halt by more slowly and heavily but she was keenlier alive to a sense of aggravating circumstances when at an early period of the morning it became evident that mad bell seized by one of her irresistible lyrical frenzies had been driven to establish herself on a sun-smitten bank near her door whence her shrill singing resounded far and wide what she sang loudest and longest was a favorite ditty beginning before i was married i used to drink tay but since i am married tis buttermilk way before i was married i sat in the parlor but since i am married tis the ash corner a wish to escape beyond the range of that oft-repeated air led stacy to ramble away further than she otherwise would have done over the heathery crests of the knockhorn where the sombre ruddied bloom against the black peat mould suggested the smouldering and charring of half-extinguished embers until at last she sat down on a boulder between two sheltering clumps of broom and firs which made her a low-roofed bower here mad bell was too far off for the tune or words only a faint skirl came fitfully borne upon a flagging breeze scarcely a trace as chemists say upon the surrounding atmosphere of stillness nothing else broke it either with motion or sound except when even and anon a flight of little wild birds got up suddenly in the distance like a handful of dust tossed into the air and when a curlew cried plaintively across the bog a cunning tone poet who can set a whole landscape to melancholy in one quick chromatic phrase stacy wanted indeed no external incitements to sadness having at present ample grounds for it in her own situation and reflections this radiant summer morning with its arc of moteless sapphire and high tides of unstinted shining should have ushered in her wedding day it had all been arranged weeks ago ages ago it did seem to her now for the elder dan's dissatisfaction with his son's choice had melted away rapidly and completely in point of fact on that very eventful sunday evening when the matter first came to light the two o'burns had on their homeward way met the cross priest posting up to lisconnel in obedience to a tragical summons and in the course of the explanations which ensued the good-natured blacksmith betrayed himself into tacitly withdrawing any meditated opposition to the match so your reverence there's a little signs of a burying over this business at all at all said he but i wouldn't say as much concernin a weddin troth no i'd not for to tell your reverence the truth it's my belief that young gomeral there has a notion himself and little stacy doyne to be troublin you or father rooney long life to him one of these days och begorra that's the worth of the likes of them dan privately thought that the three kingdoms would have been put to to produce the likes of his son what better need you expect father carroll was humane enough to hear with relief that after all none of his 
parishioners had been burned alive or blinded and he naturally rejoiced at the abridgment of his long late ride so he received the news more genially than usual and as he turned his horse's willing head he shook his whip handle jocularly at young dan saying indeed now o'burn i wouldn't put it past them the pair of them but if you're for settin up a wife dan you'll have to be steady and stick to your work and mind what you're about clap on your blinkers me lad and keep the road straight before you or you'll land more than yourself in the ditch dan who looked very unwontedly sheepish kicked the lump of turf in front of him further than his own shadow which stretched a long way distortedly through the beams of the rising moon as he answered och sure me father wouldn't get his health if he didn't be talkin so he wouldn't be the hokey it's a wonderful man he is for romancin entirely after this the current of the young couple's affairs so far as they stood upon the choice of friends was practically unimpeded and their wooing undoubtedly deserved the benison pronounced on those which are conducted with dispatch but the edict of destiny fulfils itself in many ways at the same time when young dan entered into his engagement with stacy doyne he had a prior one on hand which his new tie did not dispose or rather forbade him to break this was a journey all the way up to the county antrim where a friend of his held out prospects for a four weeks job at a compressed peat manufactory the manager of which found labor scarce in those harvesting days now young dan o'burn being not only strong and stalwart but endowed with an intuitive gift of understanding the queerness of all sorts of machinery thomas mccrum the northerner who had himself got the promise of work up there made no manner of doubt that so desirable a hand would find at all events temporary employment and a scale of remuneration which sounded prodigious in the ears of lisconnel dan's contemplated marriage rendered the acquisition of a little ready money in a high degree expedient if not absolutely necessary for his father's philanthropy was of a humble personal kind never known to enrich or in any way aggrandize the family in which it runs and the o'burns despite forge and shebeen were hardly better off than their struggling neighbors given a pound or two in hand for the purchase of a few odd sticks of things and the rent of a cabin down below dan and stacy could start housekeeping with light hearts failing that the match would be held imprudent even by people who entertained the most moderate views about marriage settlements so dan went off one morning confident of returning with at least that sum a clear fortnight before lady day which had been fixed for the wedding stacy had plenty to distract her mind during his absence there was the trousseau for one thing her mother sold their pig prematurely at somewhat of a sacrifice that she might be able to buy a sufficiently of hideous strong brown wincey for a body and a skirt these two articles of clothing are seldom simultaneously acquired in lisconnel and when in the course of the negotiations at his shop in the town mr corr learned the purpose for which the stuff was required he added gratis some yards of the stoutest grey holland in his stock to make stacy a couple of large aprons pruskines she called them whereupon lisconnel opined that mr corr always was a kind-hearted poor man then the wedding itself furnished a theme for endless planning and discussion especially when farmer hilferthy down below actually promised the loan of his jaunting car to meet the bridal party at clayson's boreen halfway to the chapel stacy had never in her life been on a car or any other vehicle 
and the prospect of the drive evidently heightened more than one would have imagined her sense of the solemnity and importance of the whole ceremony thus the days bustled on blithely enough burnished up for her by the gleams of a happy hour which she knew came stealing towards her yet when it arrived it proved to be the turning point whence all her fortunes began to wane through a twilight of doubt and despondency to an ever-deepening despair dan did not reappear on the day when he was expected stacy in her ignorance felt not a little aggrieved at the delay although she was quite sure that the next morning would bring him twelve hours seem a vast void of time when you have already begun to count your intervening minutes one by one but after two or three more days had trailed immeasurably by she would have been humbly thankful for an assurance that she would see him again within a twelvemonth so quickly may we learn to abate our claims upon good fortune it wanted just a week of the wedding day when a man casually observed to stacy's brother matt as they were hooding stooks below at hillferthy's that he had seen dan o'byrne going on board the stranraer steamer up at larne shortly before he had himself returned to lisconnel the poor little bride-elect put a brave face on the matter when the news was communicated to her and said cheerfully that dan would be apt to be writing to explain the way of it but in truth her heart sank down and down and she felt a miserable conviction that no letter was coming soon too she knew though they say swished woman and broke off when she came near how the neighbors were often standing in knots and saying it had a bad appearance his slipping off out of the country that fashion without a word to anybody it looked like as if he had a notion of running away from the match the sight of those shawled heads bobbing together over her fate chilled stacy with despair at times and at others stung her with a wrathful pang under which she could almost have found it in her heart to break up their conclave violently accusing them to their faces of telling lies and talking blathers and nonsense but she always stopped short of any such strong measures quailing before her consciousness that her life was being overcast by a great black cloud in the coming on of which this gossip's gabble seemed merely a trivial fringe of shadow and the one discourtesy she used was to shrink away from all occasions of discourse either sitting mute in a retired recess of the dark cabin room or roaming off into the bog where the solitude and silence toned down the brightness of the clear careless skies and made it more endurable in this way it came about that the blue vaulted forenoon which by rights should have seen her conversion into mrs daniel o'byrne was spent by stacy in solitary forlornness crouched among the sad green furzes minding the old goat was how she described her occupation to her neighbors and that a few hours later found her standing up uncomforted on the ridge turning mournful gray eyes listlessly towards the rose and daffodil sunset before she crept home through the gloaming lit by no brighter hope than the prospect of sleepily forgetting her troubles until to-morrow days such as this came to her in a sequence for amid the mellow sunshine of the late summer weather which was transmuting the grain fields to roughened gold and staining the briar leaves with bronze and crimson and bringing out the dim purplish bloom of all the wild dark berries dewberries and fronds and sloes and even finishing off the little grey lichen cups with red sealing wax rims stacy's hopes were shrivelling up and withering away she did not really try to blind herself whatever means she would fain have confronted her world with each blank morning and each cheerless evening 
heard her paraphrase even here i will put off my hope and keep it no longer for my flatterer most piteous of vows not oftener made than broken after a few weeks had passed she used to pray to her saints that she might not know of anybody going down to the town because she could not avoid the bitter moment of watching him return without letters or tidings yet stacy sad as her plight should not monopolize our sympathy young dan's unaccountable non-appearance flung a portentous shadow across his father's horizon he was slower than the girl to take the alarm his wider experience suggesting a larger variety of harmless contingencies but when once fear got firm hold of him it gripped him with a hardly less agonizing rigor if anything misfortunate had took and happened his big handsome son the light of his eyes had been put out but if the truth were that the lad had played a villain's trick on them had given the lie to his grand promise and ran off from them leaving the girl to break her heart why then old dan was doubly bereft both of trust and hope moreover his distress was complicated by a feeling of compunction and responsibility towards stacy and her family which made the sight of them painful to him and still forbade him to keep out of their way "'Twasn't the lad's own fault, that's certain,' he said one November day, sitting on an old potato creel by Mrs. Doyne's fire. "'If I know the differ between Porther and Potheen, he'd no more go for to do us a turn like that, except again his will, than he'd reave the eyes out of his head. There's something gone amiss with him that we haven't heard tell of.' true for you dan said mrs doyne resignedly i put it on them old steamboats myself there's nothing more dangerous sure the only time i ever made free with one of them a matter of twenty year back away down at loch carib i came as nigh losing me life as you could think set me foot over the edge of the bit of plank they'd laid down for the people to step on board by and in the black water i'd ha been only poor mick grabbed hold of me and sure if dad done such a thing and he travel in the deep seas let alone a loch what chanced he'd have but goin to the bottom oh, where's the use of the talk they keep of his sendin word in letters and he all the while lyin drowned dead the lord have mercy on his soul och then goodness guide you mrs doyne woman but do you think the lads are born natural that he's not got the wit to step the length of a bit of gangway without blunderin overboard like an old blind horse truth it's a queer thing if a young man can't take a taste of diversion for once in a way but everybody must settle to murder him behind his back some of them do say twas that maggie farrelly he'd his mind set on all the while and he's took off out of this liefer than content himself wid any one else it's no credit to him to serve us that way and the decent lad he seemed and the hope he thought of stacy bedad he wouldn't have given her for his pick of the stars out of the sky if you would believe him i'd never a supposed it of him so i wouldn't and it's great old lies they were tellin whoever told you that maggie farrelly bedad divil a hapworth she was to him let alone he isn't the slavine to be playin fast and loose wid your decent slip of a daughter it's little they'd to do to be puttin them bad stories on him when he's overtook wid goodness can tell what ill luck away from his own country musha man alive isn't that what i was sayin a minute ago drowned he may have been for certain but there's a plenty more manners of destruction in it plenty sure the strongest ever stepped might be took sudden like a candle light in a puff of wind the saints protect us all there was peter malloy of glenish as fine a young man as you'd see at mass one sunday and waked the next a beautiful corpse he made and so would poor dan unless it was drowned after all and no layin out to be done on him bad manners to it woman what talk you have of wakin and buryin and maggie farrelly cock her up 
but it's true enough there do be girls will get round a man wid their slutherin till he'll scarce know for a while what he's at for a while just it's past my belief that ought ud hold him long away from all of us here i'm waitin wid a job of plough mendin i have until he's back och well it's yourself knows the world dad and to be sure he might easy enough get into bad company in them parts and he had nobody to advise him agin it or prevent them making a fool of him the young boostoon with nary a trachine of sense in his head sense in it be jabbers dan's got twice the sense of many a man double his age and more to the back of that it's liker than something's dispirits after happenin him the creature but deed and if the end of it was to have been his comin home married to another girl as some of them supposin it's as black a day for us twould here stacy to whom this balancing of probabilities had been as soothing as alternate stabs of ice and flame stole forth from her dusky corner and slipped out at the door her mother however just saw her vanish and said dismayed that was stacy herself well now i've a head and so's a pin i might have remembered she was in afore you did we'd a right a held our tongues as stacy emerged into the honey-coloured westering light and began to saunter about aimlessly in the narrow grassy foot-tracks which threaded the shag of firs and heather on the slope behind her dwelling she was descried by a group of neighbours who a little way off were watching brian kilfoyle cut scraws from a green swarded bank for the repair of his roof when she guessed their observation she made a feint of looking for bogberries which were as every one knew no longer in season and moved slowly off out of sight there goes poor stacy doyne said mrs brian moonin along like some desolate old creature it's a pity to see her i just wish i had the regulatin o that young rip dan o'burn said mrs quigley i'd give him a goin over he wouldn't be apt to forget in one while sure how can we tell he's to blame said mrs brian something's maybe gone agin him but anyway poor stacy might as well put the thought of him out of her mind as soon as she can contrive it there's scarce a likeliness of his iver showin his face again in lisconnel we'll see that some wisp of cloud that's after sailin in behind the sun there come sailin back to us first if you ask my opinion och stacy stacy doyne she wouldn't be overlong troubled frettin after him if she had but the chance of ever any one handy said sally sheridan her words tumbling out thickly in a sudden spiteful flurry as if they had been pent up unspoken for an irksome length of time she'll never want for a sweetheart if it depends on herself though maybe she doesn't find them so easy to pick up i'm thinkin twas herself done most of the courtin for young o'burn he was in no great hurry over the matter at all events he was in a greater one to be shut of her just look here me good girl said the widow mcgurk you've no call to be saying any such a thing now none whatsoever even supposing it was the truth you are tellin instead of a black lie little stacy doyne's not the sort to be courtin herself sweethearts and she's no need sorrow a bit has she for whatever may have come to him since twas plain to be seen young dan thought the world hadn't her match or anything fine enough for her in it and let me tell you sally sheridan said mrs rafferty that when a girl passes them kind of remarks other people do be very apt to think she's judging accordin to her own carryings on and it gives her an uncommon unpleasant appearance miss sally was in reality considerably disconcerted by the rebuke of her elders who stood eyeing her severely from beneath their fluttering shawls and who obviously had the sense of the company with them however she would not let on that she minded and strolled away snatching at the bushes as she passed and humming a surly tune in a manner 
meant to indicate unconcern but it's a pity so it is about stacy resumed mrs bryan you can see to be the look of her that she's just frettin herself to flitter jigs and her poor mother was tellin me yesterday that she'll scarce open her lips from mornin till night but sits mopin in the corner or streels off by herself on the bog the poor woman's fairly distracted wid uneasiness and i don't wonder at it they do say twas a disappointment of that sort gave mad bell's wits a turn and if stacy was to go like her demented poor old buddy bedad twould be a sorrowful sight and fit to break the hearts of them that reared her sakes and patience jim keep from under our feet there's a good child i was near waddlin over you that time like an old duck talking of mad bell said mrs rafferty she's away wid herself again set off this morning afore it was light so big anne told me says she to anne i'm afeard says she of them deep snowdrifts out there on the bog goodness can tell what put snow in the creature's head starvin and perishin starvin and perishin says she twill be wid use here this winter and i'm away to the people where the ships is galway belike so off she went well now that's a bad hearin mark my words said mrs quickly lookin scared mad bell and folks like her do have surprisin notions about things wherever they get them but there's no great signs that i can see of a hard winter comin on us would you say there was brian i don't know said brian trimming the edges of a symmetrical smooth green sod i perceived a couple of seagulls flyin inland this mornin straight and steady bad cess to them but brian pursued mrs quigley dropping her voice have you heard any talk lately about them ones for since young mick ryan och blathers said brian whisht whisht then said mrs brian turning away hastily the child's a listenin anyhow i must be steppin home and i said mrs quigley weary on it she observed dejectedly as she went down the road maybe stacy's as well out of settin up wid housekeepin these times if she knew but all starvin's bad enough for yourself but when it comes to the childer och wirra that's starvin wid heart breakin tacked on to the end of it stacy however was as yet in no mood to take a philosophical view of the situation she still carried her trouble in both hands as we do with such things while they are new to us afterwards we generally stow them away in a pack which we keep on our shoulders where they make their weight felt it is true but do not hinder us from going more or less heavily about our wanted avocations and in mere course of time stacy might so have disposed of hers even if nothing had occurred to accelerate matters a day or two afterwards she fell in with a crony of hers on one of her dismal bog trottings jim kilfoyle was a man who for some four years had been contemplating his world through a pair of very large and observant irish blue eyes and drawing his own conclusions therefrom with an independence of thought which often gave the charm of originality to his theories on the present occasion they had guided him to a spray of belated blackberries which the vague november sunbeams had scarcely tinged even with the crudest red but which he had no scruples about plucking in their rathest immaturity the berries are too green to be aten jimmy stacy remonstrated mildly but he curtly replied here's two ones for yourself and let me have a bit of food in peace so she prudently gave up the point when he had swallowed with inexplicable satisfaction the last hard knob of sour seeds he sat staring at stacy for some time and then said meditatively i don't think you look anyways so like mad bell stacy mercy be among us jim like mad bell stacy said with a little laugh 
at eighteen a pretty girl's vanity is perhaps the last peak to be submerged and the first to reappear in any swelling tide of affliction and a comparison between herself and a wizened little old cracked woman could not but strike her as grotesquely incongruous sure what at all should ail me to be looking like mad bell poor old creature your mother says so then said jim rather sternly for he suspected a disabling of his judgment in stacy's laugh she and mrs quigley yesterday when you were above on the hill streelin about like mad bell they said you were and fit to break everybody's heart did they say anything else jim said stacy with a catch in her voice as if an icy gust had blown in her face and taken away her breath dunno said jim and either could not or would not supply any further information but what he had stated made her feel hot and cold hitherto so far as her dreary preoccupation allowed her to consider external affairs she had believed that she was keeping her miseries strictly to herself and betraying to nobody how her world had been turned into a wilderness and now she abruptly learned that her conduct had led her neighbours to suppose her going daft an intolerable revelation against which all her pride rose up in arms it found an auxiliary in the feeling of self-reproach roused by jim's reference to the breaking of everybody's heart for she knew very well that everybody in this connection could only mean her mother towards whom she was conscious of having displayed during the past weeks a frank morosity and undisguised gloom as cross as any old weasel and as contrary as anything you could give a name to she called herself in her awakening remorse under such circumstances this demeanour rightly interpreted is often really tantamount to a friendly vote of confidence yet it blackens in the retrospect when the memory sensitized by the touch of conscience is exposed to a new point of view as stacy sat silently beside the silent jim who had fallen to grubbing droves of scampering ants out of crevices in the bank with a little bit of twig her thoughts turned upon troubles of which she was not the isolated victim and when she presently got up and moved away she said to herself i'll slip home and be digging the potatoes for dinner the resolution sounded scarcely heroic yet it nevertheless marks the place where stacy so to speak faced about a retreat in some disorder had been converted into a rally as if in confirmation of the saying that fortune favors the brave stacy soon happened upon a small scrap of comfort which flimsy as was its material sometimes stood her in good stead on that same afternoon her half instinctive groping about among her scanty resources for some object of distraction ended in a determination to step out and ask peg sheridan for the loan of a skein of yarn with which she might set herself up a piece of knitting peg's been uncommon good-natured she reflected she let me have it in a minute if she's got air a thread but on her way to the sheridans stacy was overtaken by old oddy rafferty who quitted his digging to shout that he hadn't seen her for a month of sundays and came shuffling down the potato drill with uneludable nimbleness to intercept her at the dyke she could not without marked incivility avoid stopping to speak and when they had duly said how's yourself this long while and finally glory be to goodness oddy prevented her from passing on by catching a corner of her shawl stacy me child listen now to me he said i was wantin to tell you you've no call to be discouraged anyways about young dan not comin home stacy listened submissively she was by this time acquainted with most of her neighbours several theories on her sweetheart's defection and they were not on the whole consolatory i'll tell you the way of it stacy he said he's just took and enlisted 
that's what he's after doin and don't believe any one that says anything different sure i've a right to know what i'm talkin about considerin i've been well acquainted with the lad from the time he was three feet high that stands six foot two this day in his stocking feet it's many the mile we've tramped together himself and meself and misfortunate poor jinny and i know as well as i know me own name that he'd a great notion of soldierin truth i could have told you that much ever since one day i saw him standin lookin after a military band that went by us down at kilmacrone and be the powers of smoke he'll have a grand dragoon dan will proud any regiment might be to get a hold of him twould do one's heart good to see him in his uniform and so we will one of these fine days for you may depend he's just schemin to give us a queer old surprise wid marchin in on us in all his illigance and that's the reason why he's niver said a word just to take us unbeknownst not but what it might be a while first i shouldn't wonder if dan was apt to wait till he's got a bit of promotion the idea i have in me own mind is that he'll likely put it off till he's riz to be a colour sergeant i fancy that oddy's own mind supposed this officer to derive his title from the peculiar gorgeousness of his accoutrements and then he'll come back a sight to behold he that went off with the daylight shinin through the old coat that was on him like a blinkin behind a gaped dyke och stacy it's a proud girl you be that day jewel that set up you'll scarce have a word for one of the rest of us i'm sure i never thought to mind him bein raggedy like said stacy piteously and how'd he come home sergeant or no if there'd maybe sendin him off to be kilt in the wars is it kilt devil a much why for one thing i don't believe there's ever a war in it now good or bad i was spellin over an old cork examiner a couple of days ago and saw a sign o war could i see in it at all no more than if the world had took to will windin and another thing is accordin to what i'm informed the troops these times don't ever get fightin rightly at all but just sling about easy miles off each other and let fly an odd cannon-ball or so now and again to pacify whoever it was sent them out so it's a comical thing if an infant child let alone a grown man couldn't stand clear of that much without puttin himself greatly about i tell you you needn't be vexin your mind stacy for as sure as me soul's in me body it's enlisted dan is and steppin home to lisconnel he'll be afore we're any of us much older he's the lad that it never go for to disremember the old people and the old place let alone his bit of a colleen de not if he was to become head commander in general by land and say End of section 6section seven of irish idols by jane barlow this librivox recording is in the public domain section seven oddy spoke with sincere conviction and a wanted authoritativeness which did not fail to impress stacy and through many succeeding days she clung to the color sergeant hypothesis as desperately as if it had been a life boy instead of a straw in the long dark evenings when it was too cold to lie down away from the fire on the puddly floor and in the bleak mornings when life walking up found naught the answer persistently elicited by computations of happiness in prospect a result which eighteen years old is prone to regard as a reductio ad impossible stacy sometimes shut out intrusive despairs with the help of oddy's glowing picture only it invariably happened that the martial figure flaring and glittering along 
the bog road turned before he came very near into just dan himself in his old scarecrow tatters without any splendour or brilliancy at all she had much need in truth of whatever cheering figments either faith or fancy could frame for this winter was a pitiless season in lisconnel and its inhabitants one december night they all shivered sorely in their lairs of heather and rags as if the breath of a bitter frost were abroad still in the morning no traces of such were visible unless you noticed that the lingering brier and bracken leaves seemed suddenly to have been dipped in fiery vivid scarlet and orange but when the potatoes for the next meal were gathered faces lengthened and heads shook for experienced eyes at once recognized signs of a frost biting that must entail a serious shrinkage of estimated supplies and soon after that they began to draw omens from the flights of birds flocks mainly of seagulls small and great who came swooping over the murk of the bog lighting on it in patches of foam scattered momentarily in a flickering of white wings as they fled on further inland herons too passed heavily and gloomily flapping and croaking and long trains of wild duck scudding by like trails of smoke that knew where it was going till they dwindled into blurred pencil marks on the horizon all these if they did not exactly belong to the nation of unfortunate and fatal birds were watched coming and going by foreboding eyes as the harbingers of powerful severe weather when they do be that plenty and sure enough before christmas there was deep snow it came wavering across the bogland on a northwest wind and lay strewn at first in handfuls and then in armfuls till at last a huge lead-coloured cloud appeared to shatter itself sheer over lisconnel like as if to quote pat ryan you were crumbling a soft clod of clay between your two hands and thence forward all was one blank of white only broken here and there by the black mouth of a bog hole even these filled eventually as the water in them froze hard and made of each a secret resting place for the whirling drifts pitfalls into one of which the quigley's fawn-coloured goat floundered down poor wretch to her smothering death for the snow was accompanied by such a biting frost as seldom grips lisconnel and the tiny dry flakes and granules seemed to be ground fine and driven in tangible mists of stinging dust on the wide wailing storm it's a good chance we're gettin to understand the sayin when you see the snow like salt and mail your food and fire be apt to fail brian kilfoyle said one day ruthfully kicking at a glittering powdery drift which had sifted under the doyne's rickety door into their house where he was talking to stacy and her mother brian who is normally a big burly man at that time had assumed in common with his neighbors the aspect of an incomplete structure a framework with much filling out left to do it's seven weeks lyin on us now since christmas and here's candlemas with nary a sign of the change yet but i'm glad to see you holdin up so well again it ma'am walk indeed i'm keepin elegant and grand thank god said mrs doyne nervously fingering the largest hole in her frayed-out apron but as for stacy there the crature her face this minute isn't the breath of the palm of me hand the two eyes of her'll presently be runnin into one stacy shrank further into the background at the sound of her own name and brian kilfoyle said ah sure young things like her do be easy perished ay and the old people too there's me poor mother she and little jim since the bad turn he took a while ago they don't seem to have an atom of warmth left in them 
scarce a wink they sleep at night with the cold though we do give them every rag we can contrive our hearts are fairly broke with them for me mother if we don't mind her will be slippin the wisp of an old cloak off her onto one of the childer and gettin her death and that jim does be creepin from one to the other like a lost dog at a fair tryin for a taste of heat somewheres the misfortunate little spillane his hands grabbin you to be just dabs of ice but devil a thraneen more have we got to put on them there was a painful pause and then mrs doyne said apologetically i wish to goodness gracious brian i could offer you the loan of air an old wrap but indeed it's hard set we are man to keep the life from freezin stiff in ourselves these times with the most we've got to be sure to be sure ma'am brian said in hurried deprecation how would you sure we must all shift for ourselves the best way we can and we'll do right enough once this blamed black frost quits a hold brian had now carried out the purpose of his call but he could not betray the fact by immediate departure so he lingered gossiping in the doorway began's sleepin up at widdy mcgurk's these couple of nights back did you hear tell he began she got that scared and lonesome there be herself she couldn't abide it for mad bell was as we know absent and the dummy had been some years dead so they were sayin said mrs doyne but look a brian lowering her voice solemnly div you know was there anything special frightened her well yes he answered in a reluctant sort of mumble a foot goin up and down along be her door and nobody on the road and something that shook the latch and let a keen and never a breath o wind stirrin leastwise that's the story she has but just you tell me how many nights in the year there is without a waft of wind goin through it and as for them bastes of goats times and again i've mistook a one of them pattin by for somethin in brogues howsomever what fairly terrified her was a voice that keep callin ann big ann imitatin first one neighbour and then another and different in a, a manner from them all she says twas such hideous clear moonlight she durstn't look out and she lay in a cold tremble till the mornin listenin to a tappin on the window she'd stopped up the pane with her old saucepan lid for afraid she might see somethin that was rattlin belike saints shield us around said mrs doyne crossing herself we'd be well put off if there was nothin worse than saucepan rattlin you've heard tell what happened young mick ryan about holy eve when he'd a crib set for snipe be the river ryan only said ay ay uninvitingly but she could not forego the recital just lifted a basket he was when he looked up and if there wasn't one of them standin on the opposite bank right front of him wid only the flow of the bit of stream between them and the other comin jiggin over along the strip of field not a stone's throw off troth poor mick thought he couldn't get his heels out of it fast enough i wonder he didn't lose his wits for good when he fetched home his people thought he was blind drunk och mercy what it all's yon out there brian she interrupted herself suddenly clutching him by the arm and pointing through the open door far out upon the blanched waste something there was moving dimly in the thickened light of the gloaming but whether the form of man or beast or of neither could not be told brian without speaking went a step outside and seemed to measure the distance which intervened between his own door and the place where he stood it's just merely one of the goats traipsin around he said then he made a plunge and rushed towards his cabin across the clogging snow stumbling and tripping in a headlong haste for which there was nothing apparent to account mrs doyne banged and bolted the door behind him and when long afterwards her two sons came home they were obliged to kick and shake it for some time with much strong language uttered in unmistakably familiar tones before courage enough was screwed up inside to give them admission on the next morning mrs doyne 
coming in with an icicle-fringed bucket, sustained another shock of a different kind. Stacy was sitting with folds of brown stuff spread about her, and with needle and thread in hand. It was the material got for her wedding gown, cut out by Biddy Ryan, who is queer and cute about such things, and partially sewn together by Stacy's mother before the day when the girl had passionately implored that it might be put away out of her sight, since when it was lain hidden underneath the dresser. I was considerin' the skirt would make a little sort of frock like for the Kilfoyle's gym, Stacy said in explanation. Tis bad to be thinkin' of the bit of an imp perishin' all night. Then the length of grey holland would make a petticoat might help to keep the life in old Mrs. Kilfoyle. I'd be sorry anything took her. The old woman had soothed Stacy's spirit by expressing confidence in the honesty of Dan and there'll be enough wincy left yet to ridy up a body for your ugly old self. Oh, honey, but supposing you might be wanting it one of these days after all, said Mrs. Doyne, unable to refrain from a protest against this implied abandonment of hope. Never a want I'll want it, said Stacy. He's dead and gone, Mother Jewel. Tis a sin to lave it lying up. There's a beautiful warmth in it and I've set me mind on it uncommon. So Mrs. Doyne assented, as she would to most things upon which Stacy, with her great wistful eyes, had set her mind. This acquiescence, however, not barring sundry bitter thoughts of a Dan, hypothetically in the land of the living. Stacy sewed hard all day, with horrible gobble-stitches, it must be owned, for her education had been sadly neglected in many of its branches, besides which the cold would scarcely let her hold the needle. By the time the daylight failed, she had finished two very quaint garments, whose cut would not bear criticism but warm and stout of fabric. She felt impatient to convey them to the Kilfoyles, yet as she looked out over the gleaming snow which had drawn all the light down out of the blank sky some uncanny thoughts came before her mind so vividly that she shrank from traversing even those few rods of ground alone and she determined to wait until her brothers came in but as the evening wore on and they did not arrive she grew more and more fidgety it would be a cruel pity to let jim freeze through another whole night his small cold hands seemed to keep dragging her towards the door, and at last she said to herself that she would chance it. Maybe there wasn't a word of truth in them queer stories all the while. She'd never seen aught. Watching her time, therefore, she stole out unobserved with her bundle into the moonlight. She wished it had not been so bright, just to run on blindly through dark shadows, which kept discreetly hidden whatever unchancy objects they might hold, would have seemed easier than to face that broad white glare, where anything dreadful would be seen so very plainly. The rush was made, however, without incident, and then Stacy sped out of the Kilfoyle's cabin almost as precipitately as she had sped into it, running away from the bewildered gratitude of its inhabitants, and the importunate memories and contrasts which this final disposition of her wedding gear did not fail to arouse. But when she had gone only a few paces from their door, a sudden panic seized her. She was compelled by a sort of irresistible fascination to look fearfully round over the wilds that lay stark about and about her, as solitary as the unfathomed blue-black deeps with their frost burnished full moon and light drowned star flecks wafts of wind came murmuring from the far distance here and there sweeping up a whirl of powdery flakes as if some one lifted a corner of the great white sheet and let it fall again in a rumpled fold the wind of course was full of sighs and voices and shadows wavered and flitted on the snow how could she tell what they might be? Suppose she should meet that strange little crying child whom people said sometimes ran after them, 
when they were late abroad on the bog or the limping old woman who laughs in your face as she goes by terror whirled through stacy's thoughts like an autumn gust among a drift of fallen leaves she began to dart along as fast as the deep snow a nightmare-like drag would permit and she kept her eyes fixed desperately on the track she trod in quite near her own door however she had to slacken her pace because across her path stretched two furrow-shaped snowdrifts into whose ungaged depths she dared not plunge her bare foot and as she paused a moment irresolute a voice close by spoke abruptly you'll have to get over them it said in standing leaps as the devil went through a throne stacy did not scream or fly for she knew the voice and it was one which would have reassured her in the teeth of a north american blizzard or the heart of a west indian cyclone so it's yourself dan she said dan o'byrne it was a tall gaunt ragged figure standing up blackly just beyond the sharp-cut shadow of the doyne's cabin wall ay tis so he said with an anxious hurry in his manner and are you thinking entirely too bad of me stacy that i stayed away so long and you not hearin a word i'm told except the letter i sent be paddy lochlin the stuckhorn that you never got meself it is sure enough and pounds and pounds and something i stopped to get you up at larn only there's the use of one hand mostly destroyed on me and i don't know tellin you the truth if i ever walk any better than a trifle lame wid me left foot just a trifle och but stacy a store maybe you'd liefer have naught to say to such an old bastoon of misery sure it's all one said stacy why you stayed away since it's home you are again and the sorrow o much i'd be mindin if you hadn't a hand or a foot left on you at all at all a speech whereof the first clause sounds rather poor-spirited and the last distinctly unfeeling but to which dan took no exception he could give a more detailed account of himself however to less incurious friends whom he told how on finishing his engagement at the peat factory a temptingly lucrative job had lured him over the straits to scotland whence he intended to return about holy eve which change of plan he announced in a letter home confided to one patty laughlin who proved an unreliable messenger the truth is that patty cliver and clane forgot his friend's letter in his own bustle about transmitting his earnings home in postal orders and getting himself shipped back as a pauper to the most conveniently situated union a thrifty if not strictly legitimate mode of travelling occasionally adopted by itinerant harvest men how just before he should have started for home he met with a bad accident while helping to rescue the factory foreman's son out of a whirl of jag-toothed wheels and hissing bands like so many spiders webs all set a-goin by the divil and had lain for a couple of months crippled in hospital whence he had sent no word lest they be fretted thinkin he was took for death away from them all uncommon kind people ran his account of his experiences there and everything done as agreeable as they could contrive barrin that them doctors would be lookin in of a mornin and sayin that leg had a right to come off to-morrow or he'll lose them two fingers anyway as easy and pleasant as if the flesh wasn't creepin on your bones to hear them but sure they were intendin no harm it's the nature of them to keep choppin and sawin the only wonder is that any one gets out of a place where they do be plenty wid enough of his body left to hold his soul in then how recovering unmulked after all of limb he had straightway repaired home bringing with him the pounds and pounds presented to him by the grateful foreman a suit of clothes much too good to think of wearing and the promise of permanent employment at sterry and lawson's whenever he chose to return even so dan's 
homecoming could not be compared for external brilliancy with that of the color sergeant indeed after the first raptures of restoration had subsided the elder dan cast many a regretful glance at the halting gait and sling suspended arm of his tall son while Audi rafferty sought to slur over the refutation of his own conjectures by insisting on the fact that if the lad had took off to the most outrageous wars ever was he'd more likely than not have come out of them with less destruction done on him than might be perceived now young dan's native air seemed however to possess very salubrious qualities and before he had been three weeks at home his step began to regain its firmness and strength and suppleness returned to his limp wrist and stiffened fingers his cure was practically complete by the time that the black frost had broken and the snow had vanished off the bog leaving only its wraith on the frail blossomed slow bushes and the wedding day had come i met the bridal party proceeding towards the town on farmer hilferty's loaned jaunting car and it struck me that i had never seen so many people at once on any vehicle i caught a glimpse of jim kilfoyle in a queer brown frock sitting on the well and just as they passed he was saying sternly i declare biddy sheridan if you don't leave holdin me on i'll let the greatest old yell you ever heard and terrify the horse this was a morning in easter week and lady day in spring too a coincidence which led the widow mcgurk to observe that you might meet as good fortune marrying on one lady day as another a happy-go-lucky sentiment which lisconnel appears disposed to adopt as a piece of local proverbial philosophy chapter nine backwards and forwards should it be concluded from facts related in the foregoing chapters that truth for truth's sake is rather at a discount in lisconnel i can scarcely gainsay the inference if letting on romancing a bit and just humbuggin with a little blarneyin and slutherin thrown in are overstreetly judged we shall be found in a perilous state but there is one point on which the veracity of its inhabitants like that of many other people similarly situated seems exposed to less warrantable suspicion it is commonly received opinion that the dwellers in any remote and lonely district are largely responsible for whatever growths of ghostly legend may flourish there these although they do not perhaps spring directly from anybody's invention are it is held sedulously fostered and cultivated and handed down with additions and improvements from generation to generation who take a sort of pride and pleasure in them we have all heard how the peasants gather round their hearths on eerie winter evenings and beguile the time with the recital of marrow freezing ghost stories to which they contribute at any rate wilfully credulous minds no doubt this custom does really exist in some places but i can confidently assert that it is not to be found in lisconnel and failing personal observation i should venture to think its general prevalence antecedently improbable people who live their lives in solitary places of the earth under a rigorous enforcement of all the penalties of adam are little likely to hanker after the introduction of any supernatural crooks into their lot to voluntarily fill the wild blasts wailing round their poor hobbles with unearthly shrieks and lamentations that bid them spend their long night imagining some fear or beset their fields with prowling phantoms that cause them on their lonely road to walk in doubt and dread in lisconnel certainly there is none of the vul de chipi on the contrary such things are if accepted at all accepted under protest there is a marked tendency to resist the admission of spectres to the hamlet and its purlieus and to resent any obstinate assertion of their presence 
Jenny Ryan, for instance, will fight you any day, supposing you a possible combatant, to uphold his contention that he never saw or heard aught on the bogland quare that it might be an old white goat glimmering in a stake of moonlight or a sagal lettin a screech goin by and a considerable ingenuity is expended in euphemerizing uncanny personages and explaining away mysterious appearances how much of whatever belief in spectral hauntings has survived these critical methods may be the unconscious work of imagination on which opposition sometimes acts as a stimulus is of course a different question you have seen already some traces of its survival and indeed if you consult a certain section of the community you will learn facts which you would if i am not mistaken be glad to disprove did you happen to live in lisconnel you will hear not only of fearsome wanderers met afield but of strange forms found cowering by the hearth at home and stealing away to lurk in dusky nooks whence no one dares more than surmise their ultimate withdrawal of a shadow lying black all day across the threshold with nothing visible to cast it but falling ice-cold upon whomsoever makes bold to step over it of a lame old woman who comes tapping at your door it may be in the broad noonlight a harmless seeming old creature you think until she looks into your eyes and laughs a laugh you will not soon forget the sound of all the lore in short connected with those beings whom lisconnel terms collectively more or less under its breath them wands the origin of these visitations now lies obscured in the history of such old unhappy things that it has come to be narrated in more various ways than i can here recount but one of our local tragedies said to be still terribly commemorated did actually occur within the recollection of anybody who has had the sorrowful fortune to live through the great famine year that is some half century since it was down at clayson's boreen a few miles along the road towards the town where a skeleton cabin stands to-day that a man driven distraught with the famine fever barred himself and three or four small children into their room while the mother went in quest of food and when she returned with some bread at nightfall through the snow the poor wretch would not open to her so all night she beat on the door and called to her crying children and the next day the whole family were found cold and dead the father and children in the cabin and the mother outside half buried in a drift heaped against the wall a loaf untouched and in her hand the stone with which she had been battering the door the cabin has been ever since deserted and its doorstep is a ruinous gap yet still on many a night they say this miserable woman may be seen standing by it wringing her hands and buffeting the empty air if you can take to your heels and fly before you have beheld anything more you will have met with nothing worse than a fright but if she turns and beckons you to come and help her you could be given no surer warning of black troubles in store this is just what did befall brian kilfoyle one spring evening not long after young dan's wedding on his dusky way home from o'byrne's forge with a mended loy brian's belief in ghostly manifestations is as a rule waveringly reluctant and he would probably soon have reasoned himself into a conviction that he was only after mistaking something in the darkness of the light had not his mood been already downcast and foreboding on account of his mother's failing health for the past winter had proved a crucial test to all lisconnel's feeble folk and few of them had struggled through it unscathed some of them indeed had come out on the wrong or at any rate the other side the pat ryans had lost their youngest twin child 
which was still of a size to be called by the neighbours indifferently joe and molly and which used to trot a long way after either of its parents when it saw them going anywhere old mick ryan too had died at the end of several days levity so deep that it was impenetrable by even the tobacco to purchase which his daughter elderly biddy ran into debt besides nearly walking herself off her legs in a forced march to the town and back under these circumstances brian was in the humour to take quick alarm at his mother's weakness and flagging spirits and now his impression that the dark figure standing in the ruined doorway had turned round and beckoned to him through the twilight put a finishing touch to his uneasiness so much so that he resolved upon the extreme measure of seeking qualified medical advice and to that end obtained a red ticket from father rooney whereupon to lisconnel came dr ward being on leave a youthful locum tenens whose amiable qualities created a favourable impression his report upon his patient was to the effect that he could see little amiss with her sure it's active and robustus enough your mother seems to be for a body of her time of life he was thus represented as expressing himself by mrs bryan but in course it stands to reason she isn't altogether as young as she was a while ago not having a turn for obvious pleasantries he had given up adding in such cases she ought to have plenty of strengthening food and goodness guide you sir says i to him sure she wasn't that afore ever you were born or thought of says i continued mrs bryan who appeared somewhat illogically to consider this repartee refutation of the doctor's cautiously worded statement her husband on the other hand felt by no means disposed to cavil at the verdict which relieved his fears so happily that when he escorted the young man to his horse he observed with strong emphasis it's real delightful weather we're getting now your honour although the bog was just then livid with low creeping flocks of pale mist and the day had been as consistently dismal and lack-lustre a one as ever spent its drizzling hours in what we call neither raining nor letting it alone the last saturday in the following june was a shining contrast a morning risen behind lattices of fretted snow sheen which melted with ever widening interspaces far up and away into faint lines and filmy streaks like the clouding on and a gate until while the greensward underfoot was yet all beaded with prisms of dew the lapis lazuli cup overhead curved down without a fleck from brim to brim it was to be rather an eventful day for lisconnel by reason of a fair held in the town at which several of the neighbours proposed to sell their pigs and poultry lisconnel always sells its few pigs about this season not because they are fat but because the need of a little ready money becomes coercive in the month before potato digging the place does not i must admit excel in swine a fact hardly to be marvelled at when one considers how much plain living is perforce practised by the animals during their sojourn among us even if it is accompanied by a corresponding high thinking which must remain a matter of conjecture that does not influence market prices seldom in the case of a lisconnel pig will any amount of hopeful prodding and poking establish in its owner's mind a comfortable assurance of good condition though a refractory beast who has to be hauled shrieking out of a hole or lifted over a dyke is conventionally described as the weight of any ten begora yet however humble our own opinion of our wares may be it is trying to find the same confirmed for us sarcastically by other people we do not like to be greeted after a long trudge by inquiries such as wasn't it maybe a course and match you were intending to show them at all the while or might you 
ever ha happen to take notice that in some places the pigs do have a fashion of wearing their bones on the wrong side of their skins or what at all do you be feedin the beasts on up at lisconnel old scythe blades be like or is it an odd taste of a slim handled hayrake these questions have before now been settled temporarily with the help of fists and black thorns the market folk set off betimes this morning and as many of their neighbours were out on the bog cutting turf the place grew very quiet when once the squealing and squawking which attended their progress had died distantly away it felt like a sunday to the stayers at home and it was partly this and partly the glorious weather that brought them together in a session on an undulating bank of fine sward interspersed with boulders set flat in heathery rims a favourite holiday lounging place not far from the kilfoyle's cabin old mrs kilfoyle was among them brisker again in response to the call of june but physically almost extinguished under the folds of her daughter-in-law's ample blue cloak with which her winter's indisposition had been made a long-sought pretext for investing her much against her will even peter sheridan made a shift to hobble out of doors not leaving behind him his rheumatics and bad scran to them whose companionship is however least obtrusive when he can sit quiet in the warm clasp of the sun its beams came along and slanting still when the two last of the party bound for the fair were almost ready to start the widow mcgurk and brian kilfoyle brian was going as a buyer not a seller having disposed of his pig a week ago when finding that small pigs went cruel dear he deferred the purchase of its successor in hopes to getting a better bargain later on but the widow had on her hands both her pig and a clocking hen with which a clutch of eggs being unattainable she had regretfully resolved to part brian had waited to assist her in the transportation of this live stock but the hen with a perverse prescience characteristic of her race had at the last moment taken ungainly flight and was now being pursued by himself and all the children out of arms meanwhile mrs mcgurk ready equipped for her journey paused by the wayside group with her lean pig in a string we do right to leave that old rogue of a hen behind us she said uneasily while her beast fell to grazing industriously as if bent upon adding at least a shilling to his market value she'll only be delaying the man and spoiling of his chances och they'll grab her presently no fear she can't keep that work up very long try her best said old mrs kilfoyle placidly listening to the receding sounds of the pursuit sit you down mrs mcgurk ma'am and be taking the weight off your feet while you can i hope you'll have good luck with that creature there he seems to be a tidy level little beast i wish i may do as well as brian himself done last day with his said the widow twas a grand price entirely he got out of them and if he can pick up a weeny one anyways reasonable he'll be right enough please god and we've a notion what else he'll be bringing home with him this evening over and above haven't we now mrs ryan she added glancing at mrs kilfoyle and waking with weather-beaten archness troth have we said judy ryan the same sort of notion i've got of what mr Coor does be weighing out of a yellow papered box with black scrums on it and charges eight pence the quarter pound for and blows open a purple bag to put it in and then if your kettle's boiling and your water's not smoked twill be yourselves to blame if you haven't an illigant cup of tay judy was happily unconscious that the end of her enigma had escaped rather prematurely from its subtle unfoldures ay ay said the little old woman looking round her from friendly face to face in a pleased flutter brian does be very good and everybody smiled 
and winked and nodded approval being fully in the secret of brian's intentions everybody except biddy sheridan who looked suddenly disconsolate as if at a pang of jarred memory where she sat peeling flakes of shaggy grey lichen off a sun-warmed stone me brother mick she said in a semi soliloquizing murmur he very belike a been thinkin of bringin home a bit of baccy this night wid him too if there was e'er a one left to set store by it mick never begrudged aught he could do for his old father i'll say that for him it wasn't in him not when he had his own way there was just a tinge of resentment in the last words and bedad now biddy her sister-in-law's tone was undisguisedly deprecating bedad now woman alive nobody could lay it again us that we either of us ever begrudged the poor old man god be good to him bit or sup or any trifle of warmth or comfort we had the given of i'm not goin for deny that i might be a bit put past me patience goodness forgive me now and again when times was bad to see his old pipe puff puffin twas in a way like throwin the childer's scrap of food behind the fire according to my considerin mrs kilfoyle's falsetto flute piping interposed before biddy could reply that baccy's a humbuggin kind of old stuff sure that's plain on the face of it for except it was let on to be something different from itself who'd give a brass farthin for the likes of it a little black lookin lump you've as much botheration gettin a smoulder of red out of it as if it was a wet sod of turf and risin such a smell fay you might think they'd a cartload of pretty homes burnin in the pipe bowl only i'd a deal liefer have that for a cent och but i remember it in the fields at home but the fact of the matter is smokin's just a notion the creatures have when they get taken up wid it tis the same to them as a peaceable sort of drunkenness and puts the thought of the troubles they're in the middle of out of their heads many's the time i'd think meself biddy when i'd see your poor father sittin inside there wid his feet in a puddle of rain and the cold wind freezin mad and he lookin fit to drop and he contented himself all the while with the old pipe that was near shakin out of his hand the creature many's the time i'd be thinkin tis a poor case to have nothin between yourself and all the divil's work about you better than a few streels of baccy smoke och girl we've no call to go wish any one back again within his reach that's after givin him the slip for good and all and needn't be schemin ways to disremember himself and his tormentin tricks that's the truth ma'am said peter sheridan hoarsely at her elbow i dunno then said mrs mcgurk who stood fronting the assembly with her elongated shadow grotesquely deflected against the sunny bank and who evidently entered her protest from the sense of duty i dunno how you're rightified in makin sure you'll be shut of the devil as soon as you quit out of this be any manner of means bedad it may be quite the other way my opinion of him is you never can tell where he'll have you dead or alive for anything we know he might be doin as much again us one place as the other or maybe more and bad luck to him well it's clear enough to me said mrs kilfoyle and the way i look at it is this there's little mit stoutin that the divil's plenty of sense however he came by it and knows what he's about god forgive him as well as you or me and he wouldn't be distressin himself the way he is to keep annoyin people if he didn't perceive that it was here he's gettin his best chance of doin mischief on us and nowhere else he wouldn't give himself that much trouble you may depend if he thought he'd have us readier to his hand merely be waitin till the breath was out of one's body not he he's too cute for look at the carryin's honour him look at the contrivances he has and the inventions sure there's nothin big or little he wouldn't be for meddlin in though it might be a matter you'd never think he'd need to concern himself wid except he was fairly druv to it even so he hasn't it all his own way 
for whenever his betters have the time now and again to be keepin an eye on him he's bound to quit interferin and everything goes pleasant enough and no thanks to him i bedad he gets a disappointment of an odd while like any one else in this world and mark my words he wouldn't be spendin so much of his days in it if there was e'er another place he could regulate more to his mind unless twas for diversion like suggested judy ryan the same way that quality do come straightin on the bog with their guns and wadin up to the knees in the rivers after the bits of birds and fish and they wid more than they can ate at home all the while if it was that that ailed them diversion why woman dear in course it's diversion to him what else should it be but what i was sayin is that it's here he has to come for it same as quality after their shootin and when onct we've took off wid ourselves he's no more chanced agin us than they have at a flock of snipe they're after missin and scarin and signs on it he's no ways wishful to be seein folk he's plaguin quit if it's a young body now that's to be took a bit of a child or a fine lad who'll have plenty break in their hearts after them that be like suits the old nagur right well he's nothing to say agin it they'll go they'll go fast enough but there's a many misfortunate creature that unless the devil does his endeavours to keep them alive in their misery i dunno who would true for you ma'am said peter sheridan again you might say so if you'd whiles feel the life was skivered into your body wid all the sharp ends of aches and pains or else you'd be fit to stretch yourself out easy and away wid you do not say such a thing then father said his daughter peg looking piteously at him and all at once feeling like a parricide as she bethought her how she had only last night assented to her stepmother's proposition that himself was gettin uglier tempered with every day went over his head but he's bound to let go a hold of you one time or another peter please god mrs kilfoyle urged consolatorily whatever villainy he does on you the end of it is he has to give it up at a bad job and leave you to go along and pace arrah now will no talk content you but dyin in the devil remonstrated mrs doyne to be hearin you one ud think we were just sittin here a minute to wait till our coffins come up the road that the old wan had had the be speakin of she glanced furtively round the broad skyscape and then huddled herself closer into the shelter of the hollow bank tightening her skimpy shawl across her shoulders sure i was meanin no harm wid it said the old woman apologetically but we might easy wished about him for that matter there's a good few things the devil has nothin to say to or dyin either though i dunno why people need mostly think so bad of that it's maybe the sort of trouble there is shiftin from one place to another that sets them agin it ay said mrs quigley some botheration there's apt to be gettin in and out of anything if it's only elbowing your way out of chapel when there's a throng at mass and twill be right at the door you'll get the most crowdin and pushin and squeezin fit to reeve the old rags off of your back but just the next step beyond it you're all the world clear before you a room to be dancin jigs in if that was what you were after crowdin is it said biddy ryan ah jabbers there's no crowdin about it that i can see musha it's part of the contrariness of the whole concern that so long as you keep livin there'll be people all about you galore day out and day in wid the childer bawlin and screechin and the lads quarrelin and bangin about and everything all through other under your feet till you're fairly moided and thinkin you'd be glad enough to find air a little hole away off be yourself for peace and quiet but when you come to quittin them all and takin off to nobody can rightly tell where and you feelin that queer and lost you'd be ready to put up wid any company you could get 
if it was only a brute beast och then there's never a soul you'll have a chance of along wid you sorra a mortal one lonesome or no lonesome it's be yourself you're bound to go that's the notion young people like you do have said mrs kilfoyle who remembered biddy's grizzled locks on a downy fluff but be the time you've lived as long as i and seen as many comin and goin and stayin away you'll find it's behind you that you're leavin the most of the lonesomeness seems to me twould have saved a power of work if almighty god would a had been content to make the one job of it and stick us all down wherever it was we were meant to stop without any shiftin us back and forwards said annie sheridan who had come up with a large turf creel on his shoulders and crouching under it on the top of the bank had somewhat the aspect of a straighty lodged hermit crab it's the same as if you were to be plantin' your potatoes in half a dozen different places before you'd made your mind up to the right one and that's a queer way of doin' business perhaps you've no call to be in a hurry be tight lad to find yourself settled in a place you're bound for quoth mrs mcgurk grimly for andy was not in her good graces maybe not he said on doubling himself to aim a conjectural cuff at his half sister rose whom he heard trying to tilt over his creel from behind but whether or no where's the sense of it well sure for one thing if people were to have been always in the good place they mightn't ever know the differ said judy ryan coming in first while her neighbors were still casting about for hypotheses and supposin said andy swinging his legs unimpressed where to be the harm of not knowing the differ when there was never a differ to know judy was not prepared to elucidate this point and looked her perplexity who said there was any sense in it demanded peter sheridan glumly as like as not there's none he was staring straight before him seemingly in at the black doorway not many paces distant out of which he had painfully crawled ah now i declare i dare say that's it glory be to goodness said judy brightening up as if piously relieved at this solution of the difficulty very belike there's no sense in it at all it's just the will of god and we needn't be concerning ourselves about that anyhow said mrs quigley eh lads dear we'll all get sorted right enough one way or the other mrs kilfoyle said summing up rather hurriedly for it struck her that the discussion was developing a note of acrimony we're better off at all events than if we were to be beginning with the good and ending with the bad and here's brian after catching the old hen bad manners to her then be givin him such a dance said mrs mcgurk brian had his captive in a dishevelled wicker basket from beneath the wobbling lid of which she frequently thrust her witless black head to squawk at an imminent risk of guillotining since he suppressed her demonstrations as promptly as if there had been applause in a court of justice begorra ma'am he said if there was anybody down beyond offering a stiff price for a sort of old screech owl with springs in the legs of her like a grasshopper's when she's tired flying up over your head like an eagle you've a right to make your fortune this day it's lucky i thought to give nora the handkerchy wid the bit of money in it afore she went on for afraid it might get joggled out of me somehow shankin down but it's steppin we ought to be good-bye to you kindly mother and keep us a sup of hot water boilin the widow twitched away her pig from his grazing which caused him to exchange his appreciative harumphs for protestant squeals and they were all three soon out of sight behind the ridge of the knockon there'll be no great while overtaking the others at that gate of goin said biddy ryan och but tis a long dragon stretch of road weary on it and lengthens itself out every time you go it but there's none of us will have tramped it as often as yourself mrs kilfoyle ma'am belike no me dear said mrs kilfoyle 
considerin all the years start i've had of the hold of yous sure i was no age at all you may say when first we travelled it this end of it wasn't rightly finished faith the sconnel was but a poor lookin place in those days and for a while after we did be livin here we always called it the road home because twas along it we came out of the old place in the county clare then if we wanted to keep the childer pacified that was mostly small rampagin spalpeens we'd only to let on we were settin out back again and they'd trot along till they were tired but the day me father was buried down beyant nothing we could do or say would persuade the creatures that he hadn't just gone home to fetch our couple of cows deed poor man he fretted terrible about the little black kerry he left behind rosine de he called her and they did be lookin out a great while expectin him to come drivin her along do you see the white stone biddy up there again the edge of the headland that's where little taddy me youngest brother ud sit watchin many a day and had me poor mother distracted more betoken would run in tumblin in to see her like a bit of a puppy yellin that his father was comin up the road it's a quare imp of a child that he was that went to the mackerel fishin and was drowned in galloway bay i just can mind hearin talk of taddy joyce said peter sheridan but truth you'll get ahead backwards of the whole of us ma'am when it's a matter of recollections yit for as long as i'm in lisconnel mrs kilfoyle said meditatively i scarce think i've ever got the idea of it all clear in me head the same way i have the old place at home it doesn't seem that natural to me somehow leastways these times when i don't be traipsin about much the lie of the land gets moided up in me mind as if twas wid a mist risin but clonmena now sure to this day if i'm lyin awake in the night i can be goin over the whole of it lighted up in me thoughts same as i used to and i a slip of a lass sleepin in the bit of a room away under the thatch lookin out above the front door wid the river runnin by sure i knew every inch of ground it flowed over and whilst afore i fall asleep i divert myself threadin the fields and all along it as if you were slippin your beads through your fingers first it's in our couple of fields that's the one of them nother and long shaped and the other of them scooped out hollow and round like a sort of nest and the both of them as smooth and as green as the moss shining in the cracks of this old stone and then across the end of young conroy's meadow below the high bank and the hawthorns atop and after that off wid it under the dark bridge on the borisk road and spreadin out on the grey gravel beds and among the clumps of cress tis but a poor hungry bit of land all tussocks and ragweed till it runs round the hill foot among the firs and gets slitherin away down and down past the smothered stones and the brown roots and the fern leaves drippin and the stems tumblin aslant makin for the bottom of the deep glen and in there it does be shut close wid the trees roofin it overhead and the little path wavin up and down alongside it all the way to the old mill at kildrum so a bit beyond it it takes out into the river coolinaw no less that's a powerful width of water saints alive sure i could be following it along blindfold or if it was the wind i heard comin rustlin by the other way i could tell where it was goin wid itself keenin up the boreen behind the house and out on the big steep pitaty field and beyond that again over the grass slopes and the sheep browsin and the breath of bracken and furze bushes till the great cliffs go down at your feet slap into the sea like the wall of a church tower when you look over the edge you might think there was the white wing of a gull just fluttering at the bottom but musha all the while it's the foam of a big wave 
rolled in fit to lift you off your two feet, supposing you were anywhere as it could get a grab at you. You'll hear the sound of them coming up every once in a while, like as if twas the river stoppin' to take breath. But it's the flow of the river I do be missin' most out of it these times when I'm rememberin' it to meself. I've a notion I'd get a great weep entirely if ever I come within sound of it again for twas the last thing I'd mind afore I dropped off, and as like as not the first thing I'd hear in the mornin' would be our creatures of ducks flusterin' into it one after the other off of the flat steppin' stone, and I'd up wit me and out to see to gettin' in the eggs. Goodness guide me, twas only the other day wakin' up I thought I heard me poor mother callin' chooky chooky to her hens, as natural as could be, and it just Mrs. Pat hunting home her little goat. I don't know what ud romance and I have, said Mrs. Kilfoyle, interrupting herself, but this while back I've nothing only them far gone days running in me mind. Seems like as if there must be something real queer ahead of me that hinders me thinking forwards. End of section 7